Welcome to Update 28.2. Join us for our 7th anniversary celebrations, an all new SMG experience in the arcade, and finally, the recall system update. We've got lots of surprises in store for you to celebrate our 7th birthday. Erangel's school will be transformed into a festive 7th anniversary venue. Plus, keep an eye out for throwable cupcakes and surprise gift boxes scattered across the starting island of each map. We've been hard at work balancing the SMGs to offer a more unique experience and accommodate various gunplay strategies. The arcade is all set for you to try out these changes, so get that early feel and let us know what you think. And there's more exciting news. Based on your positive feedback, we're expanding the recall system to include Vikendi and Tago. Check out the patch notes to discover all the details of this update. Lastly, 
This patch also includes weapon mastery updates, world bug fixes, and performance tweaks. Be sure to dive into the patch notes for all the details. And we'll see you on the battlegrounds. Welcome to Update 28.2. Join us for our 7th anniversary celebrations, an all new SMG experience in the arcade, and finally, the recall system update. We've got lots of surprises in store for you to celebrate our 7th birthday. Erangel's school will be transformed into a festive 7th anniversary venue. Plus, keep an eye out for throwable cupcakes and surprise gift boxes scattered across the starting island of each map. We've been hard at work balancing the SMGs to offer a more unique experience and accommodate various gunplay strategies. The arcade is all set for you to try out these changes, so get that early feel and let us know what you think. And there's more exciting news. Based on your positive feedback, we're expanding the recall system to include Vikendi and Tago. Check out the patch notes to discover all the details of this update. Lastly, this patch also includes weapon mastery updates, world bug fixes, and performance tweaks. Be sure to dive into the patch notes for all the details. And we'll see you on the battlegrounds. Welcome to Update 28.2. Join us for our 7th anniversary celebrations, an all new SMG experience in the arcade, and finally, the recall system update. We've got lots of surprises in store for you to celebrate our 7th birthday. Erangel's school will be transformed into a festive 7th anniversary venue. Plus, keep an eye out for throwable cupcakes and surprise gift boxes scattered across the starting island of each map. We've been hard at work balancing the SMGs to offer a more unique experience and accommodate various gunplay strategies. The arcade is all set for you to try out these changes, so get that early feel and let us know what you think. And there's more exciting news. Based on your positive feedback, we're expanding the recall system to include Vikendi and Tago. Check out the patch notes to discover all the details of this update. Lastly, this patch also includes weapon mastery updates, world bug fixes, and performance tweaks. Be sure to dive into the patch notes for all the details. And we'll see you on the battlegrounds. Welcome PUBG enthusiasts from all over the world. This is 
the PUBG Global Series APAC qualifiers as we're hitting into day two's action. Join with me here is Extreme. Man, how are you doing and how are you feeling about today? Yeah, I'm feeling great. I think uh, last night, I mean, if you watched it and you were there to, to experience it, it was banger after banger after banger after banger. And, and I, I stand by that. I think we had some excellent uh, PUBG. Uh, whether or not the teams will would have played their best doesn't really matter because I think we got some crazy chaos uh, regardless of, of, of what happened macro-wise for these guys. So I'm excited to get into tonight. Uh, I think it might be a bit hard to, to top last night. I think, again, all those games were quite exciting, but uh, we'll see what we can do. I'm sure these guys are going to bring it no matter what. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that it will guarantee a lot of exciting matches to come in. There's, of course, some changes heading into day two in the map arrangements and perhaps a lot more changes from the team side where they could be looking at readjusting their strategies heading into day two and day three. That's where it's all survival mode to see who makes the cut for the top eight in order to advance to the final. So, of course, if you guys are joining us for the very first time, don't worry, we will get you sorted out with how the format as well as the rules uh, will be, of course, explained in moments time. So, of course, for those who have been watching from day one, you guys know that there are a lot of interesting things that will be happening for today as we are now on our Wednesday schedule for the playoffs so tomorrow will be the final day of the playoffs and then we'll take a break on friday and then we'll continue on over on the weekend for our finals and with that being said we'll see the top eight teams to be able to match up against the cena teams as well on the next week so the second and third of april yeah, and uh, I said it yesterday as well, but uh, I'll say it today. They've got those day breaks to make sure that uh, they can VOD review it and make sure that everything is in tip-top shape going into the next days of play. They don't have that luxury uh, in these first initial playoff days, though. And, of course, we have the eight-seeded teams who were essentially the top-seeded teams, the top qualifying teams in their respective regions. So the teams that came first uh, are essentially the top eight seeded teams, they move on straight to the grand finals. So they'll play much later. They are the observers right now, watching all the chaos unfold in the playoffs. If you weren't uh, lucky enough to be one of those eight seeded teams, or probably should say if you weren't good enough to be one of those top eight seeded teams, uh, then unfortunately you are playing in the playoffs and you have to fight for your spot in the top eight of the grand finals. And then of course, if you do come top eight in those grand finals, you make it all the way to PGS. Those are the eight seeded teams on the left-hand side of your screen and the teams on the right-hand side in the playoffs well, that's the teams that we've been watching uh, over the course of yesterday. It's an, it's been an absolute uh, uh, highlight of, of, a, of a tournament for me so far, and it's only been one day of action. These guys have absolutely shown up, and even as I'm looking uh, at those names, all all 16 of them really, apart from a couple of them, had some really sick highlight moments, and I could put my finger on exactly uh, every one of them. So I'm excited to get into it tonight. Indeed, extreme and of course, uh, these teams across APAC will be representing their own respective region of PTS, PVS, uh, Challenger Rumble Series, and of course, PMS as well as PJC. Some of all these teams from each respective region have been seeing some really, really good plays, especially coming in from Forest as we saw them eventually getting that number one spot by the end of the day, and they definitely shine right during moments in Tago. Yeah, for us, we're similar to Unicorn Cyber to me yesterday. That's just pure survival mode, no matter what the scenario was, no matter how difficult it was going to be. That was a fantastic win that we saw from RxE, very assertive win from them. This was one of Forest Gaming's probably uh, frustrating moments for them, having to hot drop FRKS in El Azahar. Doesn't really uh, bode well for their consistency, which was probably the story for them uh, across last night. But no matter uh, how difficult it was, they came out on top. Uh, and in this game especially, we thought they were dead for sure. We thought they were absolutely cooked when they were sitting in that bowl, uh, but that wasn't the case. They, they managed to fight their way out, destroy Daytrade, who were coming out from the uh, other side of the road behind them, and then put up a decent fight towards Valley Tide, but Valley Tide with that high ground, just too hard to get rid of at that point. Yeah, Valentai has also been really, really consistent on their matches in Miramar. And today we'll be starting on the, those Miramar runs, so we'll definitely have to see whether or not if FRKS will once again hot drop the current top team of the tournament. Meanwhile, GLS of course started off really strong in those matches in Erangel and Match to also secure themselves the chicken dinner. And with that, well, it's actually not the chicken dinner. They managed to secure second place. But later on, they did have a little bit of struggle heading into the bigger map. So hopefully today they'll be able to 
find a little bit more of bet for the momentum heading into our day two run. As we take a look at our total leaderboard right now, we see a tie between Forest as well as Day Trade. Meanwhile, FTF is just one point away from chasing into the top two, of course. And with Unicorn Cyber also within that range, we'll definitely see a really tight race within the top five. But looking at the second half of the table, though, some of the teams haven't really gotten any uh, sort of uh, idea of how to basically get into the late phase of the game. So hopefully we'll see a better run for the teams that are currently placed from 10th all the way to 16th. Yeah, it's rough, right? Because you look at the 12th through the 16th and it's a stark difference in comparison to the rest of the leaderboard, which is really unfortunate. Um, but as I said yesterday before we before we dipped out for the night, I do think that one good 10 kill win from either of those bottom five teams uh, and they are back in the race. Not necessarily for top eight just yet, but one uh, good 10 kill win, it, it puts them up there. Of course, we change up the map schedule for today as well. It's been reversed, so We'll have two more Miramars in a row. So it would have been four Miramars total for these teams. We moved to Tago, uh, which is also reverse. We had Bikendi first yesterday. And then, of course, we finish on Wrangle. I always like finishing on a Wrangle. It's like uh, it's like going back home, essentially. Yeah, it really feels like we're basically flipping the uh, page a little bit on how things are going to be going, especially when we take a look at the pacing. It feels like it will get uh, faster in terms of the tempo of play eventually, especially with, you know, Myanmar being so fast for them to go in for fights as well as, you know, the early game is going to be a little bit more of a scouting action between all these sort of squads. So I really do like the sort of switch up that we do have for day two. So we'll definitely have to take a look though for some of the teams that, you know, have those form of a struggle in that early game. And you did point it out that uh, some of these teams that are over on the bottom half of the leaderboard, it's been back to back, back rough matches for them. So hopefully they've been able to, you know, take a look back into the VODs to identify what exactly is the issue that they've been uh, having occurring multiple times and probably will have themselves that quick fix over the span of one night only. Yeah, that's the biggest thing, right? Is you had a bad day yesterday, but if you can uh, immediately, it, it might be hard given that these games go quite late, so you probably have to do it probably start of today, really. Uh, you just go into those VODs, you make sure that uh, everything is as exactly as you want it to be. Um, you make sure that your macro is on point, you identify any individual mistakes or kind of team play mistakes, you try and fix those as best as you can. Maybe do a team ranked session or something before the games just to warm yourself up, warm up your communication and all the aspects of team play. You come back into tonight with a decent fighting chance. Of course, it will be devastating if none of that pans out, but and then going in from night two to night three, you've got to do the exact same thing. That's just the life of a competitive esports player. You look at those VODs, you identify issues, uh, and you try and remedy them in game uh, when it comes to the uh, when it comes to in the moment. And, and it, that can be very difficult sometimes, and some teams are just better than that uh, at others. I did actually want to shout out the top frags of the tournament, the, the the people that are actually performing right now. So right now, KM99 is top frag. He's at 15 but then very closely behind him, there's a lot of other players, to be fair. It's a pretty even uh, list of top fraggers. You have KM9915, Trick with 14, Riz from Armory with 13, Hudat from Unicorn Cyber with 12, and then Flash from Daytrade with 12 as well. In fact, three of Daytrade are up there in the top seven uh, fraggers at the moment. So Daytrade obviously on fire, Armory Gaming as well up there. But uh, those are the top fraggers at the moment. I want to give them a shout out because um, we don't have any graphics that, that, that shout out top fraggers at the moment. You kind of just have to look at the twire to see it. But uh, obviously that, that's, that's a big aspect. You, you want to look for those star players. Um, and uh, right now it's KM99 on top. Yeah, and with matches, it'll catch some glimpse of his heroics through those rounds, especially in Miramar, where you could evidently see he's been taking control and a lot of all these uh, pickups and were actually coming in from the side of Camp 99. So hopefully this will basically start off Forest Gaming on the right note, especially them needing to defend that number one spot away from the hands of you know, all the other competition like FTF was just one point away or so. And with RxE yesterday getting that back-to-back -back chicken dinner, who knows if they're going to be able to pull up another couple of big wins for today and perhaps having a chance to also uh, have a go against the current uh, top three teams out there, currently positioned at seventh. So despite 
you know, getting those double chicken there. I would have actually expected Repsic to be able to get a lot more, but we'll definitely have to see as we are already getting the flight ready for our first game of the day. Yeah, here we are on Miramar. It's funny you mentioned RxE actually with that double win because it's only Fat from RxE who's up there uh, in their top 10 uh, kills. He's, he's on 11 and his teammates are way, way, way down. Well, not necessarily way down, but uh, yeah, back-to-back -back wins. It was wins that weren't necessarily wins that were going to net you a lot of kills from, from RxE, which honestly is kind of against the grain for them. I, I would have felt like they would be going for a lot more crazy things. Uh, and yet yesterday we saw them being quite measured and quite disciplined in their play. Again, though, on to Miramar. I will continue to say it. One of those maps that can be quite dodgy at times, if not treated properly. All the big barriers in between, all the unplayable rocks, massive cities and vertical terrain can be quite difficult to navigate. Of course, everyone has experience on the map. They'll know exactly what they want to do. But come time, that circle pop, then phase two, then phase three, etc., etc. It can become quite difficult to uh, to manage your rotations. The plane is currently going across the northern side of the map. It's going to go from essentially uh, kind of near El Pozo down towards Partona uh, as we do a nice flyover on resort. Not a resort I would necessarily want to visit, to be honest with you. There was a flaming car in that <laughs> yard just then, uh, and it's a bit too yellow for me. I think I, I think I'd want a little bit more green at my resorts. A little bit more green. Oh, so it's all just about the color and that's just about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's probably very hot. I'll, I'll give you that. It's probably quite hot. That, that pool yeah. that's filled up would be would be quite nice. But yeah, a little bit more green, some palm trees and things to, to make it pop a little bit. That's uh, I guess that's my ideal uh, resort location. <laughs> Pretty fair point. I mean, Miramar is always sunny and it's pretty much dry weather all around. So this form of a flight does give access to all the teams to be able to get by into their respective cities. Uh, this time around, though, of course, Al Azahar is not going to be accessible, so we'll see some change up coming in from FRKS as well as what I believe was the side of Forest. So we're going to take a look at these type of adjustments. Forest will be taking a very interesting approach. A couple of members around the edges of Alcantara and having Olympus to be a lot closer to Montenevo. They managed to at least squeeze in by the edge of the circle towards the western plains. Meanwhile, shouldn't be too much of an issue for the rest of the squads to be able to get in in moments time. So We'll definitely have to take a look at certain areas of play, especially in Los Leones. We see pretty much a lot of spacing for the side of RS to be able to cut across, but eventually they might even meet up against teams like Day Trade or even PMA, who is basically taking control of both Kado as well as Chumachera. Yeah, they trade are in a good spot as well as FTF. They've got access to all the central locations. In fact, the, the thing I'm looking at right now on the map stream is Tian from PMA, who loot Picardo, sending it straight away from Picardo into the center of the zone. He's the uh, he's the guy acting as the lone scout at the moment, trying to get that central position before anyone else does. And his job essentially is just going to be to create as much noise as possible. It's a double-edged sword if you're Tian, because you want to put yourself in a center location, but you're alone. And you want to create presence to dissuade other people from coming towards you and taking that compound, but it, the, the result could be the opposite. You could actually entice people to breach you because they can assume that you're a solo. So for, for Tian right now, he's, he's uh, making the hero plays uh, and doing it all for, for PMA. Hopefully they can actually land themselves a central compound and not have any four-man breach them. You can see Tian there on the minimap. You can see him in front of uh, Belmoth. He's taken that compound just on the low side of the hill here, uh, just below the gym. So Belmoth could get that information, could hand that over to his team. There's only one guy in here, and then obviously the rest of Daytrade are quite close to Belmoth, so they could group up quite quickly and then breach him. But I don't think Daytrade are going to do that quite early. That compound that Tian's in is not super priority. You'd much rather take the top of the hill and maybe sit two people in that gym just north of where Tian is at the moment, where Belmoth is right now. In fact, this building can be quite nice later on. Yeah, and we're also looking at members of Forest to be doing exactly the same, but it is. Uh, them moving into the hills of Monte Nevo, which may actually allow them to spot out the players from FTF. So going back to Tian, he's on the low, lower ground side. I'm not sure if he would be able to identify if there's going to be any players around with Belmont, of course, in the vicinity. He might just be able to look around, but these footsteps might actually be heard by day trade. He's got to be extremely careful. He's got that AOG. should be able to trade. Yeah, he's in a bit of a rough spot right now. 
has to make the perfect play essentially. He can, can secure he can secure himself one. He can probably get Belmoth here, but any more than that, the rest of day trade are quite close. Flash will be there to trade. I am Pete's kind of acting as a bait right now. This is perfect for Tian. Could set himself up nicely and his team up nicely if he's able to secure one, but they're on the roof. It's so much harder for Tian to get this kill when Belmoth is on the roof, but he is going to go one step further. The secret agent that is Tian is going to put himself either outside, just outside, or, or potentially even inside. Luckily for Tian, he's got sound information, so he can make a play based off where Belmoth decides to make footsteps. Oh, this is kind of perfect, I think. If Belmoth puts himself on that corrugated fence, it's just game over for him. You can't whip this brain. If you do, it's over. He doesn't. It's incredibly clean for Tian, and now PMA has to activate off this. Perfect lure coming in from Tian. He couldn't play any better than that. With PMA really setting him up for success with all the rotations being set on the perfect timing. And PMA comes in with the first blood and a great head start getting into this Miram around. But what does Day Trade do right now, knowing that for the fact that the rest of PMA is going to be around this sector? It's going to be Puchus that will be going in for that push. He's also pretty much alone. As you can see, well, Norn's going to be joining in from back. Meanwhile, Flash is actually the one that will have to deal with the majority of PMA, but managed to actually catch one in the form of Teddy, getting a knock. Meanwhile, one for one exchange as we see Flash go down. Oh, Tian has to do it all right now. It's 1v2. He's actually got one. Nurins wasn't peeking. He pulled out utility, but thankfully Tian runs into his crosshair. So Tian goes down. Day Trade do get that exchange secured. And the rest of PMA, well, they got Flash. Are they, are they going to be here to finish off? The rest of day trade, I think not. They're just going to back off with Valley Tai on top of the hill now. It's pretty much game over for that commitment there from PMA. A nice attempt from Tian. Obviously, he probably could have done a lot more if he was able to survive, maybe leave that compound, play within the line of sight of PMA once they had dealt with Flash. Many options for Tian to do there. Unfortunately, the one he went for, honestly, they gave him a chance. I'll say that. Day trade definitely gave him a chance. Um, mm -hmm. Noren's pulling out utility wasn't necessarily the best timing. Basically, let his teammates uh, go down without a trade. But uh, they get it done in the end, but both teams weakened from that exchange. Yeah, uh, of course. With the PMA only slightly benefiting from that form of a scuffle, they still got a lot more to deal with here, especially with all the other teams surrounding the area. Reluctant squad, hoping for a chance here as they manage to also scope through the side of Valentine Esports. They'll be taking the lower end of the uh, compound. So RS, they've managed to at least scout uh, the area in order to make their next decision. As they're already around the center, they don't really have to make a move too much. It's all about getting the tags on a little bit of wear and tear. As Panic will have light work to be able to at least get the vehicles running eventually. Making sure it's parked in the safe spot as Armor and Gaming will be on the lookout in order to see if there's going to be any form of chance of a pickoff. Armor and Gaming had a in an inconsistent run from yesterday and yeah. today they are looking pretty much on a good form with that proactive play onto the side of PMP at least. I felt like yesterday for day trade specifically, it was them losing one early and then kind of playing the game through as three. And then for, uh, for Armory, it was them losing two early and playing the game through as two. And yet both of those teams managed to be on top of the leaderboard. Obviously they had much better games. Um, it wasn't just every game they, they lost players, but for Armory, certainly the, my memory from them yesterday is that uh, one clutch from Jane. Um, there were a couple highlights from Dimisty and Riz too, but the biggest memory for me is them just having to play as two all the time. Yeah, uh, going, go, going into today, I'm hoping that changes. We did see one go down, but uh, luckily it didn't actually get flushed. It wasn't just one specific map that uh, that happens to the side of AG. It's like a couple of rounds consecutively. So perhaps just making sure that they keep their survival rate a lot higher into today's matchup. We'll definitely see much better yield coming in from the side of Armory Gaming. Meanwhile, Panic Esports, we've seen some... Uh, pretty interesting place, especially the one <laughs> in the Candy. But in Miramar, it's a lot harder to pull that off. So first, different tactics will apply for today. As we take a look at Force Natural Gaming, making a maneuver to break yard. Oh, he's gonna be looking to see if he stands a chance against the rest of From the Future. He more spotted out already. Master pulls up the AUG, looking for a catch. Not able to actually dish out enough damage as of yet. But FTF, 
they will have pretty much a sniping range from afar to be able to at least give him a little Ooh. bit of cover so Simoy can actually back off. That Panzer's not going to be able to hit him from this distance. I feel like that was close, <laughs> though. A couple seconds late, and Simoy might actually go down to that Panzer, but he does get out of there. It's good from Forrest. They, uh, they knocked Orkarin, and then uh, Master was the one that was pulled up close, and then I think Olympus off in the background was... Well, yeah, maybe it was Olympus off in the background was getting the off angle on that flush, just securing it so that FTF have nothing to fight for, essentially, and they are the team that's going to be disengaging from uh, the fight with Forrest. The panic, the kill feed, sorry, is popping off a little bit. It's panic and Unicorn Cyber, Unicorn Cyber, much worse for wear here in the corner of Monty this early. An incredibly interesting exchange, but it is a very central spot, so I suppose if both teams want it, they're going to fight for it. Panic is in a much better position now. Who that's just down on the left side of them. And I think the rest of Unicorn Cyber have... In fact, no, the left, the rest of Unicorn Cyber are all the way on the north. They have absolutely no uh, interest in getting involved in this fight. They were never uh, involved in this fight to begin with. And so they've just lost two teammates for for an attempt at the corner of Monty. Yeah, who that really get caught off in the really uh, tough area for the rest of Unicorn and Cyber to even lend any form of assistance at all. So it's a rough start for the side of the Unicorn Cyber. That may actually affect them in the long run here in Miramar as they will still try to actually cut across as they are not to be able to secure any form of real estate right now. The central area is absolutely swarmed with all other teams. So I'm not too sure if Unicorn Cyber will be able to book a safe spot as they will be able to at least get some cover through the valleys that they will be driving by. But the further they go, though, it's going to be another squad over on top side of the hill. So let's see if they're going to be able to at least get some good exchanges. I feel like this is as far as Unicorn Cyber go. I think you're right. They just kind of have to submit to sitting in and around these ridges. They're not currently getting shot at from the warehouse. That's uh, a false positive from Sapal there. And finally, he does get shot at. So that's a no, nope. Going to that uh, warehouse. He's going to have to come back, maybe group up with Manhung and see what they could do, see how they could fight their way up this hill. Because ISG currently own most of the real estate around this area. They've got the uh, shanties just above Unicorn Cyber and they've got that warehouse. It's a deadly 2 2 split. Not one that can easily be reinforced. It obviously will take some time for either 2 2 to regroup, hop in their cars and drive down. And by that point, it might be too late. But I think the presence from ISG is enough. And in fact, you can see on the map there, they are leaving the 2 2. They are going to group up on those shanties and I like that play from ISG. Bottom of the leaderboard currently so they need a good win and one of the ways you get a good win is keep yourself up as four. Unicorn Cyber have not done that. Forest on the emergency parachute as well uh, all the way in the sky. In fact they're probably going to come down on top of that unplayable and just be a nuisance for everyone in the in the lobby potentially ISG as well but we remain on Unicorn Cyber who remain in in dire straits. <laughs> I'm not really sure if they're going to be able to even get much out of this form of exchange against some of the squads up there. So they're kind of stuck in between, especially with Forrest uh, over on their south. There's honestly not too much spacing for them to work with. So either they basically hunker down, play a little bit more defensive and wait for the next space to appear, then only make another form of rotation. Meanwhile, the rest of PMA so far have been pretty steady after that initial battle that they had over onto the southern quarters of the map. We'll be eyeing out onto the gas station, Norins. All alone as the day trade member will at least be safe from harm's way at the moment. Not too sure if there's ever going to be any form of backing with Valtai even much closer to the side of PMA. Oh, this is looking very, very dicey as we approach the late stage of the game. Yeah, this is one of the spots where teams kind of end up um, just because of this circle can shift north quite often and that compound is a nice staging point to, to take to give you access to the north and unfortunately two teams have ended up inside it and in this weird kind of agreement to just share the compound for the moment. Darkness find themselves stranded on the side of that hill and Shinosuke has been knocked down by GLS. This is happening in the blue, mind you. Shinos Shinosuke was the cover. He was the one covering his team all the way on that side of the hill. He's been knocked down. Now trying to get flushed out by a completely separate team as well. That's Armory off in the distance trying to yoink that, but Zayu's there to finally get his kill. And then the rest of Dopeness now are going to be in a lot of trouble. GLS coming in for the flank. Dimisty though making it even harder for Dopeness. In fact, they're not shooting at GLS because they can't. GLS are the ones in uh, firm control of this situation, being helped out by Armory Gaming and having to fight GLS is just not a good combination. So Uka and uh, Omoshidaten are just going to get the hell out of there. 
Yeah, they just really have to make a dash for it. So Uka at least survives the tail to tail for now. Armor and gaming have gated them for quite some time as well, just from the minimap. And both of these teams will still have to journey their way back towards the south, as we do see the update of the circle pulling it towards the outskirts of Picado. So this is definitely going to be challenging to raise. Some of the areas are just flat grounds, unworkable at all in this current state of the game, where we're going to be seeing a lot of those battles taking place on top of the mountains. It's it's a very rough shift for so many teams. The ones that were playing it for the north have now had their entire game plan thrown out the window. The ones who are playing it for the south probably aren't in the best spots because they weren't really uh, necessarily accounting for a southern shift. They were just playing it just in case it went north or in case it went closer to the unplayables. These two teams, actually PMA and, and Valley Thai, funnily enough, end up in a decent spot. It's, it's rough, don't get me wrong. You never want to be sharing a compound like this uh, especially when you're dead center as well. It just limits you so much. Valley Tire are going to be able to look to the south where most of the teams are going to be. And then there's PMA, who can't rotate, who can't really do anything. A lot of the angles they can actually shoot from are completely uh, locked out from them because if they start to shoot through those uh, top four doors and things like that, they're going to be shot at by Valley Tire. In fact, they're going to have to peek out of those um, backside uh, openings uh, if they want to shoot at the south. And then Valley Tire is obviously going to be there to potentially take uh, advantage of that. They're also both in nade range of each other, which could cause its own problems. ISG, they had sent a while ago, no longer. T9's been taken down, Riz will get that one, and Armory Gaming look to clean up their side of the zone. So sharp coming in from the side of Riz, and is eventually going to be able to secure it, unless that's going to be stolen away. Rest of Armory Gaming closing in, spots out more members inside of GLS. See if Stack's going to be able to get one more. Oh. As he's basically having some trades going on. Dimacy, James, all pinned out by the side of Kuei-sama. And there is going to be Zui that will also catch uh, the finishing blow. Armory Gaming will leave Rose on foot. There is a vehicle to work with, and they will be able to spot out Diane as oh he turns my. his back, trying to actually catch his teammates instead. Hong Nam now dropping in the grenade and will be basically making a dash to keep himself alive for now. This power grid fiasco is just starting to conclude. Oh, Armory centered into those balls, hoping that the cover from, uh, I believe it was Riz or Dimacy up on the top there, or maybe it was Shanks. They were just hoping for that cover to be good enough to support them while they were in that bowl, but that was not the case. The lines of sight weren't good at all. Armory sent it into those balls, just get torn apart. GLS were ready for them, and GLS had their crosshairs lined up on those driver's seats when they drove in. And then, of course, it makes it even harder for the rest of Armory to survive with ISG and Whitefish in the background. So Armory Gaming caught in between a multitude of teams here without anything they can really do. They took that fight. You've got to respect them for that. But it was a very quick fight, and they didn't really have any chance of winning it. Whitefish very nicely spread on top of these unplayables as well. It's shifted off of them a decent amount. They're still going to have terrain to play with as ISG finish off GLS, but the priority now for Whitefish is Forest, who are creeping their way up just underneath these unplayables. Yeah, eventually we'll have to climb down and maybe have to even force a fight against the rest of Forest. They do have Dahlia positioned pretty nicely over the top, of course. And also having the angle coverage coming in from the side of Tiari. So far, trying to at least give them a little bit more pressure, but that's not going to be flushing any sort of members away from the side of the forest at all. In fact, they're just going to be hiding right underneath their noses oh. for a time being. No angles to work with, and also spotting up other teams, trying to also attack forest from another corner. KM, though, spotted out. Dahlia won't be able to land it just yet. Molotovs. Oh. Oh, oh no. He burned himself instead. Nah, that's rookie. Uh, uh, he tried, uh. but yeah, to no avail, unfortunately, for Dahlia. He'll heal himself up. So, not too much of an issue, but I, I think the most important thing there is that's information gained, right? That's information gained for Whitefish. Forest, though, they have to fight towards Panic now. Panic are coming in from the edge of the zone. They didn't have any spot to play, and so they're going to invade. The terrain that Forrest is sitting in, Forrest have a, a nice piece of terrain, mind you, so Panic certainly going to be wanting this. ISG now getting involved with Whitefish on top of the unplayables as well. It's chaos on the northern side of the zone here as everyone's got to come off this high ground and put themselves in the line of sight of everyone across the zone. Those hungry eyes looking at these as, as just pure kills right now. Panic, though, incredibly 
struggling on the western side there. They're going to have to move their way down into that compound with PMA and Valley Tai, essentially. Dusky might even be the last one up for, for Panic at the moment. Never mind, they have three. Uh, I'm surprised that uh, three members of Panic have survived for as long as they have. They found themselves in a very low ground position on the far western side of zone. Look at that. Nurance mm -hmm. has complete eyes uh, on both those players, but they've got a car to work with so they can make their escape. Yeah, and also luckily for both of those squads because we had Lightfish over on top of the hill and they decided to rotate away. Uh, and that basically allows a little bit more spacing for PNC to basically work with. Now, first, Natural Gaming will just slowly creep right in, but still stuck in between both PMA as well as Whitefish. With PNC, Ooh. will just obliterate the final members of Daytrack Gaming taking over the gas station. Well, Olympus, let's see if he can basically find something with his DMRs. Dusky will have a little bit of a problem there. I believe that I see a stealth leader or something like that. Not too sure. I'm gonna check it once again, but. Anyways, back to the side of Forest Gaming. They're still in close proximities and already doking up some damage from afar. Whoa, this is not going to be uh, doing him good. Very little cover as they need to proceed to move down the hill. RxC looking in... Uh... Looking like they're in a decent spot right now, aren't they? I feel like a lot of the action's gonna happen on the round, the edge of the circle. Teams are gonna weaken each other and is just gonna clean up, clean up towards the end of the game. It would be another one of those games where potentially they, they don't get that many kills because they are in one of those central compound locations. They're gonna have to really capitalize on people coming down from the north. But as you can see on the map, Whitefish Forest, in fact, as you can see in the picture in picture, they're both going at it with each other right now. Trading blows, getting shot at from RxC as well. I told you, man, RxC, they want these kills. They need these kills. They need to put themselves up there, fight with the rest of the top teams currently uh, in the seventh. But look, they can definitely get more. We've seen it. We've seen it from there many, many times. KM99, the top fragger in the lobby, looking towards Whitefish. But what can he really do? He's kind of got to overextend a little bit too much. And if he overextends, not only does he open himself to Whitefish, he opens himself up to RxC as well. But he's making the play regardless. He doesn't care. Blue Zone backpack is on. He can tank this as much as he wants. He's going to make that play around Whitefish. Olympus opens it up for him. He's going to get the second one. Can he get the third? He cannot. If Evan trades it out, but Scappy and the rest of Forest are here to finish off Whitefish. Kind of overheated a little bit there, and like you said, a little bit of overconfidence being displayed from the side of KM99, but he did smell blood and still will get the advantage for the rest of Forest Natural Gaming. Huge nade dropped towards Sans Scappy. Won't be bringing him down, but Feven, does he even have a fighting chance? The blues already creeping in as well. Reps at Esports also will have some long range duels, but Valley Tie Esports so far really racking up a lot of elimination points with his Megloss. Securing those kills onto PMA while we continue on with this long extended trade from the side of Forest. Now, leaving with only one member after that push towards the members of Whitefish. Yeah, only one up for Forest. They, they did exactly what I thought they would do. Trade blows until you end up with uh, one up or two up on, on both teams. Master is the only one up for Forest, and then uh, Fevin's the only one up for Whitefish. So it's unfortunate for both those teams, but. We move over to another pretty influential fight in this late game here. The team that ends up victorious in this compound is certainly going to have an impact on RxE's game. But RxE, yeah, roast into glasses coming over here thinking they can third party. All the actions happening on the south side of this compound, though. Reluctant squad cleaning FRKS up. Hasn't been a good tournament from FRKS yet. In fact, Reluctant squad taking losses of their own. They really desperately need this res. If they can't get this, then the rest of the fight is going to be a lot harder for them, but it looks like they are getting it with the backup, the help of Hoang on the backside ridge. Yeah, it definitely has been a really uh, tough to for the side of FRKS, but we do see uh, gradual improvements heading into this match of Miramar where their survival rate definitely has increased. This is going to be able to find one as they are also spawning out members from the side of FTF and Dopeness will finish up at 8, but RxE! They just wiped out the entirety of FTF. Very clean. I, I mean, uh, you can't ask for an engagement that much cleaner, but they had to push themselves outside of those compounds uh, to do it. danahan has gone down for it. Valet Tai remain very dominant in this game, taking out PMA. I think that was a gimme given the uh, positions both those teams were in in that compound. So power's now gone down. Valet Tai looking on fire. We saw an excellent defense from them 
last night, the very last game of the night, they looked incredibly good, looking to continue that form and continue that momentum going into night two here. RxC still on the outside of that warehouse compound. They know how important it is to weaken the teams around them, and I love to see that from RxC. It's very heads up play, 4G down, tries to make a, a 1v3 attempt onto Reluctant Squad, but shut down just as quickly as he jumped out that window. The rest of FRKS now stuck inside. The only building they have to play, and Reluctant Squad are going to be looking to clean those guys up. That was such a risky decision to make, making coming in from the member of FRKS and absolutely got punished for that. Reluctant Squad now sees a chance to be also trade right back as they still will continue to trade. Magic to spot a uh, Reluctant Squad as well from the outskirts. So Valtai Esports, they are on a hunt and they will get it. Seven points, the highest right now, and aimed up to eight with that kill secured. Valley Thai Esports, they just have the supreme mastery of Miramar. Not a single time we've seen them drop away from a top five finish. And now, once again, the Korean pretty much hefty mile points heading into the first matchup of the day. Reluctant Squad next one to bow out. Now, FRKS makes it to the top four for the very first time. The game's kind of come to not only Valley Tide, but RxE as well. They've had to make a couple important decisions and they've had a couple pivotal moments for themselves. Obviously, RxE, FTF, that's a, a good fight for them to uh, win and for RxE as well, pushing themselves out of this compound and not losing a single member uh, is another reason why they have a, a really sick chance of winning this game. For Valley Tai, it was essentially that uh, defense against PMA. PMA were in the northern side of that compound and if PMA would put up a decent fight against them as they ran towards Valley Tai to try and get out of that compound, then Mm -hmm. Maybe we're not looking at Valley Tai to potentially win this game, but it was a very clean, uh, a clean engagement from Valley Tai against PMA, who were sharing that compound previously. And uh, well, eight kills to their name so far. I think they know that Forest is up there on the north. They uh, allocated two players to make sure that at least that northern side is clean, and the zone's going to help them out with that as well. Not entirely. There's still a little bit of terrain that maybe Forest can play, but Valley Tai being very vigilant diligent right now. I think they know pretty much where everyone is in the zone. I think they know that it's four up for RxE, and there's probably a solo somewhere up there on the north. Yeah, good read from inside of Valtai Esports, and you were pretty spot on when you mentioned during like base four or so where RxE has gotten the prime state where all the other teams basically will have to battle it out for the valley, and once it all settles down, this is where they're going to be able to basically do all the cleanup to eventually look for that closure but Master, since he's all alone, he might as well try to seek oh. out for opportunities. And he's basically having all eyes on all the members of Valtai Esports, but there's also pressure coming in from the side of RxE. So this is going to be the last stand. Is he going to find it? To connect one shot, not enough to knock out the members of Valtai on that vehicle. And he, he's just going to throw in everything, including the kitchen sink. Yeah, look, for a Master can't do anything here. He's going to go down to the blue. That was inevitable. What's not inevitable is this push from Valley Tai. This is so aggressive, but probably necessary from them. They can't have sat on their side of the zone the entire time. Val Latte's knocked himself. Megalos has the <gasps> trade, though, but I feel like this is just disaster from Valley Tai. Rapsiek Esports are going to wrap this one up. I'm sure of it. There's not much they can do. Valley Tai, I mean, against RxE right now. They've got full control of the situation, and there it is. RxE will be the first victors of the night. I said earlier on that maybe this was going to be a game they don't get many kills, but look at that. 13 on the trot for RxE. What a way to start their night. And this will be their third chicken dinner here in the playoffs, looking supreme with their current momentum. Brought forth from day one, and will still have it in the bag. And the way that they basically taken control of the entire state of the matchup was just sublime so of course we will be showing you guys once again all the highlights of all the action but the way that they played out they were calm they were composed and honestly valentine esports like you said they they didn't really have too much of a great area to play especially with some sort of hiccups with push uh not really favoring them in that sort of exchange so rxe basically picked this one up clean yeah <laughs> I feel like I'm just warming up into the night. I mean, I, I mean, a decent game, right? A decent game to start us off. I don't, I don't think it had the same stature or excitement as some of the games yesterday. But that circle certainly was pretty wacky. 
put, uh, put a lot of the teams in uh, a difficult situation, to, to say the least. That massive unplayable barrier, of course, a lot of the time you just have to kind of maneuver around to the western side or the eastern side. And I mean, that just creates these incredible choke points for teams to capitalize on. This was one of the pivotal moments for me. I, I mean, the teams that are up here on the north, if you can survive with four, uh, amongst all of this chaos, mind you, it, it's incredibly mm -hmm. difficult. But if you can survive as four, you put yourself in decent standing to take the kind of positions that Valley Tide did towards the end of the game. This was a really nice play from KM99. I think he realized that he was uh, basically uh, committing his life to make sure they could win the fight against WF, secure four points um, and, and give his team a lot of space to work with. So very valiant and commendable effort from KM99. Not so much though for 4G. Yeah, and the master also have master to pull in a top three finish to survive to the tail end of it. Well, Rapsic Esports basically waited for that golden moment and they did manage to also pick up those 10 solid points before going for that final commitment against Valtai Esports. And all they really have to do, drop those nades into the open space of the warehouse and eventually just go in for that clean sweep. So pretty straightforward of how RXE have been able to just close this one off. So, of course, may not be as flashy as compared to some of the games that we do see yesterday, but it really does set a proper tone of how things are going to go for day two. Yeah, I feel like Valley Tide there, um, potentially it was a bit of a, a rush decision because I think they realized that RXE had an emphasis towards the south. Uh, they were mm -hmm. playing outside of that compound and they were looking to clean up the teams that were coming out of the compound right next to them. And I think Valley Tide maybe realized that, but a little bit too late. Uh, and so they wanted to take the soft side of, of the control that RxE had essentially. In, in, in that case, it was the northern side. If they can crash into the warehouse, take out the one or two guys that are defending the north, then Valley Tide actually have a decent chance uh, at winning that. But they were kind of bogged down in having to deal with a master by the time they dealt with master or decided to ignore him. Um, it was too late. RxE had a massive emphasis towards that warehouse. Obviously, it doesn't help at all that Latte knocked himself as soon as he entered the uh, the warehouse out of the car. Either hopped out too quick, uh, maybe it was a ping thing, who knows? But uh, that, that's you really can't have that happen when you're making a play as pivotal as that. And so Valley Tide tried. They absolutely tried. I think maybe, again, too rushed or too late and whatever it was, it just didn't really work out for them. I like the play, though. I think fundamentally it's mm -hmm. decent. Uh, you understand that RxE have an emphasis towards the south. You want to take what they don't have and that's kind of towards the north. So decent mm -hmm. attempt from Valet Tai, um, but RxE, man, 13 kills to, to start off the night and off the back of yesterday where they had two wins. This is a lot of momentum and a lot of confidence going straight into their back pocket. Yeah, I certainly agree when it does seem like a rush stance coming here from the side of Valatai Esports. But prior to that, we basically see them in such a great spot where a lot of teams were basically cutting into their corner of the map. And then they've been able to pick up multiple teams while they were on midst of rotation, though we may not actually catch everything on camera where there's just a lot of open spacing for them to basically work with. So from that, they also did manage to pick up a lot of kill points. So with that being said, let's take a look. How much have they been able to rack up? RxE, they got themselves the chicken dinner along with those huge amount of kill points that will add up to 23 to top the board. Of course, Battle Tide Esports did manage to secure a second space with 15 points on the block. Meanwhile, Forest with eight and seven for FRKS. Very top heavy game. RxC and, and Valley Tai hogging all the hogging all the points in that one. It's a seven point drop off to, to third. Uh, and that was Forest. So I guess consistency for, for Forest remains. Decent game from FRKS, better game than we saw from them uh, yesterday. I'm looking at Panic Much in better. the exact same spot as I've seen them basically every game this tournament, just up in that like fifth to seventh spot uh, of, of total points gained in, a, in, in any game. That gap between 11th and 12th got much bigger that game. It was 30, oh sorry, 20 something points uh, before that game, I believe. And it is quite, uh, quite a, a bit larger uh, after that game. Panic trying to break themselves away from that bottom five as much as they possibly can, uh, which is exactly what they should be doing. And they put themselves right in contention for that uh, top eight position. Again, I mean, you're looking at it, 41 to eighth, which is 49. That's eight points. That's very doable uh, in a lobby like this. It's very doable for so many teams, but the ones like uh, FRKS and everyone else in that bottom five, it is slowly slipping away from them. You cannot be letting Panic be having decent games, average games, keeping their points per game up while you have bad games. You just cannot let that happen. Uh, so for that bottom five, I don't want to write them off just yet, 
yet, but it's very, it's getting very close to that point, and we're not even halfway through the uh, the playoffs yet. Yeah, we're not even halfway there yet. So there is going to be opportunities here in day two, as we will be uh, having our final Miramar match of today, and then we'll head on to take a later on. But when we look into uh, how things have uh, basically churned up in our first game of the day, we still see some improvements at the very least because FRKS, they start off on a singular digit. So with this form of finish, they are slowly inching in, although we did see that disparity being pretty huge of a margin for them to chase for now. But within the span of five games, anything is still possible. If it's going to be a chicken dinner, I think they would have actually saved themselves to be able to eventually fight for that top eight position. Yeah, it's, it's, it's man, I, I, I do feel really bad about the um, the bottom five. Although, to, 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 to what you were saying, uh, actually, FRKS feels like they're fighting early all the time. Feels yeah. like we haven't really seen them in, <laughs> in any engagement that's kind of mid to, to late game. Maybe that game was the only time we saw them, or, or, or am I getting my, myself mixed up? I, either way, FKS have been fighting early basically the entire tournament, which is a recipe for disaster. It can be a recipe for success if you win your fights at the start of every game. FKS have not been doing that. They've been uh, pretty much dominated um, every single time. So it's very unfortunate for them. In fact, they've been taking fights with, with other bottom five teams. Uh, I believe it was maybe Pixel Stars we saw them take a fight with in Porto Pariso the other day, or, or maybe it was ISG. Can't remember. Um, but those bottom five teams have just been fighting amongst themselves. It's just this this mess down there. But uh, we do have a fight for that top eight spot. There are teams that are very close. Um, Panic is obviously the furthest away, but they are only eight points away, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and mm -hmm. they absolutely have a shot. I think the top, uh, I actually don't know. I I'd like to see the the, the, the the twire again, because we saw the leaderboard just then, but um, mm -hmm. I'd like to bring it up for myself, just to remind myself of, <laughs> of how good the top you know, four or five are doing in comparison to the uh, the rest of the top eight, because I think we're going to see a bit of a breakaway uh, in in the top eight teams. I just don't know when it's going to start happening or um, how bad that gap is going to to be. So I'm just waiting for the Twilight update, uh, and then I can then I can start to look towards that. Yeah, we'll definitely catch it in a bit. But Rapsic Esports now adding so much points uh, into this match, they should be pretty much poised into the position to eventually overtake even Forest Gaming, where of course this game was a little bit rougher on how things have played out for the side of Forest Gaming, where we saw they have always been dealing with a couple of teams surrounding them while they were battling over on top side of the hill, which of course they made uh, a an effort to be able to at least squeeze some points to get by into the top three. So they're definitely still trying to defend that, that spot for themselves. Meanwhile, they trade this time did struggle a little bit back in game one where they, of course, got that early ambush coming in from the side of PMA, which was a little bit surprising of how that execution actually happened with without them being able to trace that lurker from the side of PMA. So I, I definitely want to see a lot more of all these kind of uh, early shenanigans once again from PMA if they do take that center stage in Potato again. Yeah, uh, it's it's a, a, sh a show of confidence from, from Tian. I mean, uh, doing a play like that early on, it's a play you can so easily back down uh, from, right? You can so easily call that off for yourself, but um, for Tian in that moment, it's not what he's doing. He's saying, okay, guys, I have, a, I have a really good opportunity here to get us a really sick central position, but on top of that, we can potentially wipe a team, get two to three kills, uh, you know, worst case scenario. And Tian puts himself at risk uh, to do that, which of course is a sign um, of confidence. It's a sign of experience too. He knows that by putting himself in the middle of day trade, in the middle of two players of day trade, he's got all the information that his team can act on. Unfortunately, in the early game there, PMA were kind of caught up dealing with Flash. Flash was on the low ground there, uh, dealing with three of PMA. PMA put themselves in that low ground compound and unfortunately couldn't find themselves a way up uh, to help Tian. And so Tian had to take a, a 1v2. You could probably argue that Tian could get out of there and avoid that 1v2 and um, mm -hmm. put himself in the line of sight of his teammates and live from there. Then maybe PMA have four up at that point, but he didn't do that. He took that 1v2. Of course, it was quite a close 1v2 as well, but to even be doing that in the first place, um, it, it shows confidence, right? And uh, yeah. that, that's the kind of stuff that's going to put you in the top eight. If you're not doing that kind of stuff, you're going to fall out of the top eight. Mm -hmm. And of course, PMA definitely represented the master region very, very well, as we now do have game two at the ready, as we'll see whether or not there's going to be, of course, similar type of play style to be implemented by a majority of the team. 
Reapers. Uh, some of all these uh, hardships are looking a little bit scuffy back in game one. I hope that maybe this time Circle will be a little bit kinder sure, for these guys. <laughs> yeah, that, that circle was was pretty rough to be honest with you. I mean, it, it's n it's not super rough until it shifts uh, towards the unplayables, right? Then it becomes um, a bit of a, a mystery, kind of how it's going to play out, and then it becomes even more rough because we saw a lot of teams uh, playing for that northern side, and then it goes south, and then it goes towards those fields, and it, it becomes even more rough there because everyone's going to come off the high ground. Uh, and usually in PUBG, if there's a bunch of teams that have to come off the top of a high ground. Yeah, you get a lot of shenanigans. You get teams just playing for their, their kill points and then um, hopefully they get some placement points. And that's what we saw Forrest do. It's what we saw Whitefish do. Obviously, Forrest coming out on top uh, in that specific engagement, in my opinion. I mean, they did have one survive uh, until that uh, top three spot. So here we go. Fly over in Boxing Ring, an iconic spot uh, at this point in time. Maybe not as iconic as Pachinki, but Certainly in my heart, it is an absolute favorite hot drop location of mine. Out the top window to look at the rest of Miramar. It's match two, and the first Miramar showed us some wacky circles. Whether or not that's going to happen in game two is yet to be seen. I am still hoping for that Eastern Island circle, but I will settle for a Partona, or like you said yesterday, a prison. I'll be totally happy with that as well. Oh, I would definitely love to see it, because I think like a witness, you know, uh, only once in, I don't know, so many hundreds of games where I played it out and it was just so rare that it occurs. And when that happens, I'm not even sure if the pros here will be ready to even get to that kind of scenario where you, teams will have to cut over through the bridge, whether if it's from Valdemar or even over onto Platona. So, um, well, if it happens for sure. So they don't really have to worry for that, about that for now. So. When we take a look at the map, though, we do see some teams starting off driving in close proximities. So we'll probably we'll see maybe a little early of a pickoff coming in. But looks to me that most majority of them will be pretty much safe and sound. Circle does go towards the south side. We may not get prison, but it does cover a little bit of circumference for that section. Yeah. We can still hope for a Partona, potentially, if we get a very southern hard shift, but I, th I think you're right. I think it's a bit of a pipe dream at this point. Day trade remain in uh, a fantastic spot, similar to last game. ISG actually in a decent spot. This is one of those games where if you're ISG at the bottom of the leaderboard, you're really hoping for a much better shift than you got last time, because uh, again, you're in a really solid spot to capitalize on a great circle feed. Earlier in the previous game, we saw them with the shanties just uh, west of Power Grid. And generally, if you're going to be fed at that location, um, you, can, you can have a really good game. And then the circle kind of messed with them a little bit. They had to make plays fight towards the east, and it was just not, it just didn't work out after that. But they've got kind of a, a second wind. Um, they're going to be able to, to try again in this game because they've got full access to the center of the zone. All the high ground locations in and amongst those hills. Well, it's all ISGs and Daytrade's probably going to have second priority as they come in from the north uh, at Trumacera. FRKS, uh, so it, I, this kind of does confirm to me that they were here yesterday um, fighting in Puerto Pariso in that hot drop that we saw. This time around, though, no hot drop to be spoken of, and this is uh, a little bit more early game action potentially. It hasn't really popped off yet. Olympus is driving away from DNE. DNE is one of those teams where maybe at this point in the tournament, if Olympus or any other solo just kind of drops in and or around your location, you just send it, you go for it. You pick up uh, bare bones, utility, armor, weapons, uh, and you just try to get that kill, build that momentum. Uh, hopefully you can uh, build off that momentum going into the late game. That's an 8x, nice pick up there for Omicha Dutton uh, on the uh, bolt. Uh, but yeah, for DNA, I don't even think they know Olympus is there, but if they did, I wouldn't be surprised if I saw them going for that kill because you need them at this point. You desperately, desperately need them. Yeah, absolutely, especially with an 8x off the bat. That will definitely provide them with That's info. just about enough. And Spinoski has already gotten that. So it's going to see if they'll be able to trace the rest of them. Well, it's going to be quite the coverage, though, once they are on the opposite side of the valley. Meanwhile, it seems like they're still scavenging for any form of utilities that they could possibly get. ISG all the way down over on Valdemar will be having some really, really good time to get themselves stocked up in order to prepare for the later phases of the game. So far, it doesn't seem like there's going to be teams around this township for the moment, so they're going to be A-OK. -okay. Well, whereas, if I do take a look at the map stream right now, RxE 
they will have the furthest journey uh, as compared to the rest of the squads out there. May have to bypass the likes of Armory Gaming by the corners of St. Martin and also traverse towards either Picado. And if they basically take the long way route, it's still going to be pretty tough for the victors of the past matchup. So that will be a story we'll uh, tell later on. But for Panic Esports, we've seen some improvements coming into the game one of day two for the entire squad of OCE. So hoping to actually see what more can they basically get out of this matchup where PMA will send Small Town Kid to have a lookout into the city of Jumacera. Well, the Tiny Esports could be uh, following their passage from quite a far to look at the minimap. Meanwhile, it's going to be a defensive uh, form of setup coming in from day trade within this top end of the city of Jumacera by the factories. Decent spot. Nice split too. Just go kind of one, 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 one. Kind of remain kind of close to each other just in case something uh, goes awry and you can be there. Okay, are you serious? What? With a red Are you serious, fight? Pooches? Just, uh, okay. Uh, this guy. It just a quick little burst. Get that quick headshot. If he was able to land the last few bullets as well, that would have been absolutely insane. Best highlight play of uh, certainly today, maybe even... Probably just one of those crazy moments uh, across this whole tournament, but unfortunately, he wasn't. In fact, he ran out of ammo in that Ace 32, so that was like the remainder of his bullets just dedicated to that. That's plus 62 damage. If you're a damage farmer, we rejoice. Pooch is on top. And he's alone right now. One of those situations where if it was a team kind of rotating his four um, and he decided to, to spray those bullets, maybe that team would decide to turn straight into that compound, breach him, take him out, and then it's a disaster. But Pooch's remains... Uh, quite safe and probably deterred that 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 team and, and that player from from even getting involved off the back of that headshot so reluctant squad they're up here still very close to pma on top of those unplayables with a, a nice split down to the south as well this is a pretty common split um you'll see between uh, teams that like to split across this road they take this high ground they take the southern high ground it gives them a lot of control they can get information on teams rotating uh, down this road as well but i think uh, most importantly for Long Hai and Huang up here, they're in really good spots to uh, sneak a good couple kills. And then they've got that massive vertical cliff they can just fall back off of. Um, if they happen to put themselves in a little bit too much danger, they can just jump off that cliff side. So in a decent spot, reluctant squad with a split, I'm liking a lot. And it seems like uh, they've got their cars parked as well, ready to leave. Say if uh, uh, Jun was to get breached right now, then he'd be able to leave, group up with his teammates, and it wouldn't really be an issue. So nice split from reluctant squad. Do PMA venture over here is the question. Yeah, for now, they don't necessarily have to do so as all the teams are waiting for that shift. If it does pull towards the side of a uh, reluctant squad, though, that is just going to be the pixel perfect for them as they've already got that immaculate setup. But for Unicorn Cyber, though, they are over on north side dealing with Armory Gaming as they manage to spot them uh, in the midst of that rotation over on the top end of the hill. Not being able to catch them just yet. We still see them uh, pretty much getting themselves into a better position instead so they don't really want to overcommit this early in the game especially with ftf not too far off so it's just gonna be some long range taps coming from between the tie side as well as uh the veterinary squad of unicorn cyber for now um, i'm just gonna wonder if armory gaming is just gonna be uh going on that Full aggro approach once again because every single match that we've seen them so far, they they have that no back down mentality. And then if that exchange happens, they walk away with maybe one or two surviving and unable to play that late game. So hopefully they will be able to uh, get themselves a little bit of a safety net in the early game at the very least. While James is going to see if he can basically get a little bit of a bypass towards the our west end and that's also where members of the side of forest will be by, oh, between the no. corners of the valley surprise ruins for orca and oh but he's got to commit he's in such an awkward spot the bullets would have landed on the ground i think unicorn cyber destroys specifically would have heard the bullets hit orca's body and so that's full information gained but unicorn cyber know they were being approached on so maybe it's not such pivotal information but certainly 
They know that now that at least there's another member here. There's now two members of FTF trying to get involved with Unicorn Cyber here. And FTF are going to back off. But I think potentially uh, off the back of DNE's damage, it's not easy to push around the side of that compound when you're getting shot in the back. That said, it's probably the priority way to do it, but not in this situation. Amish Darton actually, with an SKS from, from a decent range, has knocked Man Hung. So maybe FTF consider getting back into this, but I think FTF have already committed to, to backing off. Orkarin stays, though. Orkarin stays, and maybe FTF just wants to put the brakes on a little bit and kind of uh, re-engage this situation with a different strategy. Manhung is going to get rezzed, and Unicorn Cyber will be able to go back to four up. That circle has done nothing but center up. Pretty even donut. So ISG in a fantastic spot, and Destroy is going to uh, confirm to FTF that this is their territory. Uh, in fact, it's not even anyone's territory at the moment. Out of zone right now. So both teams have to leave. No point in taking a fight on edge right now. Yeah, really no point at all to take unnecessary fights at the moment. Just putting themselves at risk while you've gone cyber. Uh, didn't really have to travel all too far. They probably might be booking some form of a small estate if they could basically find one for now and then hunker down for a moment. There's uh, so many teams uh, the further down they extend this stretch. Some over onto the unplayables as well. So they're definitely keeping an eye out for this. Pal now driving by. Uh, this might actually be a good catch if Whitefish spots this movement. Well, Shank gonna be uh, opening up a little bit more of that spacing for themselves. Armory Gaming now will have oh, to boy. deal with the rest of FTF. Passing by. Oh. Oh boy, this is gonna I be like this. huge. Oh, the nade. It could have been so good if cooked a little bit earlier, but that uh, Dimasty's now announced himself. This gets awkward now for Dimasty and Shanks. They've got to back off. It's a four versus two, and they're not even in zone. Time to get out of here, boys. Use those unplayables as cover. Get back in that buggy. Shanks will secure the buggy, and then I think they're just going to use these unplayables to LOS FTF. That Molly's not <laughs> going to do any good at all. They just want to get out of here. They're potentially panicking. Dimasty's been left behind. He's got backup in the form of a couple teammates in Jame and Riz, but they are way too far north to even see FTF at the moment. But there's a little bit of action <gasps> going on between Panic and Forest. Panic have secured a couple knocks. Forest traded one back, but look who it is. The top fragger for Forest Gaming is the last one up. Panic have basically all but won this fight. Suspect down on the fence. Maybe he loses his life, but Panic securing that res to make sure they're three up and they can take that one versus three against KM99. But before we can even think about Panic winning this fight, I assume G in the form of Aegon have pushed themselves down here to third party. I wonder if KM99 could basically seal the deal though, because we're, we're looking to Panic Esports. They're still trying to actually get the res up. They're also dealing with some pressure coming from ISG on the top of the mountain. And this is KM99 going for a push. Gets oh, the knock and going for a double. No way. KM, he gets pinned out, but they're still master alive. He's got so little health. Hug him by the corner of the wall. He's got to pray that no nades fall through these corners. Gonna bring up the folded shield. And should be able to actually go in for the rescue right now. But the moment that the rest of these other players gets resuscitated from the other corner of Panic, the push might come into effect. So PNC, they're not leaving that compound. So that actually gives Forwards Gaming a fighting chance. Oh my gosh. Panic were in control of this engagement off the bat. Essentially, they got the three knocks that they needed. KM99 comes in with an absolute hero play and delivers for Forest Gaming. It's now turned into a 3v3. Remember what it was a minute and a half ago. Panic in full control. Aegon's had no impact on this fight at uh -huh. all. Maybe he's limiting angles uh, on the north there, but that certainly hasn't had too much of an impact on this uh, Panic versus Forest fight. It's all KM99. Off the back of those two knocks, it means he's able to get his two teammates up and it turns it into a 3v3. That is insane and Panic will be devastated, especially if they go out here to Forest, the team they had so much control over just seconds ago. And now they find themselves stuck in this compound. ISG, a nuisance on top of the hill, sharing singular buildings between each other. This is an absolute disaster for Panic. Yeah, perhaps the pressure coming from ISG is the reason why they did. weren't all too confident to go in for that full push towards the rest of the members of Forest. So they will just have to make do for now. Me sharing estates with these noisy neighbors and all oh, poor shoes. Damn. That's so unlucky. Well, I guess that's what you get in the late game when you go in for those emergency parachutes. So it's just easy to spot, especially when you are 
flying close to all these hills. Well, these neighbors don't seem too noisy after all, but first, information has already been gained from either side. It's just that they're just it's... waiting for the first move. And it's oh. Kirby KM99! Okay. He's just gonna run for it! There and they're all wrapped around. Dusky, can he actually hold through the doors? He's gonna try to heal it for now as they slowly lose members one after another. It's only like work as well as Dusky and the rest of Forest. They're basically throwing some oh. users towards the top. GLS. And Dusky, he's just trying to get some cover over the lower ground, but he's got no intel, no info at all. GLS getting involved now as well. This is good for Panic. If they wanted to somehow recover this situation that has gone awry for them so terribly, then GLS might be their saving grace. Forest Gaming, absolute man mode, decided to push over and clean them out of the compound. They don't want to share this. And Panic completely caught off guard. KM99 opening it up again. Who else but the current top frag in the lobby? Scappy's there as well. Light work down. It's just one up for Panic. They have completely thrown this situation away in control. Not three minutes ago. And now Forest remain the dominant team in that compound. They can claim both those buildings now. They are not limited to just one Panic. What a disaster from them. Reluctant squad now. Six, seven, eight, nine actually. With three kills of his own, PMA torn apart with the assistance of uh, the rest of uh, Reluctant Squad. I think 6789 was under a little less pressure in that scenario, but still, regardless, a good individual performance from him as PMA mm -hmm. decided to breach him as two, and the rest of PMA are now coming over. Do they want revenge? Do they just want to send themselves into their death? They want to make sure they get at least a couple of these kills stuck uh -huh. inside that car cover in the smokes, in and amongst all these cars. Unicorn Cyber take out WF. In the meantime, Reluctant Squad has PMA. Reluctant Squad keep four up. Jun will go down, but it's not much stress. Six, seven, eight, nine, and now onto four kills. It's all chaos in phase three. It is absolute chaos, and that approach really bit PMA in the back with that full rush actually having other teams to be sniping them down instead, so wasn't too much of a problem for RS to deal with by the end of it all. Dopeness, though, managing to survive some stray bullets coming from down the hills, and these couple of smokes will also allow other teams to also identify their current positioning, but they've really got no other choice as they are basically playing by the side of the hill. Can escape, manage to spot one out of ISG. We'll go in for the quick uh, takedown. While FTF will be able to find one out of Armory Gaming. That's going to be happening over onto the southwestern corner of the map. It's only going to be Shanks driving across with GLS as well as FTF having a go at it as well. That's not going to be looking all too easy for AG to survive. Meanwhile, Nate's toss right into these corners with Muck. Starting from a very difficult off angle to be spotted out, if in the case where Dopeness eventually push, but oh. this is not basic for them to work with, while Watte basically finds the rest of UNC. All right, a couple quick kills onto Latte. He'll take those. Valetai still four up. And I wouldn't say firm control of this uh, situation. It can go sideways for them very quickly in terrain like this. They've also got day trade they have to deal with. So Valet Tai kind of stretched thin, two teams they have to deal with, but at least they've done a, a ton of damage onto one of them. Unicorn Cyber might now be pushed towards day trade and then that becomes easy mode for Valet Tai. Have to see though, they're getting ready for it, I think. That car moving is an in indication to Valley Tai that they're going to put themselves right in the crosshairs of Day Trade. And Valley Tai hear these shots, they hear this exchange, and they want to get involved. Day Trade might do Valley Tai's work for them. Unicorn Cyber now just down to one member. That spray, not a single bullet hit. Not, there's not a single bullet hits. It's a difficult spray to hit, to be fair. But Day Trade now down to two. Unicorn Cyber go out, and Valley Tai remain in control of this hillside. Yeah. Force maneuvers coming in from the side of Unicorn Cyber. Meanwhile, Scappy. Okay. Oh, that, that looked a little bit too <laughs> convenient. I have to just pick it up happy right there. But, of course, the gaming so far looking really, really uh, solid. Only getting a little bit more safe space for himself towards the western corner map. While we did basically see majority of the squads being over on the north point. And Scappy managing to find the rest of AG running by. Only having smoke as cover for the meantime. Mass to also get into a little bit more of a crease to hide out for the moment. Horse now with seven points, now topping the board, giving chase through the side of RXE. RXE is still in the game with a full strength squad. The Valentine Esports now spots the rest of A-Trade. Flash 
Waiting for the exchange. Looking for Latte and we'll be able to knock down Medblos. Insane shots coming from afar. All the fighting's happening on the edge right now. The center of the circle is completely free. There's a massive warehouse in the middle that is fully open. Latte and Kiss are doing it all for Valley Tai right now. They trade gone, completely gone. They're in fourth right now and you want to see them up there, but I guess top eight is all that really matters. GLS up against FRKS. You ask me? I have a team that I back as my favorites to win this fight, but anything can go sideways here for GLS, but Hoang Nam isn't caught out by Lucky G's peak. He had the MG3 as well. That could have been dangerous. If 4G with that, I would have lost my mind, but Hoang Nam does go down. The rest of GLS now scrambling to save their fourth member. 4G hasn't been able to finish off Hoang Nam. Those nades come out, desperately trying to just get that one point for FRKS, but they can't do it. Diane here, he had a couple hero moments yesterday. Looking for another one here. Just a straight 1v1 for him at the moment. Teammates aren't really that close. 4G versus Diane, who's going to win it? And of course, it's Diane. The AK remains dominant in the close range, and the rest of Freaks are now here for FRKS. Sorry, are now here to try and back him up, but he can't do it. Uh, uh, this is just unbelievable from Diane. I'm losing my words trying to cast this because Diane is just taking all three of FRKS on as a solo. One versus three, and he wins it as well. This guy is an absolute demon. He just went in so confidently pushing true and you saw how he basically transitioned that just facing off the footsteps that they heard and man just basically wiped off the entire team by himself making it into the top eight reluctant squad so far we'll have more spacing for them after cleaning up a couple of teams from the outskirts as Valentine esports is still gonna be the one that will be controlling the top end though Latte after that form of a finish against another We'll see whether they'll be able to get much more. A couple more times being shot towards the top side of the hill as Armor Gaming. Hoping to catch GLS and he Damn. does! What was what that, nade. Janks? What a good nade. Couldn't really take fights uh, with his weapons, to be fair. Uh, vest broken, helmet on red HP, so... Better opportunity there is to just chuck a nade and hope for the best. Secures it. Risen Shanks. On the high ground here. Pixel starts off in the background. Riz taking those dragging off shots at long range. Riz currently out of zone, so is Shanks. They're gonna have to move their way uh, more north. They've got space to play, certainly, but they'll stick around for as long as they can to try and uh, pop a couple Pixel Stars heads, but Pixel Stars aren't really giving it to them at the moment, so I'm gonna back off a bit. Shanks actually getting closer. I, I, I don't know if I like this from Armory because they've got space to play, but I think this is one of the plays that Armory could make if they really want to cement themselves in the top of that leaderboard. If this actually pans out for them, if they are banking on Pixel Stars potentially um, dropping it to other teams, never mind. They're just going to fight them straight 2v4. This is Armory Gaming in a nutshell, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> a 2v4, and I, I even give them a fighting chance in this. Pixel Stars, bottom of the leaderboard. Armory Gaming in that top five position. Can they actually pull this off in a 2v4? The blue is going to stop behind them, so that's not going to be an issue. The only issue here for Armory Gaming is whether or not they can hit these shots. Yeah, outnumbered, but never out outgunned for the side of AG. Well, we move back towards the side of Valley Tide, just long range exchanges. Well, going back to Armory, they just basically got themselves into uh, something that they couldn't really outlast against a full squad of Pixel Stars. A bit too much more than they can chew, so I guess like they should learn their lesson by now in the upcoming games that, you know, I guess like when you're by the edge of it, they, does ha they do have the idea that well, might as well try because there's just an open field for them to drive by. And if they do basically go for that approach instead, it'll be the rest of Forest to be able to spot them out. So now it seems like things have settled down for quite a bit, getting into the top five situation here. Belly Tai has such a great spacing across these hills. While Pixel Stars managed to catch a glimpse of the two members of Reluctant Squad. Huang F may actually have to turn the other way around in order to get by safely. Pixel Stars are going to have to move in from this southern side. Spots in front of them to play, but they won't be pretty. Put themselves in that low ground. They do have a ridge to work with, I suppose, but getting there could be an issue. I don't think they have any cars to work with. I didn't hear them bring or see them bring any over. Um, didn't see any when they were fighting with Armory either, so they're going to have to make this run on foot. They've got smokes. 
Two on Pangscrew at the moment, and definitely more on his uh, on his teammates. If they can get a knock onto Forrest as well, then that'll probably give them incentive to finally make that move to uh, deeper inside the zone. But until that happens, they are probably going to be hesitating a little bit. Doesn't really change what they have to do. That spray isn't super clean, but at least that headshot lands, so it gives opportunity for that nade to follow it up. That nade goes a little bit too uh, a little bit too short. Uh, it doesn't actually reach that car, so UNK remains alive. Shinosuke just trying to do his best for dopeness right now. Get as many points as possible. He's already found placement points, so good work from him so far. But UNK is alone, so if he can win this 1v1, he puts himself in good standing to potentially get a little bit more. It's just two up for Valley Tai. A headshot through the top of the smoke for UNK and a nade to follow it up. Trading similar fighting techniques between these two right now. That nade isn't any better than Shinosuke's before, but a second one has been thrown out. No more damage. These nades aren't reaching for either of these players. Finally, the bullets do. UNK takes out DNE and Shinosuke pressured by the blue, pressured by his need to move deeper into the zone. Pixel Stars have made this push on foot and they're currently winning the fight against Reluctant Squad. Yeah, be Oh, do get that pick a little bit blind up though. RS having two members down, Pixel Stars having a huge advantage here if they do basically send every other member to base all pushing all the way up. But they will basically keep a safe distance for now. That res will go through, should be able to actually get that uh, pretty much up in the meantime. Well, we have long high to be able to get land a hit shot and will eventually bring one member down from the side of Valatai Esports. Without UNQ, I guess like this might just make things a little bit harder for the side of Valatai Esports. But now Circle does actually shift away from the side of Forest. They will have to rotate in, so it may actually be spot out by the rest of Reluctant Squad while they make their way in. But it's pretty much a locked out situation for now between Pixel Star side as well as RS. With all these crates available for Huang F as well as Long High to restart, but Matt Pig keeping a close eye. Let's see if this is going to be a catch here. While Horus does get a little bit more of a wiggle room while these two teams are still busy trying to get a little bit of an angle against one another. This is potentially that win that we've been talking about for the bottom five teams. Pixel Stars in prime opportunity to take it right now. They've got tough competition though, in the form of Reluctant Squad and Forest Gaming, who have both shown incredible prowess across this tournament. And there's even more of it. Scappy takes down Mad Pig to open up that fight. In fact, Mad Pig's a little bit too uh, off by himself right now. Forest are probably gonna claim that kill, get that flush throw a nade over the ridge and maybe you can secure it. But if they go too wide, they're going to run into the off angle from Pangska. It could be the thing that secures a fight potentially for Pixel Stars, but I think that's information known now. Pangska is a known quantity in this fight. Reluctant Squad also getting engaged with Forrest. They've had to leave this warehouse. They've left one behind to deal with the off angles from wow. Hoang, but it's not really working, is it? Hoang through the smoke gets one on the Orm. A shot from him. Mastered put down to low HP as well. Excellent opportunity for Reluctant Squad to, came a real, to claim a really dominant win here. They're already up to 10 kills. Yeah, like, I didn't really notice this 10 already is 6, 7, 8, 9. It really did a splendid job in the mid-game to be able to secure and back the most points from the side of RS for now. But every single member is definitely running on high gear throughout the course of this matchup in Miramar. Scappy now still having... Crosshair is pointing at him. Lucky enough, managed to skirt by safely. Oris in a dicey spot though. Though they are yeah. basically taking over a little bit more of a central area of play. But honestly, couldn't really take any form of a good peak angle against either Pixel Stars or even Reluctant at the uh -huh. time being. So they will basically see it, whether or not these two teams eventually go up against each other and then maybe that will basically open up a little bit more space for Forest Natural Gaming. And now Pixel Star oh. sees KM99. It's been multiple times that KM's been knocked down, but it's not out just yet. Scappy, next one to fall. What a work rate coming in from the side of Mad Pig and might be even able to wipe out the entirety of Forest Gaming. Just coming in from the warehouse, Mad Pig is still very cautious about the approach coming in from the rest of Reluctant Squad. I was wrong. I thought Pangska uh, was known. I thought they knew about his position. I thought he took shots at Forrester uh, beforehand, but he didn't. 
Uh, either that or they completely uh, couldn't figure out where he was because he just opened up that fight entirely for Pixel Stars. He loses his life for it, but look at them now in a much better standing uh, to win this game. It'll just be a clear 3v3 after Master has been dealt with and Master will be dealt with. Will be dealt with by either the blue or this orm of long high that has five bullets remaining. Maybe not shots you really want to take right now. Let him die to the blue, and we end up in this 3v3. Reluctant squad on the high ground, pixel stars on the low ground. There's an orm in play though that could make one hell of a difference. There's not a, a Groza as well. Full three gear two for six, seven, eight, nine, who has been on an absolute tear this game. He's had an opportunity now with that fresh three gear and Groza to continue his tear. The portable shields go up, creating cover on the side of this hill here, making it a lot easier for Reluctant Squad to get these peaks off, and Pixel Stars remain pretty much dead silent. There's one up in the middle here for Pixel Stars. That's Mal Rush. He's playing a very pivotal role. He has to activate uh, when the others activate. The others have to take a presence, essentially, away from Mal Rush. Mal Rush has to get at minimum one here. Yeah, look, well, he's still staying really slow, and though there are a couple of Bethlehem's being popped, thankfully those are basically smokes. He's not even moving a muscle just yet, but hopefully that's just about enough info for them to work around with. But they're closing in. Reluctant squad, they're just full sending it. They're on the hunt for Mount Rush. Well, that uh, actually opens up a little bit more space for Ateko to be able to get a little bit more of a repositioning. Going up against the grows up, and he oh. still wins it. Now rush. Now equals the trade. Two versus two. Is he gonna find it? Huang couldn't really spot him out. He's got the flashbangs ready. A couple of shots coming from the back, and it's gonna be a reluctant squad that seals the deal with a 14k to close off our second match in Miramar. Yeah, that's a good win from Reluctant Squad. 14 kills, that's got to be on the higher end of, uh, of frags that we've seen uh, from wins in, in, in the playoffs so far. So well, very well done, I might say, from Reluctant Squad. They controlled the terrain that they had to work with so damn well. It was incredible to see uh, them not losing that many members when they had all this stuff happening around them. They had all the fights happening on the, on the top side of the hill. They had teams coming at them from the low side of the hill. We, we saw them uh, in action earlier on when 6789 was stuck in that shack and they remained on top. They remained fought up the entire time uh, until we go into that late game. But at that point, it's just a 3v3 and 6789 and the rest of Pixel Stars, uh, sorry, not Pixel Stars, Reluctant Squad uh, seem to be incredibly on point. Um, so a fantastic win from them. Uh, and I'm glad we got to see action from them that game. It wasn't a win where they just get 14 kills, but we only see four of them. No, we got to see a very good amount of action from, Pix uh, from Reluctant Squad that game. Yeah, and we start off with them, oh, of course, complimenting them uh, playing outside of Trimacera with their positioning uh, being so immaculate. And then we will see them basically garnering even more when teams start to cross that valley with their 2-2 split setup. And Valentine on the other end will have to deal with this form of commotion with multiple squads basically rotating their way. And by the till end of it all, RS, they batch to also move through with without any form of hesitation because they managed to get such clean angles to work with. But GLS really had Diane popped off in this moment. One of the biggest plays that we had in this matchup so far. Yeah, uh, really incredible stuff all around this game. One of the games that lives up to uh, all of the highlights of yesterday. Well, some really incredible moments uh, and some good hero plays too. The individuals seem to be doing really well this tournament. Yeah, there's, I feel like there's a lot of moments where generally an individual um, might not actually succeed, but so far in the playoffs, we've seen individuals succeed uh, quite often. So it's been excellent to see. I mean, it's trades back and forth in the end game here. Almost thought that the DBS for Mal Rush might have been better in this scenario. It kind of gives you the mm -hmm. confidence to go for that close range pick. Uh, you LOS the, the far back cover from, um, I believe it was six, seven, eight, nine off in the distance. You, you kind of LOS him if you use that, that DBS, you're able to get up close and personal take that 1v1 and then move to that guy that's off in the distance. That wasn't the case, though. I think pulling out the Ace 32 might have been uh, the wrong call. But I, I, we also had um, X-Ray on, so maybe we had a lot more information on the exact position of the player than, than Mal Rush did. But either way, an excellent win from Reluctant Squad. Unfortunately, uh, I guess the other storyline that we can focus on from that game is the fact that that was Pixel Stars with an opportunity to find themselves away from the bottom five on the leaderboard. But instead, they don't win the game and they find themselves kind of in a very similar position, unfortunately. For yeah. They had a really good opportunity but just couldn't capitalize.
And I really do think that this is a really a big round for them when we take a look at uh, them also securing so many uh, frags across the span of the matchup, where I think that they've definitely improved in a certain way of how they've been able to really establish certain holes of area. And by, by the time that they hit the late game, they kept themselves uh, pretty much safe from harm's way for most part. Though there was, of course, some pressure applied from time to time, they've been able to really hold out. Even against the side of force that we saw, that some heroics coming in from Matt that definitely gave them that golden opportunity to start fighting for that chicken dinner. Though, of course, a little bit of 50-50 when it comes down to a two versus two by the tail end of it all. So I'm definitely glad to see that, you know, the teams that were struggling back in day one, today really uh, give themselves those perfect uh, opportunity to, and they match to at least seize as much as they can. Yeah, it, it's it's good to see that at least they were in that spot um, to, to, to potentially capitalize on that opportunity, but it's devastating that they didn't um, because that would have been able to support the narrative that these teams that are in that bottom five can actually fight their way out of it. But right now it's seeming like a, an impossible task. It seems like everyone else in the lobby um, is just far and away a lot better uh, than those teams, which is incredibly unfortunate because it doesn't necessarily mean that we have an 11 team tournament. Uh, but when you look at the leaderboard, it certainly uh, pans out that way. It's 24 points total for Reluctant Squad. Valet Tai coming up second with 15 and it's close by for Forest in third. Pixel Stars with 11, so it's not terrible, but you want you know, nine more, maybe a little bit more, get up to that <laughs> 20 point mark. And so the gap uh, isn't too big. I guess the, the good thing for the bottom five teams is that Panic that game only had uh, one kill. And remember, they're the uh, team that the bottom five are currently chasing. So uh, yeah, an excellent game from Reluction Squad. And uh, it's good to see that not only Valley Tire, but also Forest and Pixel Stars were able to claim above 10 points as well. Yeah, of course, for Panic, they were pinned by the ISG, and we also did see that they had to deal with Forrest uh, just sharing the estate next door to them. So I, I did feel like there were chances that can be created for the side of Panic Esports in those instances, but may not have actually uh, handled the situation or all too well enough. But when we did take a look at the total standings right now, Forrest Gaming reclaims that number one spot as RxE now pushed back down to third uh, placement with 69 points alongside with Reluctant Squad with this chicken dinner actually uh, got them skyrocketing all the way up to the fourth place. So definitely a huge uh, points garnered from all of all these fights that they've been able to take in this round itself. Well, yeah, great job for some of all the other guys though on the second page of Pixel Stars are slowly making that climb as you did mention early on as we prepare ourselves for our next match coming up next it's going to be Tango. Getting scary for the bottom eight teams now a bit of a gap being uh, forged between eighth and ninth it's an eight point gap at the moment but that can very quickly become a lot bigger it's 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 unfortunate it, well, it's going to be unfortunate for us um, if the playoffs end up being a, t a story of the top eight having closed it out by the end of night two, but uh, hopefully that's not the case because the teams that are currently sitting on the right side of the leaderboard, like your panics um, uh, and the teams that are above them, kind of in that, that points range close to top eight, they can certainly make it happen. Uh, they can certainly uh, bridge that eight point gap. It's just unfortunate that they haven't been able to do it. We've seen decent consistency from Panic, right? So they're mm -hmm. one of the teams that could potentially do it, but uh, the, the consistency isn't as good as the, say, the consistency of Forest, the, the consistency of Armoured Gaming, because those are the teams that have been getting kills, while Panic seems to just be getting placement points. They end up with like the seven, seventh most points each game. It's like, you know, five or six, something like that. It's just not good enough for them. And again, I'm going to wait for the Twilight update so mm -hmm. I can. Um, firmly secure uh, which teams could actually make it. I think GLS is another one of the, the, the teams that are in that uh, the top of that, that right side of the leaderboard that could make it. We saw some excellent stuff from them on day one, so there's no reason why they can't bridge that eight point gap, um, which might even be less for them uh, after that game. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a matter of um, having that one good game that puts you in contention to fight for top eight and then following it up with consistency after that. Yeah, I was also trying to actually spot out whether if it's going to be a really uh, tight battle in the top eight because we last see uh, PMA to be in that uh, position though. Reluctant yeah. Squad with this win might have actually pushed 
TMA a little bit further back. So that definitely is going to be a little bit more of a worrying sign. And even teams like Armory Gaming isn't going to be at a safe spot for now, even when they are around, you know, top six, top seven. I, I felt like this form of inconsistency of how they've been playing has really uh, put themselves into such a tough spot because AG, we saw the type of approach to two versus four, they still went for it, although there, there are options for them to maybe hold out a little bit more. They basically want to see whether they can basically just pick up a couple more kill points, but I, I just feel like maybe if they do tone it down a little bit more, AG might actually the a better run into the tournament yeah maybe i've been scrutinizing them a little bit too much so i'll give them a little bit of uh breathing space for now but gls definitely in a really great position to eventually emerge as a top eight contender yeah i think honestly your scrutiny of armory in this situation specifically because uh i mean they, they've had excellent performances mm -hmm. in um in the tie series uh, as of late they came third in the um lead up to to this tournament and then obviously they won super cup before that so armory gaming should absolutely be in that top eight that top five really mm -hmm. um and, and be quite secure um but they haven't really been able to find consistency again it comes down to the fact that probably uh, yesterday they were losing members left right and center um today i don't think it's necessarily been the same story other problems might have cropped up for armory gaming which is incredibly unfortunate because armory gaming at their peak absolutely insane yeah. i feel like armory gaming probably one of the rosters that can run away with first place in this specific mm -hmm. lobby it's a playoffs lobby weaker on paper uh than the um the grand finals lobby uh but they haven't been able to do that yet they haven't been able to run away with it and yeah they find themselves close to uh falling out of the of the top eight which is not where i would expect them to be contra mm -hmm. not at all where i'd expect them to be but we move to tago which should favor armory uh quite a bit more and honestly might even favor gls the team you were talking about just then uh too very team fight heavy on tago so i can't wait to get into it yeah um that's what i do want to see a whole lot more of yesterday we did see a majority of the battle to be around the outskirts of Hosan or so maybe we get a little bit of a, a different type of setting heading into day two's action of Tego. so kind of wish that there's going to be more rounds to be played out in day three because i absolutely starting to like the type of pace that we're getting in this specific matchup but sadly to say it's only going to be this one map only for each respective day so I had a look at the twire because it is updated. Mm -hmm. uh, Armory Gaming do sit in eighth, along with From the Future in uh, their 57 points respectively to, to both those teams. And then of course PMA, uh, they're in ninth with with 49. That's the eight point gap that we were, were talking about. Uh, I wish I, I have to wait for the twire to update because we, uh, we look at the leaderboard and we go through it. And then as soon as it's gone, I tend to forget <laughs> it unless there's something very pivotal that's happened. So wait for the twire to update and then I can uh, confirm my information. But yeah, to see Armory almost dropping out of the top eight is a very worrying signs for them. Similar with uh, FTF as well. They're usually a team you'd peg to just farm kills in the lobby and, and secure top five um, just off the back of, of high kill games. But haven't really been able to do it uh, this time around either. But this plane path is incredibly fair. No matter where you loot on Tego, you should be able to get somewhere. And there should be absolutely no complaining. Panic and FRKS getting out very close to each other. Whether that is going to end up being a hot drop is yet to be decided, but I don't think there's going to be any other hot drop action. Pixel size, ISG moving away from each other. Those are the only other teams that I think are quite close. Actually, maybe mm. RXC, there's a team under that massive clown logo. I don't think so though. I think that's just all four members of uh, RXC dropping towards Palace. Oh, Panic as well as FRKS is going to have a brawl to kick things off right here. Fox X-Ray Kingslayer. Yes, I've said it. Long name. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> they, they managed to pick up a vector to begin with. It's not too shabby after all, but I would still say within these sort of spread in this township itself, it's still going to be pretty difficult for them to actually go in for the push as there is an, a lot of open spacing near the courts as well as the open streets. So it is not going to be all too straightforward with the battles that will take place between these two teams. But... We'll give them some time to stock up first. But I want to see what the outcome of the result is because FRKS today, they started off on the first match of Bermar to be scoring pretty well as compared to day one. Maybe if they do get another good brawl going their way and maybe finally winning that first hot drop fight, then that will give them that pure confidence to continue to do so. 
Look, I don't want to draw lines uh, or, yeah, draw teams out of competition immediately mm -hmm. or um, uh, too quickly. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but uh, I don't think FIKS is really in this tournament, to be honest with you. They seem to be fully dedicated to taking early fights, um, whether they win them or not doesn't really seem to bother them. And then when it comes to fights that they take mid uh, or late game, I don't even know whether, whether we've seen them in the late game, but fights that they've taken mid game, we saw one, I believe they were taking a fight with GLS last game and they got absolutely torn apart by Diane in a 1v3. Yeah. And so no matter what for FRKS, it doesn't seem to be their tournament. It doesn't seem like they are fully in it, but they're certainly here to play. It's not like they're not showing up. They are certainly here to uh, give us a show, drop early, give us that early bit of action. Sometimes the early circles of PUBG can be quite um, quite boring, quite sleeper, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just how it is sometimes. Everyone's got to loot up, got to go through the motions, and, um, it, you know, it can just be like that sometimes. And so we've got FRKS mm -hmm. in this lobby to make sure that uh, we are occupied with some action in the initial stages of this match. Basically every match. FIKS though, it continues to be d d dire for them. One of them's already gone down. Suspect's gotten out of the building. What? Will he be able to switch back quickly? Do the 180 to get this knock. He won't be able to do it. Bowfish through the window somehow gets him. Didn't even look like his gun was up. Can't get the second one though. Dusky's got that quick trade. So FIKS again look to be the losers of this early hot drop. Two down. Might be more to go. Uh, I would still commend the effort uh, coming in from the side of Bo. Dusky still keeping eyes on to Lucky J. And he's already tagged up so low. Should be able to actually go in with a clean push, especially having a shotgun in hand. Maybe he's going to be able to secure the other end. Turtle key already out of the matchup. And slowly just worsening the condition of what uh, the state is for the side of FRKS. Nowhere to go, nowhere to hide, as they're just going to be pinning them off of this entire area. So we'll oh, definitely okay. move into the bridge where we see Bantai Esports absolutely negating the rest of IG from cutting across. Gets even more. Megaloth will try to actually take out T9 and will do so. Valentai does have the absolute zone control and will be able to fully secure all these points. Closing in on him is going to be Kiss and they would need to <laughs> close in because Latte has got that one in the back. So that's a straight up four pointer to kick off our take run. Now leading the pack alongside with PNC. Two very clean flights from different side of the map. Damn, yeah. ISG, FRKS both gone. Panic trying to I mean, it's easier for Panic now to bridge that gap between them and 8th. If you're having FRKS drop in your loot spot um, and just kind of not perform to a certain standard and, and, and Panic are there to clean them up, then they'll certainly take that. In fact, I, I think it's smart for Panic to not back off that fight if they know it's one of the uh, the weaker teams in the lobby. I think Panic kind of need to um, to pick themselves up and and... And start, you know, putting kills on the board, essentially. Uh, as I said before, they're able to get that consistency um, through, through placement points, but kills are where they seem to be uh, lacking quite a bit. And so that's going to help them quite a bit in their crusade to the top eight. And of course, ISG tried to come across the bridge, but Valet Tai had them locked in. Don't often see bridge camps on Tago that much. It's not like a wrangle where you can hide behind cover um, and, and, you know, persuade the team to come across by not showing any presence. Uh, on Tego, you don't have a lot less cover to work with, uh, and it'll be a lot easier for the team that's scouting across to the other side of the bridge to actually see you if you are there. But Valley Time make it work. ISG completely caught off guard. And so that's an excellent start to the game for both them and Panic. Yeah, and when I do look at the map stream as well, there is still going to be, of course, RxE that will also trill into... Yonchan, so Valley Time might actually be able to catch more the longer they do stay around that bridge. So Reluctant Squad, they're currently in a really good spot of their own, as they would have pretty much the north of Hosan to hold out. And if the circle does close in onto them, they would still be able to basically slowly work it out against the teams like Whitefish as well as Unicorn Cyber Dead, so, so within touching distance. But for the meantime, Valentine Esports, they've gotten what they wanted and they will continue the same 
I do believe that Veleta Esports did go back and, and study how exactly certain teams have been dropping in the very first day for them to actually come up with such an ideation of this bridge cam. So it definitely have given them some really good advantages here in the early game, but I'm not too sure about the late game because they're going to be taking a slower approach moving into the circle. Whereas RxD is starting to move into the mainland with the rest of the squad already being in the direct center. It's going to be PMA as well as Forest. That's going to be uh, it center at the meantime. Yeah, I mean, you make a good point. It's hard to sometimes identify whether a team has you know, gone back, studied the VOD, and then made a play based off uh, the information they gained during that uh, during that session of, of studying the VOD. But uh, one of the most blatant strategies you can make um, is either a hot drop or a bridge camp, right? One of those two generally will give you an indication as to whether or not a team has uh, directly studied and tried to counter um, someone's rotation. So maybe that's the case for, for Valley Tai. Either way, it's a perfect capitalization on ISG's rotation. GLS barely sc uh, scraping past Shinosuke and the rest of DNA, if they rotated a little bit more to the north, maybe Shinosuke can get a freebie out of the car, but not to beat. So they'll continue to rotate into the circle for free. Amateur Dutton maybe trying to uh, cut them off. He's all the way uh, uh, more north than the rest of his teammates. Probably the information is going to be passed on to him essentially to keep track of GLS and figure out where they go. So Shinosuke can now go off and uh, do a different task for the team. And now we move to Whitefish. Panic very close by. Have they done their due diligence? Have they scouted this compound? Yes, they absolutely have. They've spotted Fevin as well. In fact, I think they're only going to see one of them. The rest of Whitefish are off on the hill behind that compound. So this might give Panic the confidence to uh, make this push. Yeah, and now they also did spot out that Fevin is already claiming the top end of the real estate. There are a couple of shots being fired uh, towards his side as well. But it won't basically deter the push coming from the side of PV. When we take a look at the update, uh, centering into the direct middle once again, it's Pixel Stars that will be taking the long way route as we managed to spot them starting off over from the islands, cutting into Hapo to get by safely. So, should be having enough space to move around, but oh, Ooh, a hard that's shit. rough. Oh, that is so rough. We're going to expect a lot of battles happening from all the way on the Western Plains as well as the south. This is going Mass to be migration. a huge migration, like you said. And there might just be some massacre going through in the, between those rotations. Oh, absolutely. There'll be a massacre starting it off with GLS. He's fighting out of the car, but James gets him. The headshot's clean. He's got an opportunity, but he runs out of ammo. Kisama gets the trade. Shanks in the backside here in the second floor of this building, now looking to help out his teammates. Hopefully, James doesn't get flushed here. Riz is on the side to make sure that doesn't happen. Throwing nades to damage GLS, but hopefully not flush his own teammate in the process. GLS throwing their own defensive utility as well. Huang Nam might have a 1v2 to contest with, but no. Going to get the information now. 1v2 is probably going to be taking flash over the wall, but we go away from it. I really want to see that 1v2 because it's absolutely... Oh. The pivotal and Huang Nam gets both. Shanks and Dimasty down. Unicorn Cyber rotating in the meantime. Do they stop? Do they third party this? Do they steal a couple kills? Disaster for Armory Gaming, but it's better than GLS. It's better than whatever GLS can pull together because it's just Huang Nam up for them. And he survived with 1 HP. Armory Gaming absolutely devastated. There is James to be salvaged right there. But same could be said about this situation here for the member of GLS. Game instead, want to take good care of himself oh, for now. I'll get into a little bit more cover as they do here. A couple of these uh, shots coming in from the top of the hill. Blue zone grenade popped out. Not being able to actually catch any form of damage at all. So Pow will be pretty much the vultures. Uh, coming in for the con cyber to yeah. try to pick them up because these two sides are absolutely damaged and Sapao actually does secure it against Kwesama living only Huang Nam from the side of GLS so AG is just gonna be stuck in here for some time yeah pretty much Unicorn Cyber basically the landlords of this compound right now they demand rent in the form of kills hmm Playing Nam and, and Armory Gaming aren't going to give it up that easily, though. 
Meng Nam again has another 1v2 to take, this time in a much more different context. It's not so much pressure on him. The timing is so different this time round, but that is a lot of damage done by Jame. The double barrel to follow it up potentially. Meng Nam doesn't even have time to heal up the stairs. Crosshair placement's got to be on point. He can't even get the first aid off. He's in the bathroom and he goes down. James claims it. Armory Gaming up to three kills, but they lose two again. The story of them from yesterday continues into game three today. The damage these guys can do is immense, but they never seem to have four up to be able to do it. Late game still on the cards for Armory Gaming, and at least they break themselves off a little bit more from uh, falling out of that top eight. Yeah, and they also made the best decision to basically sum up the fight between them as well as GS, because uh, if they do eventually get sold out by the rest of UNC, I mean, at least get that one point in the back. Well, UNC, they're basically taking different positions, giving uh, a little bit more priority towards the western uh, corner of the map. Meanwhile, inside of Buksansa, Buksansa, I, I hope I didn't botch the name, I mean. <laughs> That's uh, how I would pronounce it. Okay, so about three teams are going to be according into that way, with Dopeness now going to claim the south side of the circle. Quick maneuvers, but we'll see whether or not if they trades is going to be able to go up against Unicorn Cyber, who's already planted on top of the hill, but they also do have forest to deal with as well. Well, panic now. Getting into the, the uh, crossfire of Valtai Esports, but Valtai with that form of 2 2 split. We also have uh, a few members paying attention towards Whitefish rotation so far. All the teams are doing a good job on their movements across the map. Not being caught out just yet. Fortimore still alive, but for UNC, they got trouble lying ahead of them. Belmoff slowly applying that that pressure from the other corner of the hill, and they also have garnered a little bit more intel onto Whitefish dropping by closely. I feel like this is such an interesting circle to be seen played out, especially because if you look on the map, if you have access to the map stream, then uh, it's basically all the action on the west. Barely any team is going for a hard kind of soft side north or south wrap which makes the, the eastern side of the circle right now completely open, including a lot of spots in the center as well. There's a, there's a couple of compounds that are uh, incredibly nice spots in the center of this zone that aren't currently occupied. Everyone's fighting on the west, getting into it, fighting in and amongst these hills, and uh, uh, they, they, they either don't see an opportunity to wrap north or south and, and get a better spot in zone, or they're just there to, to, to take a fight, and, and that's their game plan. So, uh, And I think it makes sense. We've seen that be the strategy for, for these teams a lot throughout the playoffs so far. So just interesting to see, though. You look at that map and yeah. you go, guys, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of compounds <laughs> that you could prob probably take, but not to beat. And so... Uh, we get to, I mean, we're rewarded for it, certainly. Spectators, the, the casters, we get a lot of action now on the Western side. The late game might be a little bit boring, might be a couple uh, uh, dominant teams that come out on top of all of this, but at least we get some action for now. Day Trade looking to secure themselves Forest Gaming, but Forest Gaming have been an absolute monsters this entire playoffs, Unicorn Cyber. Again, vultures like they were exactly before coming over here to third party. They're going to open it up though. This is a three-way fight. This isn't Unicorn Cyber being a cheeky third party team. This is them being loud and proud, sounding off and saying, we are here to claim these kill points. Forest remain in a little bit of control though. They remain surviving. Yeah, they are about to do the same as well, though they look to be a little bit more reserved, maybe because of some of these angles, not really giving them all too much of a line of sight, having to work through some trees as well as some of all these other uh, creases that other teams might be uh, hiding away from. So, FTF finally appears onto the feet by taking down Puchu's. Be happy that we'll be uh, claiming that one off the bat. Well, Whitefish, go for playing it safely. Uh, and they are being parked directly in the middle of all these teams. Not exactly the safest spot to be, but it doesn't seem like they have much option to take right now. Whitefish, wonder how long can they actually hold out because right across them of course members of the side of day trade now of course weak inside with only flash available rxe over on the southern uh, part of the map as well as valatai esports still on that split leaving unq alone he's not going to be able to catch anybody out there pierce everybody's busy on the west like you said starting to move in now though 
Looking at the minimap, there's a lot of teams trying to come in. Unicorn Cyber, one of them flashed the solo for oh. day trade. He tries to move his way into the field, gets immediately uh, destroyed by Dizel from RxC. RxC now trying to split in the field too. I mean, you're going to see this in his own like this. A lot of teams are just going to anchor themselves in the field, use cars as cover, use rocks as cover. There's, you know, decently high ridges that can be utilized um, as a second line of sight from all the other teams off in the distance. So, excuse me, that field is, is, is pretty decent to play right now. And Whitefish RxC basically saying, we don't want to have anything to do with all the action that's happening up on the hill. We don't really want to get involved in that. We don't really see that as valuable at the moment. We're going to have to leave that hill anyway. So we would much rather put ourselves in the field, put ourselves in the center of the zone, uh, keep up the resources, keep up the um, uh, the ammo, keep up everything, right? Keep up the numbers mm -hmm. as well, the, the player count too. Uh, and then we can take the fight later on because you can guess in a zone like this that a lot of the field is going to be in no matter what. Yeah. And UNC has finally decided to push inbound into the compounds. And that will basically give a tough challenge for a side of Armory Gaming that has been spending at least a good five minutes in there while we focus on to Olympus as this battle will commence between Pixel Stars as well as Boris. Full of huge nades will be able to clip onto Olympus, bringing him down. And Master basically wants to pull away. He knows that this is not going to be his fight to take with them being outnumbered by Pixel Stars pushing up ahead. A bit easy claim with the blue zone grenade uh, that was being popped up as well. So, Unicorn Cyber Esports, they managed to Ooh. eventually close in onto the side of Armory Gaming. I believe there's still one more hiding right down below. How long uh, more can be he basically survive? So, pow. Now, getting pushed oh, to my gosh. He almost pulled it off, but he doesn't have enough bullets to work with. But the damage definitely being done. UNC still comes up ahead while Malrush finds a little bit more, this time gunning out for Happy. If, if, uh, if he gets, if Riz gets that first one, he's got that exit down the stairs, he can reset, take that second 1v1. It, it's actually scary for Unicorn Cyber, but not the case. They get that kill off. Sapal put down to 2 HP, finally does get it. Pixel Stars in another opportunity to potentially have a good game. Out of zone, one knocked. One car to work with, I believe. I didn't see any more, and so they kind of have to use that and park themselves up in the field. It's not going to be much cover, but maybe that's their only option right now, and it's an option that they might have to take before FTF do. Because if FTF take that option first, they set themselves up in the field before Pixel Stars do. Pixel Stars are just going to run into the crosshairs of FTF. But off the back of that knock onto Pixel Stars, they've had to reset, uh, take a little bit more time to make sure they're all ready to go. Because, I mean, you can see on the zone, uh, both of these teams are going to be out no matter what. You can't play the terrain up here. You're just going to be torn apart by everyone who's currently in the fields. Pangs has gone down, though. I think it might be time to ditch him, just hop in that car, send it to the field, and hope for the best. Yeah, this just got to book it for now. From the future, though, they are just trying to stay alive by just priming as many smoke grenades as possible to cover all the angles from all the opposing squads. Hatiko as well as oh, Malrush, they they're just going to run right at them. But will they be able to clip out majority of the side of FTF? They do have Trick no. on the watch. It's still going to be a one for one. Malrush still crawling, crawling. What was against the one versus two? Two HP left, but he does it. He's looking for T-Boy, but will be brought down. Oh my goodness, G-Boy still has it in the back. Two more alive for the side of FTF. Both just scraped by, but now G-Boy's going to be down Whoa. and out. And that shot from Dusky, well, actually Sapao of UNC will claim it overall. Ay, ay, ay. Didn't expect Pixel Stars to make the push like that. I was also kind of wrong too. It looks like Mad Pigs found some terrain to play with. It's not pretty. It also could be out of zone too. In fact, it is I'm looking at the map. He's currently out of zone, so. Not good for Pixel Stars. Lightworks got an opportunity here onto DNE. In fact, all of Panic have an op opportunity here onto DNE. Rotating through the blue. Incredibly vulnerable, and Lightworks gonna capitalize. One down out of that car. Kana gone. Flushed as well. And that gives a lot more room for Panic to work with to continue to take this fight. DNE again still on rotation. Lightwork goes down to the blue. He did his job, but he much rather would have preferred to survive. But the rest of Panic get it done. Up to seven kills now. Much better from Panic off the back of the four kill hot drop win against FRKS at the start of the game. They have continued that momentum. Lightwork will lose his life. 
And so it will just be too up for panic, but they are close to the center of zone in a pretty decent spot. Very open windows on that side of the shack, but still room to play with, room to work with, and everyone else on the southern side is going to be fighting in these fields. Panic probably won't have too much kill opportunity that they can claim out of this shack. They're probably going to be pinned down constantly by Valley Tide, by Unicorn Cyber, but eventually their time will come. They'll be able to peek their heads out of that shack and maybe get a couple steals here and there. Those crates look incredibly... Uh, uh, delicious as well, I suppose, <laughs> for, for Panic. Yeah, but they're going to have to set up smokes if they want to get even close to them. But this is that field circle that I kind of imagined would happen. This is why Whitefish uh, were there as early as they were. This is why RxE put as much emphasis as they did towards the field. It's because on Tago, unlike maybe Orangle or Miramar, they're actually playable. There's little divots and, and death lays that you can play around, and it's what we're seeing between these two teams right now. Yeah, as we do see exchanges coming from RxE as well as Whitefish. Uh, that will eventually be sorted out, but I'm focusing on to what's happening over the north side because Happy still needs to squeeze by. Should be able to maybe make a run for it, but hoping to not be spot out by some of the members of Unicorn Cyber is definitely going to be a tough ordeal. So who that? This is going to see if they're going to be able to get the right timing to move out of this compound. I think they've already had an idea that Panic Esports is going to be on that tiny little shack as they still have a, a working vehicle they can actually move to, to the streets across Ooh. and that hung managing to actually get a glimpse out of ftf doing some significant damage I'm sorry that's actually whitefish as they won't yeah, have a tough time to actually go in for revive because they are just segregated apart so Expect him to slowly bleed out if there's not going to be any retaliation. And you're from Cyber Esports, they're going to full send it. Oh, but you cannot forget about Mad Pig. You can't forget about Happy either. It's such a unique situation for Unicorn Cyber to find themselves in. They've lost one to the solo. Mad Pig taken down by RxC. Helping Unicorn Cyber right now is Thanahan, but Happy is still blue. They are going to think that there's another solo behind them. Absolutely no way. Runax has one with a grenade too. Sapow down. Who that is the last one up for Unicorn Cyber. Hasn't gone the way that they hoped it would. If they were able to keep three up going into this field, they have a fighting chance. But Happy's behind them. RxC are looking to get involved too. And Whitefish putting on a decent defense as well. Barricading their side of the field. And in the meantime, Happy has gone down. Okay, so who that secures that. Panic lose their lives too. Valley Tai far too dominant with that man advantage onto that uh, let's be real it wasn't the best shack for panic to play but it was all they had yeah it really was oh, the only play that's basically uh, uh doable at the very least for the side of panic esports and i guess like they just basically you know, take their chance whenever there is rxe though will keep their eye out onto whitefish that has been uh pretty much staying pretty still I really do love the usage coming in from the side of Whitefish in order to really take out majority of UNC, of course, with a uh, member of FTF being able to also supplement as well as uh, members of the side of Panic to be able to also chime in. But Thai Esports finally decide to post into the center, sending Megalos to be able to book a spot for themselves. And now looking to be pretty prim and proper for Megalos to go in for that full push, gets a glimpse of it, and will secure it against Tiare and the rest of Whitefish. Would have a lot of trouble with these uh, two squads starting to sandwich them from different sections. Well, it's all right. Team that came second in the tie series is showing it right now, as they did multiple times yesterday. They have to slow down one bit. Utility coming out for them as well. Kiss trying to get one. That might actually be a good nade onto Dahlia. Dahlia hasn't moved. It's a fantastic grenade. Knocks him down. Runax is quite close getting that res onto Fevin though. So maybe this uh, can change the tides of battle here for Whitefish. But I don't think so. I think Latte has got them locked in. The rest of uh, WF are probably all but dead here. But here comes RxE. They're trying to get involved. Finally, Whitefish fall. But in the meantime, Valet Tai have lost to RxE. They want to claim this win. Similar to yesterday, they are not letting the teams come to them. They are pushing towards the teams and closing it out themselves. Domination and aggression from RxE. It's assertiveness that you love to see from a team like this. That's another knock. And the win is all but certain for RxE. They close it out. Eight kills to their name. That is four wins for RxE. 
RxE in the span of a, I haven't done the maths, but a very short amount of games to have four kills in. RxE, what are they doing to this lobby, man? Man, you don't even have to count the numbers. With four chicken dinners in the back, they are certainly at the top of the table right now. I love their approach. They have been keeping themselves uh, pretty much safe in the early game from the south side, while Bruce taking opportunities to fire pot shots of the teams coming from the west side. And on this very final moment, they did not waste any time at all. They saw the commitment coming from Whitefish and also first the, the other opposing squad eventually just basically swarm in at the perfect timing. So clean, Chris, what more can I say? RxE, yeah. the best team we have so far in the playoffs. Yeah, I, I mean, look, they've, they've certainly uh, shown a, an affinity for wins, which is uh, insane. I, I, look, RxE to me, a couple moments where maybe uh, in, in the four wins that they've had, uh, they've shown assertiveness. I think that's probably the best word I could use to describe mm -hmm. uh, how RxE play in the late game. They just get it done. Uh, they don't wait for the game to come to them. They go to the game, right? That, that seems to be RxE's uh, way of playing late games right now. Yeah, you can say what you want about circle favor, and RxE certainly have had a decent amount of circle favor, but then mm -hmm. you look at how they play the late games, and you can't really judge. You cannot really criticize because they don't sit there and wait. They don't take what they have for granted. They go for it. They absolutely gun it for these wins. Uh, and it's been beautiful be beautiful to see every single time. Uh, what a game, though. M multiple highlights again, as the playoffs have shown multiple times over. Um, and a field ending, too, which was something I suppose we haven't really had yet, but we got one this game. Yeah, and it really was really exciting on what really happens throughout uh, the spine of this hill where we see battles between UNC, Pixel Stars, as well as FTF. And then comes the moment where FTF as well as Pixel Stars had to make that difficult decision whether to commit to the battle. And they, yes, they did lock horns. And FTF managing to scrape by safely to be able to at least secure themselves a top four sort of finish. But Valtai Esports, I thought they actually had a solid chance because we saw them having such a solid start with the bridge cam. But heading into that late game there, it really felt like they may have actually come in a little bit too late to the scene, but of course, hard for them to even find those angles so far away against the side of Repsite Esports without actually putting their bodies on the line. So they basically went for what was a little bit more accessible, the push towards the side of Whitefish, which definitely made so much more sense. They brought a couple of important points to also close out the round. So I'm absolutely satisfied with the entirety of the outcome for some of these squads out there. Sure, uh, of course, some of all these early game uh, stuff needs to be uh, implemented a little bit better, especially I'm keeping my eyes on FRKS. Like, <laughs> pop drops every single game is definitely not going to earn you, you know, consistent points. I mean, whether you win that or not, like, and in most of these instances that we see from day one, day two, I, it, they're not winning those fights. And Pixel yeah. Stars get that huge hit start. And not only that, they basically carry forward that momentum in this matchup and now potentially overtake some of the teams to try to squeeze into that top eight. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, that end game was, was I feel like the, there was the other pivotal moment for me was the, the, the two solos behind Unicorn Cyber. If Unicorn Cyber pulled up in that field and were able to take a much better fight towards Whitefish, then maybe that changes some things up going into the late game. Mali, mm. Maybe Valley Tai are less inclined to push a three man in Unicorn Cyber. Who knows? But uh, we did have two solos behind Unicorn Cyber and they absolutely ruined Unicorn Cyber's game. They are going to be quite annoyed at that, but that's sometimes <laughs> how it goes. They knew one of them was there. They knew one of them was there. They didn't know that the second one was there, I don't think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. later on at least so it's very unfortunate uh for for unicorn cyber in that moment but this is the final leaderboard for that game specifically uh points very evenly spread out not really too um top heavy no one team dominating uh the the points gained uh, that time round panic again dude i keep seeing them in like fifth points gained uh for a match they're never like down there they're never really up there they're always right there it's so weird but that's consistency for you ladies and gentlemen they're always in that fifth most points gained per game spot and you know if it's going to put them in that top eight then i cannot criticize so panic there and then obviously are actually with the most points that game closely followed up though by valley tie probably that lucky number overall but i i wouldn't complain as well if they could basically churn up about seven to maybe even 
higher to eight nine like if you keep getting these kind of points you will most likely uh, would be able to end up in the top eight as they are just inching closer there is however eight points of a gap between them as well as armory gaming armory did a really good job defending that compound in order to at least squeeze a few more points but now even day trade is not going to be safe with 61 points well of course uh needless to say rxc with those four chicken dinners they are untouchable right now i believe that it will be safe enough for them at the very least to make their way into the final so i don't think that they're gonna have any form of a uh, momentum drop at all from the way that they basically played because they have been the cleanest team so far yeah i mean four wins you can't really you can't criticize that essentially it's uh if you've got four wins you may be lucky uh, with the circle, but I think lesser teams in the situations that RxC have found themselves in would crumble. They would crumble or they would be too passive. They wouldn't necessarily be as assertive as RxC have been. Um, that's not the case for RxC though. They have earned every single win that they've got uh, and they're on top of the leaderboard uh, because of that. It's it's a bit concerning that they are close to the teams below them because if you're, um, okay, say just on paper, you have um, peak form day trade up there with four wins. I feel like they'd be a you know, probably a, a couple dozen more points ahead of second place. RxC seem to be capitalizing on these wins, but not much else. They've obviously had decent games other mm -hmm. than these wins, but to have four wins out of nine games and be it's in no first tied for second, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's it's honestly kind of concerning. Um, but if they can keep picking up these wins, if they can keep putting themselves um, in the situations to put themselves at least in that top two, top three uh, per game, then you can't criticize. RxC have done excellently so far. Um, and obviously you're not gonna knock them for, for taking the feeds when they come to them. That's right. And then, of course, we'll be uh, preparing ourselves for our next matchup. I believe it's going to be the candy that is up next. So, of course, this is where the teams will have to figure out uh, how they're going to be strategizing into this matchup. So we'll give them a couple of minutes and we'll be right back for more Take the Nurse to go. So catch you guys in a few more. Welcome to Update 28.2. Join us for our 7th anniversary celebrations, an all new SMG experience in the arcade, and finally, the recall system update. We've got lots of surprises in store for you to celebrate our 7th birthday. Erangel's school will be transformed into a festive 7th anniversary venue. Plus, keep an eye out for throwable cupcakes and surprise gift boxes scattered across the starting island of each map. We've been hard at work balancing the SMGs to offer a more unique experience and accommodate various gunplay strategies. The arcade is all set for you to try out these changes, so get that early feel and let us know what you think. And there's more exciting news. Based on your positive feedback, we're expanding the recall system to include Vikendi and Tago. Check out the patch notes to discover all the details of this update. Lastly, this patch also includes weapon mastery updates, world bug fixes, and performance tweaks. Be sure to dive into the patch notes for all the details. And we'll see you on the battlegrounds. Welcome to Update 28.2. Join us for our 7th anniversary celebrations, an all new SMG experience in the arcade, and finally, the recall system update. We've got lots of surprises in store for you to celebrate our 7th birthday. Erangel's school will be transformed into a festive 7th anniversary venue. Plus, keep an eye out for throwable cupcakes and surprise gift boxes scattered across the starting island of each map. We've been hard at work balancing the SMGs 
to offer a more unique experience and accommodate various gunplay strategies. The arcade is all set for you to try out these changes, so get that early feel and let us know what you think. And there's more exciting news. Based on your positive feedback, we're expanding the recall system to include Vikendi and Tago. Check out the patch notes to discover all the details of this update. Lastly, this patch also includes weapon mastery updates, world bug fixes, and performance tweaks. Be sure to dive into the patch notes for all the details. And we'll see you on the battlegrounds. Welcome to Update 28.2. Join us for our 7th anniversary celebrations, an all new SMG experience in the arcade, and finally, the recall system update. We've got lots of surprises in store for you to celebrate our 7th birthday. Erangel's school will be transformed into a festive 7th anniversary venue. Plus, keep an eye out for throwable cupcakes and surprise gift boxes scattered across the starting island of each map. We've been hard at work balancing the SMGs to offer a more unique experience and accommodate various gunplay strategies. The arcade is all set for you to try out these changes, so get that early feel and let us know what you think. And there's more exciting news. Based on your positive feedback, we're expanding the recall system to include Vikendi and Tago. Check out the patch notes to discover all the details of this update. Lastly, this patch also includes weapon mastery updates, world bug fixes, and performance tweaks. Be sure to dive into the patch notes for all the details. And we'll see you on the battlegrounds.
Welcome back, ladies and gents, and this is the APAC qualifiers for the PGS. And we're already at the halfway mark of day two. Of course, joining me is Extreme so far. I think that we've been having really great games going our way for the entirety of the evening. And maybe different time uh, zones from where you guys are from. But hope you guys are enjoying it so far as we'll be moving into Vikendi in this matchup. So Extreme, I think yesterday we've seen a glimpse of Vikendi and how teams have been able to basically play out. But that was kind of like the uh test waters of how things have gone so far because we've seen you know teams being really close to one another now that they've already had a little bit of an idea how do you think that uh, today is going to go for some of these teams moving into the snowy map yeah look i think uh yesterday we saw some early engagements um mm -hmm. i believe we saw one maybe two hot drops as well um i don't think uh, at least one of those hot drops wasn't really a hot drop they kind of just dropped in the same city yeah and um, kind of left. I believe it was Decamesto. Um, mm. And so that might not continue today. Uh, and any of the rotational stuff that we saw yesterday is probably going to be cleaned up as well. I don't think um, going into Vikendi, uh, you want to be uh, crashing into people on rotation and, and, and losing yourself that quickly. That said, it is one of those middle ground maps where maybe you kind of ignore it, put more emphasis on studying rotations on Wrangle, studying rotations on Miramar, rather than studying rotations on Vikendi, just because you play it once, right? Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just how it is sometimes. Um, so that might be the case as well. So we could honestly um, see the same stuff that we saw yesterday on Vikendi. We could Probably. see the same shenanigans. Uh, we could see the same chaos, just because people don't really uh, want to put as much emphasis on Vikendi as they would a Wrangle Miramar, because you don't play Vikendi as much. Yeah. And if you've only got that much time between days um, to, to study VODs, then you, you could leave Vikendi out. Yeah, and of course, uh, there's definitely a lot of narratives that have been shaped up throughout the course of the run for today, especially with Day Trade as well as Armory Gaming right now at the borderline, trying to basically hang on to the top eight position now, being challenged by teams like Panic Esports and PMA didn't exactly have a great start to day two as well. So they are currently sliding down towards the 10th position. So. I guess that they might actually feel that form of pressure to really step up their gameplay, but it seems to me that it's also been this the rise and resurgence of teams that may not have gotten their good games off from yesterday to be really going in for that full push. Panic definitely on the rise. We got GLS also slowly making their climb up there. So I think that this uh, game for Vikendi definitely is are going to be a huge pivotal point for them before we approach our final day of the playoffs. Yeah, it's got to be. Uh, we're, we're getting closer to the, the point in the tournament where um, you could be cut off. I think for a few teams, it's it's already at that point, to be honest with you, but um, not for the teams like GLS, Panic, uh, and I believe PMA were pushed out of the, the top eight as well. So not for those kind of teams. Um, those guys are going to still be with a fighting chance, but for a lot of them, I think it's game over. Um, at least that's what I'm seeing in their play. You know, that's what, that's what I'm seeing them put on the server. They don't, they're not passing the eye test, uh, you know, whatsoever. Um, so I'm happy to put a line through through a couple teams already. But there's still a, a very good fighting chance for everyone um, kind of in that top 11 uh, to, to fight for, for top eight. So as much as there is that, that eight point gap remains, we'll see it in a bit, but that eight point gap uh, between the top eight and the bottom eight does remain, um, which is unfortunate. But again, that's a gap that can be made up so easily. Um, and as you said, day trade Armory Gaming uh, on the cusp of potentially being pushed out of that top eight if a couple of those teams below them um, have decent games. So it's something yeah. we have to look for. And on Vikendi, well, it's again, one of those maps where obviously people will play to a certain standard, but it is one of those maps where things can go wrong um, when you just don't expect them to. Yeah, of course, there is a lot of unexpected uh, things that may actually happen in this matchup. But when we take a look into the comparison of the performance of regions, of course, PBS side, the Vietnamese squads have been doing fantastic. Of course, we've got RxE on that winning streak so far from yesterday till today. And you've got Valley Thai. So also coming in with a lot of second place finishes, especially for today. They managed to pick up that one chicken dinner uh, to actually open up the rounds. But consistently, they've been denied by RxE with that those final few pushes. So that seemed to be the trend. But at the very least, you know, they are at the top. They are not too concerned. but. For the rest of the squad, so they still have a lot of work to put into this map here in Big Candy. 
a lot of battles happened yesterday inside of the Vika Mesto that we did mention early on, so maybe it will be slightly altered on how the uh, end game will be, depending on, of course, where the circle's gonna go. So we'll have to take a look at whether or not will there be any form of a, a huge comeback coming in from teams like AG that had those from struggle and we also did see a little bit of that stagnation coming from FTF but they still kept it competitive surviving to the tail end of it all but numbers wise in terms of kills and eliminations maybe a little bit more lackluster compared to yesterday so it's definitely time to pick up the pace here in our earth map of the evening yeah, it's a bit weird as well to look at the top performers on Vikendi. In fact, it's almost useless because we've only played one match uh, of Vikendi so far. So there's mm -hmm. no point in going back to the Twire and looking, oh, okay, well, Unicorn Cyber won yesterday, so they must mm -hmm. be the top performances, top performers on Vikendi. Yeah, technically that's the case, but over one game, it's a really small sample size. And so you can't really gain much from that. Uh, we played two Tagos, you can gain a little bit more from that, but even then I feel like two is still uh, too small of a sample size. You're much better off to, to look at stats like that on uh, a Wrangle and Miramart and now that we've played um, a mm -hmm. few more of those. Or we will play a couple more Wrangles as well, obviously. But on Vikendi, a bit hard to, to gauge who's actually the, the top performer here. Um, obviously, yesterday, Unicorn Cyber was the team uh, that took that one out in, in a decently... Um, Sorry, not decently. I feel like that's selling them short. It was an excellently fought battle between them uh, and the rest of the server finally culminating in, in, a, in a pretty clean, I think it was 4v4, 3v4 versus them. Um, and Panic, and they're looking to start it off well going into tonight as well. The shots do miss from Destroy, but you can't blame him. Not easy shots to hit. Valley Tai, uh, in the form of Kiss, do get out of there. And Destroy will now do nothing but loot up. And looking at the map, are there any hot drops happening? Are there any uh, close encounters? Maybe Reluctant Squad and Pixel Stars down there to the southwest. Getting a little bit close. This one actually is probably the closest we're going to get to a hot drop. It looks like a direct hot drop from uh, FRKS and they're opening up as well. ISG, one of the other teams on the bottom side of the leaderboard. Is this finally one of those early game fights that FRKS can win? Well, who else could it be but them? Oh, Bo kind of botched it, though. It could have actually been a really good one, but it will be an instantaneous response coming from ISG. Though, it's only Muck as well as Aegon left. Two versus two still. Entirely doable, but it's going to be Aegon that will be shot down. Muck only has a BSS in hand, and that's not exactly the weapon with the most bullets to go up against a one versus two, but he will have to make do. What's he gonna do this time? No grenades. That's definitely something that is gonna be a little bit of reprieve for now. So Lucky J is just gonna see if he's just gonna be peeking out. But it's gonna be Lucky J soaking up the damage. But here comes the confidence in FRKS to actually maybe get one. But oh, thank goodness. <laughs> FRKS finally got in this win. But it definitely come at a cost. Yeah, it comes at the cost of, of one, which is better than what they've previously had, which was uh, a loss at the cost of four. So FRKS will be happy with that. And look who's here to uh, catch them off guard as they're resetting, debriefing from that fight, uh, looting all the bodies of, of the ISG members that they've just killed. It's Armory Gaming. Jamie's getting close. He silent breached up here as well, so they wouldn't have hurt his car. Riz probably did the same. Catching them potentially in rotation outside the comp and Riz will get that. James has announced himself though, so he's not able to get the surprise factor he would uh, desperately want. In fact, he could even get caught out here by Lucky G if Lucky G's got that good off angle. He actually does. James might be getting a bit too aggressive here. The spray comes out and it's a beautiful one at that. It lands and the bolt is just not in the position to flush that kill onto James. He's just able to get over that ridge. That could be what saves James' life here. That is so dangerous from James to get that aggressive into the compound. One of the reasons probably why Armory Gaming is on the cusp is because they keep doing plays like this uh, and, and, and they seem to be just losing two members off the bat um, in so many of these games. FRKS as well, if you lose to these guys, I mean, they're just... They're hot dropping every single game. Can't lose to them. Shanks is here to save the day, get the res onto Jame and, and reset this in Armory Gaming's favor. Yeah, they should be able to actually help James up in a moment's time, but it does allow opportunities for the rest of FRKS to hopefully send in Lucky J close enough to drop in a couple of defilates, and yes, he will. That's gonna be falling onto James, but it's not gonna be able to take him down. 
And instead, it's going to be Bucky J on the receiving end of it. Dimasty sharp enough to be able to land it on the head. And this is definitely going to hurt FRKS once more. But they take those small little victories as they will. Oh, it's a very small victory. A very, very small victory. Reluctant Squad now trying to get involved too. This is Vikendi. I said yesterday, very similar vibes to Sanok back in the day where mm -hmm. you start taking your fight and all of a sudden you've got eight teams around you trying to third party it. Just because of how the terrain works, you can very easily access the lines of sight that you need to get that third party off. Excuse me. Had some Doritos mm -hmm. in the break. Ooh, uh, Doritos. I had some Doritos. Yeah, my, my break was because uh, I haven't really had dinner. So I had Doritos, I had a shortbread, and I had a piece of bread. And that was yeah. my break. That's my dinner so far, but that's the caster's dinner when you're <laughs> when you're casting over over prime dinner time. So uh, yeah, that's that that was my 15 minute break. Yeah, I, I was searching for stuff and uh, I just remembered I didn't restock once again. Yeah, we had this conversation before for two days in a row, but uh, I'm okay. Uh, I'm not too hungry, but certain teams in this lobby is hungry for their own chicken dinner. Oh, yeah. Havoc definitely would make good use of one right now because they are prompt into a really good position if they would actually secure a win and maybe with that would be able to overtake day trade. AG though, like with them garnering that three uh, points off of FRKS, at least they are in a safer spot for the time being. So that's not going to be too much of a challenge for them to still be within that top eight in this game unless of course i will be proven wrong by some other squads to be able to send them out really soon and have a few more from the lower ranks of the table to be able to outshine the rest in this map of vikendi but overall i think that unicorn cyber esports from the looks of it i think they've been uh having some really uh good games from day one Day two, of course, things could have actually been better for a few instances, but they have always been able to make the best out of uh, some of all these instances so far. They've been able to get consecutive uh, top four finishes or, of course, some rounds inside Miramar was a lot rougher heading into today's matchup. As we take a look at uh, the current scenario for PMA, looking at PNC driving by, small town kid trying to actually pick him up of the vehicle but will not be able to do so still having a little bit more of shots coming in his way so if they do uh turn back who knows might be a chance for the side of panic to have a few scored up it's a very fair circle for everyone to play uh, touches it doesn't really touch areas that are hard to play i'd say just a central circle so no water either <gasps> Very easy for these teams to navigate. That said, it is still Vikendi. Rotating on Vikendi can be quite the task sometimes. And as I said yesterday, oftentimes the terrain means that you take up, you know, take this rotation path. You say you go all the way north, and then all of a sudden you have to turn left to, to go to your destination. And then as soon as you turn left, you run into a team that you never really knew existed before because um, it can be quite hard to, to scout um, certain pieces of terrain on this map. But... Uh, we haven't really lost any uh, anything disastrous in rotation. Uh, in fact, we haven't lost anyone in rotation. The the, the first eight kills were were both FRKS and ISG. Uh, sitting in 15th and 16th, Unicorn Cyber quite close to Valley Tai at the moment. Valley Tai has been very good uh, for most of this tournament. Unlike RXE's uh, 87 points, I feel like Valley Tai's 87 points has been more earned through consistently good games um, rather than a. Uh, you know, a heap of wins. DNE has absolutely ruined it for that player. FTF and Happy RXC. Oh, yo, yo, it's going to pop off everywhere. Wow. We're about to lose track of all the action, and we've got to try and catch it all as it all goes down. FAP is quite close mm -hmm. to FTF. They're all regrouping, though. So if FAP stays close, it could be difficult for him to take this fight uh, if they've all got, or if FTF are so close to each other, it's going to be hard to trade it out. But just as quickly as FTF regroup, uh, RXC decides to get the far angles so they can cover FAP, who remains up close. Yeah, just a little calm before the storm right now. Unicorn Cyber from the other angle have got some clean view of Lute, but the trades are not really coming into full fruition with a recall coming out of the, some of all these uh, mini 14 shots. Not going to be able to at least get the upper hand in this 
form of a long trading. Now with that form of intel, definitely we'll have the rest of the LTH to pay a little bit more attention. We will operating actually managed to creep up, but thankfully it was Cam99 to be able to help with a little bit more of support. So that should be pretty much a opening for the side of Forest Natural Gaming to eventually flush, but Drake has got was, the more kills covered. I think he DC'd. I think that was a DC from KM99. I was looking at the map stream, I came back and he was just walking slowly down the hill. That looked like a DC, which is incredibly unfortunate for Forest. They've been so good this whole tournament. Luckily, they've created a bit of a buffer to play with where things like that can happen and it's not so devastating. They're not fighting for eighth place right now. But still KM99. Came into tonight, top fragging. Uh, I'll have a look in a second who is currently top fracking, but that's not exactly how you want a fight like that to go. I, I could be wrong, but it looked very much like a DC he was just walking down that hill yeah, uh, yeah. completely in line of sight of uh, FTF. So, yeah, very unfortunate, um, but is what it is sometimes. You just have to move on um, and play your own game. Fire Me Forest still have a chance to get some points in this game too. A couple members up. I think it's a couple members up. Yeah, a couple members up. One very mm -hmm. close to... RXC actually, so maybe Scappy can get another one. Forest currently on zero, so they need any point they can get. Scappy's going to get the knock. Can he get the flush? He's got to really commit to it, and I think this is smart. LOS himself from the RXC players. He's just heard driving away uh, off in the distance. Put himself, uh, put the trees essentially in between him and the rest of the RXC squad. Get that flush back down to the uh, city that Olympus currently sits in, and then Forest can go play the rest of the game. Yeah, and Forest uh, could basically at least buy some takes some time for the moment. Whereas all the other squads playing through the hillside here, RS now having Jin spotted out while Pixel Stars are you know, basically hugging tight in the city. It's gonna be pretty hard for RS to actually find anything at all. Meanwhile, Armored Gaming would be having a really clean angle, but Ruffin will be able to quickly reposition, so not too probably for themselves. So far, RS have been able to stabilize in all of all these matchups that has been played out for today. Well, FTF is just in the middle of the open out there with Kiss really putting a little bit more pressure for them and it doesn't seem like they will be able to move off far too much after rely on Mooks for cover for the meantime. The rest of the LTA should be able to join in to be able to perhaps suppress them even further. But inside the city, these two teams will basically uh, share some real estate. Long High still on the watch. I'll take it over on top end of the roof. And eventually when it does close out, these teams might actually collide. And on the uh, far end of the hill, I guess that uh, Armor Gaming later on might be able to gatekeep them from advancing even further. So, in this game, Ooh. Well, Dope is getting shredded off. My, my. Seems like the planet of Dopeness, who tried to actually go in for a little bit of a death trap, might have actually bit them back. But to match to also still find Trake through their sort of uh, tactics at the very least. So, not too shabby after all. Just a little bit of a exchange while Repsic Esports just locks FTF from moving anywhere at all. Yeah, they get one. Not bad. DNA will take it. Again, down in 14th. It's probably the point in the tournament where uh, rotate camps are looking more and more appealing. Bridge camps are looking more appealing and um, generally kind of cheesy plays to get you points uh, are going to be top of the mind for DNE. But that said, I haven't actually been able to fully capitalize on that rotate camp. You want to get that kill, uh, any kill you can really get off the back of that and then find yourself in a nice quiet spot to play out the rest of the game. But they found themselves in a really rough position now losing members to the team they just rotate camped. FTF aren't going to take this lightly, but maybe they have to. Maybe they do have to back off because their car's on fire. It's about to blow up courtesy of panic, courtesy of light work. He's going to back off into the compound. He said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the safety of the compound. I'll blow up that car, I'll try to get a kill, and then I'll uh, I'll come back. Omish oh, Darton absolutely fighting back, though. Simoid goes down, and so maybe DNE can finish off FTF here, but it won't be uh, it won't be for free. They've, they've lost one in the process. Yeah, DNE so far hasn't really gotten too many clean shots other than the pickup against F FTF. And 
that's gonna be a free pass for some of the members of Panic Esports, I do believe, cutting by. So far, didn't seem like there's gonna be direct challenges with the uh, current rotation set into place. Pixel Stars having themselves a really good spot though, but still needing to squeeze into the circle. Couldn't be uh, too problematic for themselves. Built lost play space to play out. While I'm looking into the mini map as well, the dark center right now being held by uh, FTF here, despite them not having enough members to work with, maybe it's going to be a chance for him to be able to pull in some position points later on. But oh, a full collateral damage going right. in. PMA just wipes out the entirety of GLS with a clean day dropping in. Yeah, they both, I think they both sent it to to this central compound, or at least one of them was close enough to it to be able to fight for it, and then the other one sent it in from uh, somewhere off in the distance, and, uh, well, PMA cleaned it up very nicely. Uh, they uh, managed to keep four up as well. The small town kid will get res, and so they get three points onto GLS. GLS's attempt to claim the center of the zone goes completely wrong. Valet tie as well. You wouldn't expect them in a spot like this to be losing members, but Unicorn Cyber is putting them on blast right now. Stuck on the edge of zone, having to make a fight into the zone, and uh, Unicorn Cyber were fully aware of it, fully caught them off guard, or maybe just took some fantastic 1v1s. Either way, Unicorn Cyber, two kills to their name, both on Valley Tai. And look at the rest of Valley Tai. Backed off into the blue, into the car that they saved up for a moment like this. They're going to have to find their way uh, into that northern edge. And, and I think they're mostly going to be fine. They can park up inside the zone, uh, look a little bit deeper. They don't necessarily have to send it right now. They've probably got a couple spots in mind. Uh, you can probably park up next to a road ridge or they've got a dip that they uh, prefer to play in a zone like this. Um, but no real need to send it to it right now. Uh, although they uh, can totally choose to do it <laughs> if they want to. Unicorn Cyber though continue to be uh, pressured on this edge. Whitefish now trying to get involved. Oh my, that actually draws a little bit of attention because I last saw UNQ actually shooting some stray shots towards uh, some members of Unicorn Cyber and now it's going to be a full push coming from Dahlia. I'd actually find cover all the way to the whoa, back. Whoa, whoa, what? Uh, the zone. He's just doing rings around the rose. He's just doing a circle around this rock and he's allow allowed to survive? What is that? I don't even know, man. Like, Whitefish somehow managed to pull that one up, but Yukon Cyber needs to deal with this oncoming attack. Tiari managing to do a little bit of damage, but not enough to take down Hudat. The entirety of the Japanese squad will find themselves having two being knocked. Well, great cover fire coming from Sapao as well as Hudat. And Whitefish unsuccessful with their attempt. The Corn Cyber stays put. But Valatai, they are going to be seeking out for this opportunity to also see where if there's any damage done towards the side of Unicorn Cyber. But that was a clean fight. So this might actually overwhelm the rest of Valatai eventually. And the circle at the very least will be gained by Valentai for the moment. Panic Esports finding one, while that nice. is going to be a freebie for PV. Yeah, little uh, nice kill there. Got three gear to work with as well. Didn't opt for whatever crate gun was around him. Surely there's a crate gun somewhere in the mix of, of all those crates, but didn't opt for it, or maybe a teammate grabbed it before he could. Either way, he's got that three gear, which is excellent in a spot like this. They are certainly going to need it. They are in the zone right now, but it is a fight that Panic will have to take Later on, you have to fight their way through whoever's in front of them uh, or maybe drive to a piece of terrain and have to immediately take a fight. Either way, they've got the gear to... to at least they're prepared for it with that three gear. So that's the, the good thing for Panic right now. Forest moving into right next to Armory Gaming. who are probably just going to mop Forest up. They've been weakened since the start of the game off the back of that DC from KM99. And now they're looking even worse for wear with Armory Gaming completely surrounding them. Flash will do very well to get the shots through the windows of the car oh onto Mad Pig there. Pixel Stars putting up a decent fight onto Daytrade, but there's only one up for them off in the distance at that rock. It's Mal Rush, and Belmoth desperately wants to finalize his kills. That bolt shot that we just missed did indeed miss. And Nuruns remains in the blue. He's got a car right next to him, so he can get the hell out of here whenever he wants. It's not going to be very free, though, for Day Trade or Pixel Stars. Whoever makes it out of here alive, they've got Reluxon Squad to contest with inside the zone. Yeah, I don't think Malrus is going to be hanging on for far too long, but at least one more first aid to be popped. And the Battle of Attrition continues on. Nuruns is struggling to actually make ends meet. And like I said, though he has a vehicle to, for him to work with, Still gonna be a little bit of a journey ahead, and who knows what's 
uh, waiting along the lines. Meanwhile, BLTH will be keeping UNC corded up. Though there is multiple angles they work with with Manhung already making sure that Kiss gets occupied. So this will basically open up a lot more spacing for Unicorn Cyber to deal with uh, this uh, current position of Valentine Esports. Me trying to make the best out of it with a lot of mooks being thrown to blind off UNQ. And it's just going to be endless supplies to be able to fully make the advancements to her foot. None of them having vehicles to work with. And let's see whether if Manhung will eventually find that opportunity to pick them up. They've got them locked in, don't they? But the more time being spent dealing with Valley Tide, the less time they have to actually finally move into the zone, which is so far away from Unicorn Cyber right now. And Reluctant Squad as well. Reluctant Squad just here to get a couple kills and then back off. They've probably got a lot more freedom than these two teams to reach the zone. Inside the smoke, UNK does go down. Unicorn Cyber on top, helped out by Belmoth. Now they can think about what they want to do, how they want to maneuver their way in. Pretty flat ground in front of Manhung. Had a little look inside, probably trying to spot somewhere that they can park up or, or run towards. Armory Gaming destroyed by Panic. I believe that's all four kills going the way of Panic. So on paper, not the fight you'd think Panic would win, but in this game, they are dominant over that team specifically. Hoang trying to move his way into the zone. So difficult for any of these teams on that southeastern side. You can see PMA, FTM in the form of Happy, Nurins, and uh, Dopeness as well, all looking at these teams, trying to make their way in. In fact, Happy uh, can't actually look that way right now because he's getting shot at by himself, but PMA certainly, uh, Dopeness as well, certainly looking towards Reluctant Squad uh, with hearts in their eyes. They are absolutely... Um, famished right now and want those wow. kills. I don't think Happy's going to be able to survive much longer. I think he wants his, a, a kill of his own, just a point or two, um, to, to satisfy FTF's consistency, but uh, in the spot he's in, I don't think he's going to be able to get much from it. Yeah, and I thought that he's been taken out much early on. He's doing a pretty good job of staying out in the open and surviving until 21 minute mark. And with him's position revealed, I don't think there's much left. That's it from the future, at least. Finish up on top eight with, you know, small little ranking points to be made out here. Manhung now actually spots out FAP, so RxE unit is going to be down to two men only here in Vikendi. Got to use whatever cover that they have for RS at the moment, and it's only a tiny shack. So for UNC having the biggest numbers here, uh, with a trade also being spotted out by Kana, going in for that check. A reluctant squad now so far setting up a good trail to go in for a direct challenge against Dopeness. But huge damage being done towards Huang. Kind of holds him a little bit back. Kind of did actually land one towards oh. John and Wallace. So it's six, eight, nine. I mean, you expect it to go this way, but that is incredibly clean from Dopeness. Bottom five team showing up right now, and they'll claim all these kills onto RS as well. Actually, never mind. Suspect gets one. Little freebie from uh, the other side of zone. Long range shots with the mini. But well done from Dopeness. In the process, they do lose Kana, but it's a sacrifice they uh, are going to have to make in a, in, a, in a game like this, but also on the leaderboard, man. Look at them. In 12th, they, they really need as much as they can get. So putting themselves in harm's way just to get three or four kills on a team rotating in on edge, it's something that you kind of have to play for right now. It's, it's a play that you really have to make. Panic, they were on edge for quite some time. One of those previous circles hard shifted straight onto their compound. So they've been allowed a lot of space and time to work with them. Because of that, they have been so free in uh, their maneuverability. They've chosen the southern side as their next spot. They put three people on that high ridge, raining down Hellfire right now onto PMA, who have just one rock to hide behind. That yeah. is it. A singular rock, incredibly nadable, incredibly exploitable, and PP's the first one out of panic to actually be able to do that, getting that wide, far right angle from his point of view. PMA having to put up a decent fight to actually stop PP from peeking, but PP's too sharp right now. They dominated Armory Gaming just before, and now they're looking to do the same thing onto PMA. Yeah, there's just barely any space for a PMA to basically trade back, and now Suspect comes in with a lot of nades to be raining upon him. Yeah, now to squeeze to the back, we'll be able to fully dodge it though, and well, to my surprise, like, for the past minute or so, the circle uh, had a lot of free space for the teams to do, basically find a little bit more of a wiggle room, but a lot of them basically commit oh, to no all way. the fights and they match, get it! Oh, small town kid. 
Somehow, PMA stays alive, still having him try to fight for the chicken dinner here, but PNC, they still have a lot of numbers for them to just fully go in for a long haul of exchange. Damn. It's such a it's a, a micro decision from PB there, but in that moment, I feel like it's so much better for him to not zoom in his his 8x SLR uh, and just jump spot around that rock. Not necessarily jump spot, but just jiggle, just crouch up and down, get that wide range of uh, information onto PMA uh, before you you decide to zoom in and take those shots, because you're going to know absolutely for certain who has the advantage at that moment in time, and it's a much more confident fight to be taking. It actually could cost him his life. It does a micro mistake from PB, and he goes down. But Panic have been very good on this southern side. Racking up 10 kills, I believe it is now. So it's been a fantastic... 11. My bad, sorry. I underestimated them. 11 kills right now for Panic. It's been a fantastic game from them. And you'd love to see it. As a person from that region, my bias is showing a little bit. But if Panic are able to show up on the southern side of the zone here, then it's scary for the rest of the teams in this lobby who, mind you, are very weakened. It's two up for PMA, two up for RXC, and then only one up for Reluctant Squad. So this is Panic's game to lose. Yeah, absolutely. It, like, they are definitely poised in position to take the claim. And this itself would basically send them to a top eight if they could basically secure all of the uh, players in the lobby. But it will definitely take a while. More and more supplies for the Sai Huang F. I don't expect him to be able to get anything much out of uh, these uh, supplies. But look at that. On the feed, Panic is making every single claim, stamping them out. And even though RXC has two, I, I don't think that they're really in a good position right now, especially with a little bit more pressure being applied by Hong F. And Bill got a lot of smokes to work with to fully inch into the center. But here comes the, the push coming from Dusky. Now Rapsing Esports kind of split into two different angles of a fight. Vince now. A flashbang to be able to at least buy some time and go for the other push against the singular unit of RS. Panic need to win this fight, but RXC aren't giving it to them. They're backing off to the safety of their rock, but it's not really safe, turns out. Hoang has got line of sight on you. Vinsu now, based off that information, is making his own maneuverability, trying to find a different, uh, a different location to hide behind, but it's too late. Panic are going to take full advantage of that uh, change of position from RXC and take them out up to 13, 14 kills now for Panic. Make it 15. This is Panic's game. 15 kills might even be the record for the lobby right now. Make it 16 if they can get this kill onto Hoang. The final member up for Reluctant Squad, but Panic have controlled this late game zone absolutely perfectly. Reluctant Squad, they finish themselves off to the blue. It is a 15 kill win from Panic and a dominant win at that. And we absolutely love the momentum that they've been able to get in B Candy here. And like you said, this is the top record being set with the highest elimination throughout the past few days of play. Panic now will find themselves with a good opportunity to sustain in the competition with this chicken dinner. I'm pretty certain that it will be them finishing above top eight. Yeah, they, they, they should find themselves in the top eight uh, off the back of that. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's an end game from Panic that uh, is controlled very well. I mean, first of all, that fight onto, onto PMA, apart from Pippi going down, that was a very well controlled fight. PMA had that rock to pull up at, and at that point, you know that um, Panic's game plan is, is, is kind of easy. The, the, decision, the decisions to make at that point uh, are quite easy. There's three people stuck behind a rock, the, the game's going to come to you, right? The decisions yeah. are going to come to you at that point. Um, so they deal with that, and then, of course, they have to, to manage the rest of the zone. And turns out the rest of the zone is quite weak. And so Panic off the back of their southern position are able to get all that information, take the correct fights, uh, and win the game off the back of that. I think it's a perfectly played end game from them, uh, again, by losing Pivi. Uh, but at that point, that didn't really matter. So Panic do very well. And of course, we look at the highlights. The start of the game was FIKS versus ISG, and maybe the first uh, hot drop that FIKS has actually won. Yeah, and I guess like when we look into how Fox Ray Kingslayer did overall in this fight, uh, they still managed to at least 
going for some extended trade against AG though. First, they were in the midst of resetting where AG did not uh, give them any form of chance to do so. And then we also did see Forest Natural Gaming having a little bit of a hiccup there, especially when you uh, first saw Chem99 having suspectedly disconnected in the midst of a potentially huge pickup against the rest of Whitefish. But with that form of position that was played out, I think like Whitefish definitely have been able to do pretty well. They trade also did suffer uh, qu quite a little bit as they were basically squeezed by multiple teams and were absolutely denied their form of entry. I'm pretty sure this win from Panic will be them pushing out either day trade or armory from that that uh, that top eight, but we'll have to see when we go to the final leaderboard. But this is that situation that was just so easy for Panic to close out. Just throw utility at PMA's rock, and uh, they're almost certain to die. Doesn't actually go that way. They actually survive for quite a while. The nades never actually reach them, and so they have to take them out with their guns. But uh, you know, they, they do it, Panic. So you can't really criticize them for it. And then of course. Giving it up to the blue is entirely expected in a moment like that. You never want to give up um, points to a team that you're currently competing with. So Panic with 15 kills, I believe, yes, it, it should be the, the record for the lobby. Um, and out of all the teams that we were looking at, PMA, GLS, and Panic to potentially fight their way through to that top eight, I had my eye on Panic because I think they can pull out wins like this um, every now and then. I don't think it's their consistent thing. Uh, they haven't done it previously, but I think when they get into a spot where they can, then they do rack up those quill kills quite significantly. Um, yeah. So, so happy for them to have pulled this off, and I can't wait to see that, that final leaderboard right now. I mean, oh, me coming in from the PCR region as well, I'm also really happy to actually witness them uh, going back into a uh, lot more confident when it comes down to going for all these uh, micro decision making that they've been able to make so cleanly inside of the candy. So hopefully there's going to be more of all these instances heading into Arangel. But of course, Arangel being the comfort map for almost everybody out there, it might still be a little bit tough, but with Armory as well as they trade now under pressure, I believe that they will definitely uh, fight back a lot harder come into these upcoming matches because it's definitely crunch time for all of the teams that are not poised for the top eight right now. Meanwhile, even for those who have been able to secure big wins like RxE, they don't want to uh, have loss of momentum so we'll definitely have to take a look on how they would basically approach the upcoming match of Arango but Big Candy definitely was a lot more interesting compared to what we've seen from yesterday's run where this one at least have a lot more involvement from the outskirts where a lot of teams were playing from all the mountainside and also trying to basically make do with close to zero terrain for some of these players out there like what we saw from FTF Happy had almost close to zero cover, but tried to, of course, stay alive as long as he can. But here is first the leaderboard is for the specific matchup with the highest point gain in the single map. It's 25 for PNC. It's a 15 point gap between them and second uh, in the in the game leaderboard. Uh, it shows you their dominance over that game. They didn't get 15 kills just in that late game. They were racking those up um, from very early on. So it is fantastic to see from Panic. And again, I cannot wait to see that uh, overall leaderboard. But for the moment, yes, it was RSA and PMA. Oh, sorry, RS and PMA with uh, 10 kills, uh, 10 points apiece. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there was another team below them. Didn't actually get to see them. RXE. First, 92 points, and Panic move up to six. That is a massive game from them, and it completely pushes Armory Gaming out of the top eight, and all of a sudden, Contra, we have a fight for seventh and eighth. The FTF, Day Trade, Armory Gaming, PMA, all within the 60-point um, gap, and they are all fighting for two spots at the moment. GLS falling a bit too far behind, 11 points between them and PMA, and then obviously, uh, if you ask me, that bottom five is is already out of the competition. But what a game from Panic, and it even gives them a little bit of a buffer, or a decent buffer. It's a nine-point buffer between sixth and seventh, and so that is a game that might even confirm Panic in the top eight for the grand finals, but of course, We've got plenty more games to be played. Eight specifically, and the last two of the day are on a wrangle. Yeah, and this is where, of course, it's panic mode for the side of Armory Gaming, where I believe that they're never really comfortable being put into such a stance at all. So there definitely will be a very, very close uh, uh, match between some of these guys from FTF as well. 
but we definitely see that they are looking very, very shaky in most of the matches that was being displayed for today. FTF haven't been able to take clean fights and in, they've been caught up for a couple of times as well. I could say the same about day trade in certain instances, but at the very least, we're looking at Armor Gaming uh, having something that's a little bit more obvious, those early trades that have them resulting in a couple of losses. So that trend is continuing and they really need to find that quick fix moving into Arangel. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not fun to see because I, I kept uh, hyping them up and I have hyped them up throughout the entire tournament because Armory Gaming, when they're on point, it seems like they are one of the most explosive teams to, to watch. And in a lobby like this, I said it earlier on, but in a lobby like this, you would expect them to be up there just farming away, completely farming away uh, in mm -hmm. a lobby that on paper has worse teams, but they're not really doing that. Only a couple teams are really doing that. In fact, what's weird about a lobby like this is the teams that are at the top of the leaderboard are just being consistent. Yeah. RXE are the ones with the most wins, yes, but when Forrest is up there um, and uh, the other teams that are up there in that top five, it's not like they're getting super explosive games, right? If they were super explosive, I feel like we would have seen uh, more than 15 kills, but that was the, that was the most we'd, uh, kills we had just then. Um, yeah. It's just been consistency from everyone so far. Their, their, their points per game have to be very, very similar. Um, they're getting whatever kills they can get in the game and they're, they're maximizing the placement points. Uh, as well, which is very weird because I feel like in an APAC lobby like this, you'd have one or two teams that are just farming away and grabbing a ton of kills and completely dominating the rest of the lobby. That's not necessarily the case. It's 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 been a bit weird. It's been exciting. Don't get me mm -hmm. wrong. Uh, it's we've had some excellent action some, and some sick highlights, but uh, I feel like the way the uh, leaderboard has panned out and the way it's panned out that way uh, is just something I, I wouldn't really expect to see. Yeah, a little bit jarring as compared to you know uh, prior seasons of what we've seen coming from APAC where those teams uh, often not basically go gun, gun blazing and just basically go for direct challenges a lot. And this time it really seemed to be that uh, it's kind of a little bit mix of both, right? Especially when we take a uh, clean example of RC, like I said, a lot more on the tactical aspect of how they basically set themselves up for success, playing for ranking points. And on, on top of that, basically clean up uh, other teams starting from maybe space six onwards that's where they find themselves more of an advantage but uh, with the teams basically having the direct aggression approach they eventually find themselves into a really uh, difficult spot so maybe that's something that they need to basically start copying in terms of how they would be approaching their playbook so Aaron Gold definitely would be the setting for them to first play a little bit more stably. But I say that we could always get that the Nazca ending and all hell will break loose. <laughs> yeah, we could. I do want to see it. Um, it would be an exciting game to to see. But uh, there's plenty of other spots on Aaron that are fantastic to fantastic spots to end at. We can say that much. In fact, uh, as I look at this map. It's, uh, I mean, I've got my own. I think yesterday I said, in fact, I, I forget what my secondary spot was. I said Sosnovka first, uh, mm -hmm. and then I said, uh, potentially, I said Stalba was maybe my second favorite. I actually have no idea. I can't remember what I said yesterday. Um, but I, I know for a fact that I wanted Sosnovka Island ending, and I'll be very salty if I don't get it. But uh, the way PUBG pans out sometimes, you never get what you want, really. It is a game of improvisation, and I'm going to have to improvise this cast if I don't get my damn Sosnovka ending. Either way, the uh, Georgia Pole Bridge is the flyover for today. If you want to rotate across that bridge, it's generally a last ditch effort or you were there before anyone else. We don't know if the circle's going that way yet. Panic getting out towards Military Island. Looking at the map stream as well, it's just showed up on the live feed. So there we go. It's a bit more Southern. In fact, it's very similar to, if not identical to the plane we had game one uh, of yesterday. And that game turned yeah. out to be quite hectic. Lots of uh, terrain fights that were excellent to spectate. Um, and it was also uh, a playing path that lent itself nicely to a lot of early action. A lot of hot drops for cars, contestions for vehicles, uh, and, and general shenanigans. Whether or not that's going to happen on the identical plane path on day two is up for debate, considering people will certainly have changed up their strategy uh, on a plane path like this. It's happened before, so they know what to avoid um, going into this game. Yeah, almost like a deja vu. Like The, the plane path is pretty much the same. The uh, main difference here is that we're not seeing uh, too much of the hot drop uh, contest for vehicle is for certain because of how the path 
path have basically skewed uh, towards the south side. So you expect challenges like this to occur from time to time, but no casualties thus far as teams are wise enough to, you know, let go when necessary. So look at the map though, RS does have Huang F pretty much planted onto the island. So they're definitely looking to zone off any passerbys and we're looking at panic really depends on the timing whether if you're heading into the east or the western side of the bridge you still have either or ftf to deal with so Powell almost had one almost had one at the start of the game but he missed out on his opportunity he had iron sight sks uh up against unk who, who stole his hard spawn in gaka <laughs> that's very disrespectful but uh something that you can do sometimes here we go again it is frks up against forest obviously forest have the apartments only one member of frks is in these gigantic buildings and so forest will probably be able to trade him out if they do so successfully then they've got the high ground in this scenario they've got all the information that you could ever want but clearing out these apartments is notoriously difficult typically mm -hmm. you Wants a lot of members to be able to throw up these stairs of, of these buildings, but Forest only have two at the moment, and the fight, it, a lot of it comes down to who wins this engagement here. They are being incredibly careful, though. I like this from Forest as well. Information gained. It could have been dangerous through that window, but a nade has been thrown. I don't know whether it's going to land off the back of the building. The parachute comes out, but it's a jump shot from KM99. FRKS, Bowfish ripped apart. Pure confidence coming out from Forest Gaming. I thought he was going to lose his life on that jump. I thought he was going to die to fall damage, but not the case. What pure... Is that arrogance? Is that confidence? I don't know what it is. I think it's just a heat of the moment thing from KM99, but it pays off. Well, I think it's confidence, man. Like, of all the teams that he could pop drop, I think they really picked the wrong one to fight this time around. <laughs> so, right now, once again, on the back foot, and with Turtle P pretty much out for the count. I don't think there's any form of saving grace, but the master spot one over on top and Scappy only with the S1 will be able to find both oh of them. Oh my gosh. That's quick work for Forest Natural Gaming. They're happy about that because, you know, the Battle for Pride first and second, they're slowly inching against the side of Rep Esports. So at least this gives them a little bit more of a smoother start from this corners of trigger pull. Honestly, I don't really expect the battles to happen inside of the uh, corners of trigger pull so early in the game, but man, you can never even predict where FRK goes next. Yeah, that's the thing, right? Is they, they're everywhere on the map, are dropping in a completely different location every single game. Uh, good win though from, from Forest and uh, yeah, KM99, pure confidence to, to jump off that roof. You love to see stuff like that because uh, the other player is parachuting down and KM99 realizes that he's not going to be able to take these shots uh, if he's also using that that uh, that parachute to, to save him from the fall damage. So he says, all right, I'll give myself up. If uh, if I die to fall damage here, my teammate who's also on the roof has me. Don't worry about it. By the way, ISG, Whitefish going at it in the yellows. Central spot in the zone. So fighting for this is totally viable, totally justifiable. Dali's got decent damage done onto Sayudo, but decent damage done back onto him. So Febbin's now here to back them up. ISG completely stuck on the backside of this yellow two. This should be Whitefish running away with this. They've got them completely boxed in once they deal with that player in muck on these ridges on the outskirts here. Once they deal with him, the fight should easily go WF's way and it has very, very quickly gone their way. Three knocks and just one more to find. Tay9 inside that yellow. Unicorn Cyber over here to steal one of those kills, but very quickly wiped up by Whitefish, and they claim that central position that is so desirable in a zone like this. Yeah, Whitefish will also get enough time as well as some cover to reset for the moment. Unicorn Cyber, lucky enough to actually pick one off, so I'm pretty sure that they'll be extremely happy about that. Well, Unicorn Cyber could also opt to rotate to a different area than to, you know, hold out against the rest of Whitefish. PMA, though, will be the next one to be moving around. And the most in that I, I don't think it's ever going to be possible. So we'll see. Unicorn Cyber hoping to do at least keep trail of where PMA is going to be heading. As we take a look at the mini map, it is exactly identical uh, as compared to the first map that was played out yesterday. It'll be around the region of Gatka overall, which which definitely explains why everybody's 
pretty much taking these early battles. Unicorn Cyber in a pretty decent spot. Nice spread in the center of the zone. Obviously, every time you see that, you worry for them, thinking that potentially things can go awry. Solo can get breached and he doesn't have time to leave or the teammates aren't there quick enough to back him up. But mm -hmm. hopefully that's not the case. Generally, if you're a team in a lobby like this, especially one like Unicorn Cyber up there in fourth, then you've got your fundamentals down. And, and part of playing uh, as a solo in a compound all alone is having your car parked ready to go. As long as you can hop in that vehicle and ditch out the side um, that's closest to your teammates uh, in quick fashion, uh, then generally mm -hmm. you're you're pretty set. And so I'm, I'm imagining Unicorn Cyber have set the up like that. The cake occupied by GLS. This is off in the distance, though, very far uh, outside the zone. In fact, you can see Dope is rotating on the bridge just next to them. I don't know what I, I, GLS is doing here. Waiting for an emergency parachute or sharing loot um, would be my guess, but uh, they're just kind of wasting time. In fact, there is panic as well. If you go to the map stream, panic is all the way down the bottom of Military Island waiting for the ferry. And yeah. you, you know what? I It's totally okay with me because currently Ferry Pier is in the zone and so they will be able to get into the zone. It'll take a little bit more time. Um, but all this, all this screams to me is that they didn't have an emergency parachute because uh, otherwise I think they'd be taking that. Either way, it's sad for Reluctant Squad because Reluctant Squad are probably looking to camp Panic. Um, they are close to Ferry Pier, but they're going to have to get information that Panic is on the ferry uh, and then quickly scuttle their way over to, to get those kills onto Panic if they do gather that information. But Panic ain't going to be crossing the bridge anytime soon. Yeah, it's definitely going to take a while. And with RS waiting right uh, there on the bridge, not too sure if Panic's going to be able to have that form of a leeway to eventually get that wrap around once they uh, touch down. And Pawn Rival reposition might be the ones to actually take RS instead. But, of course, we'll, we'll see if that ever is going to happen. Well, we take a look at Valley Thai Esports. It's just uh, making sure that they would be able to get more presence around the compound. PMA would be around the vicinity while they trade will take a little bit of a heal. We oh, take boy. a look at Panic. Okay. <laughs> It's a long journey ahead of them, but they're already soaking it in. I mean, at least they got the blues on backs, while GLS, they've got well, the emergency parachutes. The, the, the thing for Panic there is uh, they've got four cars. They've mm -hmm. parked four cars onto the onto the ferry. And so that's resources that you wouldn't have if you opted for that emergency parachute. So it's 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 I like it from Panic, right? Keep four cars up, make your way in zone. You've got, um, it's less risky th than taking that bridge. Reluctant Squad hasn't moved, by the way. So if Reluctant Squad, the only other thing, right, is if Reluctant Squad look at the ferry as it's coming in, they see that there's all those parked cars on it, that's go time. That that's their that's their signal to scuttle over to to Ferry Pier uh, and be a nuisance for Panic. But I think Reluctant Squad's probably going to give up this bridge camp before Panic even get close. They are mm -hmm. coming in at an absolute <laughs> snail's pace, uh, so I think they're going to be mm -hmm. totally fine. Yeah. So far, not too much action happening across the map just yet. Just for string blows, and uh, we'll we'll see if they do get that spotted out. Though I mean, uh, which actually explains why Panic is. Uh, uh, arriving so much later as compared to everybody else with the uh, ferry. Now, I think I get what I asked for from yesterday. Damn, uh, potential yeah. Potential finish on top of the hills. Oh boy, not many teams inside this one either. No one's even on Everest. Usually that's a spot that uh, you find a couple people on top of, at least just for early game information, but it wasn't really necessary zone one. So on a circle like this, though, it certainly becomes potentially necessary for, for some teams. I mean, it's absolutely prior positioning. Uh, it's not something you necessarily want for information. It's something you want uh, to play God in a zone like this. So is the hospital absolute priority. Uh, it's off center in, in, in this specific zone, but GLS will happily take it. It's a spot that they can certainly play out of. Pixel Stars right next to them. Absolute neighbors at the moment. Uh, in fact, Pixel Stars take quite a decent bit of damage on, on uh, or sorry, from GLS as, as they parachute their way onto the hospital. They've done a 2-2 split as well. Nice split for, from GLS to secure a couple positions in the off center. It's one of those plays from GLS where not necessarily are they playing for the win doing this, but if the zone shifts towards them, they've got two of the best spots in that, that 
you know, potential center of the next zone. And so uh, it, it's totally fine to, to have a nice 2-2 like this, even though you're not really going to get much action. If the next zone comes towards you, you're pretty much set up for the rest of the game. Yeah, and first, uh, at least having pretty much a lot of safety net to play out for our late game is going to be crucial for the rest of a GLS. Whereas, you of course, Cyber trying to uh, try to look here with some parachutes. Plots out the entirety of Dopeness landing to the towers. Will be a little bit of distance to be able to hit that while the rest of Unicorn Cyber will be keeping watch for a lot longer because there's plenty of more teams to be headed to their direction in a moment's time while Valtai Esports have been able to pick Genosuke off. And that's going to be a pretty clean form inside of Megaloss, considering the fact that this is going to be under the spokes. While Tanan somehow gets a headshot towards the side of the destroyer, I thought that they're going to go on challenge overall. But UNC, they would be a lot more careful in their regards. So Unicorn Cyber, with the split that we actually see early on, should be able to lease hold still for now. Yeah, no reason to move just yet. Could get a little dodgy. Teams might want to breach Gat Cut. Kind of a, a, a it's it's a simple breach to be honest with you in Gat Cut, especially if you notice it's a two-two because there's so many buildings that you can hit from mm -hmm. from either side. You can wrap around the north side as well if you want to try and get keep the current owners from ever leaving Gat Cut. So it's a simple breach, but uh, it's not one you necessarily want to commit to this uh, early on. And I don't think there's anyone around that that uh, are going to to do that. So they remain pretty safe. Lots of presence towards the western side. Armory Gaming in an interesting spot. I don't know if we'll ever see them get into any action. Forest Gaming, though, nope. very close to Valley Tai. Kiss all by his lonesome in the observatory here. Forest find themselves on the rocks. Kiss, I suppose the thing for Kiss is he's in safety. And so he can kind of back off upstairs. In fact, he's choosing just to leave. This could cost him his life if he exposes himself too much, but he's taken a, a decent LOS through those smokes. Uh, he's, he's angled his car nicely, so he's able to avoid any uh, potential danger. And that zone shifts even more north. Whitefish are the oh. team on top of Everest right now. Panic coming in on that emergency parachute. They came all the way down from Ferry Pier, all the way up from Ferry Pier, sorry, just to have an emergency parachute play into the center of the zone. You can't blame them though. This is a devastating zone for a lot of teams. Unicorn Cyber will be grouping up. No more Gatka for them. Forest, Valley Tai, both teams are outside the zone and both teams have a fight in front of them that they have to take. Yeah, Reluctant Squad's going to be doing exactly the same with the emergency parachutes. Planet Esports lend themselves into a really nice spot, but up in the air, they're going exactly for the direct drop and this is go time for light work. Whitefish also going to be looking to pick one up as well. They're just basically attracting all the eyeballs across Gatka. And good news for Panic Esports at the very least. They will be able to get themselves uh, pretty much a line drawn and have the absolute safety net for the time being. They're not, not the most safe from Panic. I didn't say that much. I think I just saw a Mortar popped up on top of uh, on top of Everest up here from Whitefish, so they can play with that later on. It's something you'll see a lot of teams do, though. Just kind of send themselves in to the little divots that line the hills of Everest. You kind of have to just park yourselves up in there, use the bushes, use the trees, use whatever car cover you have to just survive. It's not necessarily the winning play, but sometimes it's the only play you have. Okay, Reluctant Squad. All four of them in this little hole on the rocks. I have never, ever seen anything like this ever in my life. I don't know what their play is, but I suppose they are kind of pinned down. They can't go low because Panic's there. They can't go high because Whitefish is there. And if they go down towards um, God Compound, well, Unicorn Cyber's there. So maybe this is their own play i don't want to believe it um but it's quite funny so i'm i'm happy to be observing that i can imagine one grenade is going to finish off every single member of reluctant squad but for the moment they are safe but nice headshots from Lite, Olympus down and Forest Crusade to uh, make their way into the zone might actually have to turn into a wrap. Initially, it was them taking the fight towards Valley Tai, but I think KM99 is finally realizing they've got other options. They can angle themselves towards the field and maybe try that play out instead. Yeah, I could basically imagine that nade flying in later on from Whitefish. But first, folks back on the other side of Valtai Esports. This is going to oh, be a clean stop. Oh, Wait. my God. 
Did it happen? It was a mortar as well. What? I want to see that. I need to see that. I know the observers can't hear me, but I need to see that. That is iconic, man. Oh my god. It was from Pixel Stars 2. It wasn't even Whitefish. That's insane. <sighs> if only you have the cams on me, my jaw is all the way down. <laughs> I, Dude, I, I'm we'll, lost for words. I, I, me as well. Like, Dude. The moment I say that, that appears on the feed. Replay, <laughs> replay. <laughs> I, I, oh my gosh, man. That's crazy. That is crazy. I don't blame uh, observers for not being able to pick it up because you never, uh, you're never really uh, relying on the, the mm -hmm. morning kills um, to actually come out. It could be quite inconsistent, but mm -hmm. a replay. I'm hoping we get a replay, man. That would be <laughs> sick to watch live. Oh man, a painful way to go out. Panic. Really had, well, what am I saying? It's not panic, but RS. They, they could have spread out, maybe. I don't know. I don't think they see that Mortar coming. Or is Natural Gaming, uh, instead, they venture out Camp 99 to be taken out by the zone while Dopeness still having some tough challenge from the side of GLS Esports. Oisama. Ooh, should have enough spacing for the rebuttals to go through. Well, for Mochita 10, having a really good area of play to at least uh, reposition for themselves. Well, both sides hugging the rim of the circle right now with Zyu pushing by. I would basically count dopeness out of this already. Yeah, it's not looking good, is it? Armor <laughs> Gaming on top. It's. Uh... Not a spot that um, Amashi Darton wants to be in, and he'll be cleaned up. Zayu grabs it. Armory Gaming now looking towards GLS. Armory Gaming in a much better spot to finish this fight off as well. They've got the high ground of Radio Tower. GLS are the ones under pressure. Blue Zone Grenades go out to stop GLS from moving forward. And Armory Gaming train their sights on the players on the edge of the zone. They've got their own little line of sight to move in with, and James already accounting for that. He doesn't want to let them uh, maneuver around to that north. He wants to create this barrier between them and safety, freedom, success, essentially. More blue zone grenades come out uh, to cover this uh, space that GLS has to, to play with, and Armour and Gaming continue to push their way forward and hopefully uh, enable themselves with a bit of a knock, because once they get that opening knock, it's essentially go time for Armoury. Whitefish, however, remain kings of the hill. Day trade below them, along with Panic. You can imagine Whitefish pushing Day trade into Panic and Panic just cleaning house, right? They yeah, I no could idea. absolutely imagine that. Day trade have no idea that Panic's there, right? So mm -hmm. if, if Whitefish is successful in that, then I can see that happening. James does get that opening I was talking about. It's Zayu down and now GLS on the back foot. GLS blindsided as well. The moment he pops up, he does get one back. GLS managing to at least make things a little bit more salvageable. While Rue pulls all the way back. He needs to rescue his teammates. Not enough to actually get the MSD at least. So Huang Nam is doing such a splendid job. Armory Gaming still have Shangs on the far flank watch. But I don't think that you basically do much of a support at this current standpoint. Just eSports match to overwhelm Armory Gaming. And that's only one more left on the far end. Shanks got to play his own game right now. Maybe even Paradise hitting into the next phase. Well, that's it for the side of game. All right, GLS. Came to play, I suppose. Thought Armory Gaming might be able to capitalize on that, but GLS fought back incredibly well. Shanks uh, has to back off and concede that position to Armory Gaming, or to GLS, sorry. Day Trade never ran into panic. They never even gave themselves a chance. They had vehicles to escape this situation with. Actually, never mind. I might eat my own words. I think they've turned right into panic. Panic are going to have absolute freebies here, rotating in cars. Day Trade have been uh, turned away from panic. Suspect is going to get one, and here's Pixel Stars. Mad Pig, four kills already off the back of that mortar, looking to continue that momentum. Oh, a free UAS for Panic Sky. Yep, we'll take that. We can use that to get inside the zone. Panic remain alive too. Day Trade completely torn apart on their in by a multitude of different teams. PV did go down. Whitefish now looking to capitalize on Panic's attention being drawn away from the top of this hill.
Yeah, and they could still play for a very long time here as it does cover the Empress side. Armor Gaming finally made it, and it's gonna be GLS that will be able to still put in another point. But the end, struggling to survive from Nade, Big Prime in from Fap. So RX Esports will be able to basically get that final cleanup. Well, from the future is starting to also close in onto Panic, so they will have to deal with the squad over on top end of Everest, and they trade might actually get a little bit more of some good side against FTF's approach. Meanwhile, PMA has been playing a very passive play inside of the real estate. They are currently dealing with the rest of Pixel Stars. So it will be a little bit of a long range standoff from all these multiple teams that are currently on board. Managing to find Dahlia on top of the hill, though Vince, you will basically have a couple of members of Whitefish uh, being a little bit preoccupied for now. Oh, yeah, essentially, Panic got quite close to Whitefish as well. Divi's up close and personal. Eventually going to be... Uh, this is it. Ooh. This is... <laughs> Dude, I really... I need to see it. I am going to be devastated if there isn't a replay of that mortar. Either way. <laughs> if you're trying to get up close potentially to uh, weaken WF, because uh, at this point for Panic, it's rough to get into the zone without taking any losses. FTF's on the backside. They know that. Day trades are in front of them. They know that. And obviously they know Whitefish is above them. So they need to start thinking about weakening the teams around them or making a completely separate play that's going to secure as many lives as possible because I can't really see Panic surviving here um, unless they, they put up a really good fight um, to these three teams in the next couple of minutes as this phase uh, closes in. It's essentially what they need to do. And it's already started to happen onto FTF. RxE looked like they were in a decent spot. Day Trade's actually moved off. They've moved off from the top of the hill into the bowl that RxE was grenading just before, but Day Trade had absolutely no idea. So it's a free couple kills for FAP. He still had more nades to work with. He's still got more to work with, to be fair. More bodies to pick up, more utility to snatch as well. Daisy's has gone down. Off the back of Sat Pal. They've been in that compound for eons, bro. They're yeah. trying to make that work. They've just been sitting there loving life, but now it's made, life's been made a little bit more difficult now that RxE is trying to get involved, pushing their way into that compound, but a good defense from Unicorn Cyber. RxE, hard to make that push happen, and a fantastic nade from Pivi onto WF. It's all starting to kick off. Yeah, and basically it's crunch time for them to move into the zone. And FTF. Uh, they still have to deal with PMA. They know the presence of Small Town Kid, but they could still find a uh, wiggle room to wrap around through the foothill, but they're still panicked though. Panic, have their eyes locked onto Whitefish. Perhaps that's the only way that they can basically approach this safely. And Happy chimed in. Final Thieving, that's gonna be a clean shot from FTF to secure. And for FTF, they gotta be absolutely careful about the approaching panic members as they would also be coming in from multitudes of angles. But look at this tree man setup from the side of Whitefish. They're looking to annihilate panic esports, but they don't really have nades. They just put in all the bullets. Lightworks already down. Down to Dusky as well, suspect. From fighting chance though. We'll basically confirm Dahlia first for anything else, and there's just no way out for Panic at all. We'll bring as much as they can before bowing out to the zone. It's a nice attempt, a necessary attempt from Panic, but yeah, I just can't pan out. Torn between too many different teams, too, uh, too many fights to take from the side of Panic. It was just never really going to work out. I think potentially the better play for them would have been to make a desperate play and just fight one team, claim their spot, and then move in the zone from there. But I really do not blame them for that attempt. To be honest with you, they survived a lot longer, a lot, a lot longer than I thought. Yeah, so a good fight from Panic. Better. Yeah, I mean, absolute kudos. They 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 put up a really good fight. It, I mean, it totally messed with FTF. Uh, they they basically uh, spelt the downfall of of Whitefish on top of that hill, um, and then uh, towards Day Trade as well. I mean, Day Trade weren't really a problem. They 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 got away from Panic quite quickly, but uh, yeah, Panic were definitely the downfall of a couple teams in that scenario. FTF remain the victors of that whole uh, event though, on that uh, northwestern side. They remain with a little bit of high ground. It's probably going to be pushed out uh, uh, in these later zones as we move to phase eight and mm -hmm. phase nine. But 26, minute past, 26 minutes passed and it's already been one hell of a game. We've already had some incredible moments.
Now we're down to our top three. Four of Unicorn Cyber, four of PMA, and three of FTF. Yeah, and it's basically a pressure on the side of PMA as well as FTF. These two teams are basically playing for survival. Unicorn Cyber, if it's a chicken, it's definitely a bonus to be looking for that number one spot. So with both FTF as well as PMA in pretty close proximity as well, FTF definitely was happy about the uh, play that happened over onto the Everest. So now that you managed to at least open up a little bit more room through uh, the northern part of the map, as PMA, oh, true, those passive play, managed to pull true. But uh, Unicorn Cyber, they have so much free spacing as they could basically claim half of the area of play already. And as a matter of fact, they're already standing one directly in the middle, just giving so little space for our PMA to work with. A couple of smokes now popped up. It's going to take a while before we complete this one. And we'll just really have to see. PMA doesn't really have much cover if they do leave this foothill, though. So I'm not sure how this would basically play out later on. They need to basically pick a fight. Uh, it's either Unicorn, which is going to be a lot harder to, to do, especially with the spread. So maybe if they could find the members of FTF, Finishing second would be the best thing possible for them. Usually in a scenario like this, I'd say that for PMA and Unicorn Cyber, it's about pushing the other team into uh, their competitor. So PMA pushing FTF into uh, Unicorn Cyber. But looking at FTF's position, I don't think they're going to be able to move from that spot at all. I think as soon as FTF starts to move, it's just going to be PMA and Unicorn Cyber vying for the kills onto FTF. I don't think that strategy of... Um, being able to third party uh, one of these teams is going to come into play. Tiago's goes down. As you said, PMA don't have much space to work with at all. We're seeing essentially all the space that PMA are going to have to work with right in front of us. Manhung is giving us the, the, the full show right now of all that PMA are going to have to utilize to try and win this game. It's trees, it's low side trees, and obviously Unicorn Cyber are going to have full information and full line of sight on basically all of it. I think that UAS is out of uh, order as well. I don't think that is going to come into play in the late game. Lots of tires popped on that. So now it gets in it, but I think realizes that that is a lost cause. FTF certainly going to go out. This is probably PMA's game plan right now. We realize that the game is pretty much lost. Let's just try to get as many kills as we can onto FTF. And then we can think about maybe trying to win the game against Unicorn Cyber. But Unicorn Cyber have far too much control. And just like RxE in the past, they aren't letting the game escape them. They are bringing themselves into the center of the zone. Absolutely controlling uh, PMA, corralling them into deadly lines of sights. These crossfires are absolutely on point right now for Unicorn Cyber. Cyber, there is absolutely zero chance PMA can win this game. Yeah, there's not a way that they could basically close this one out. Or if they do, it really has to be a couple of really, really clean pickoffs. And as a matter of oh, fact, no. it's Unicorn Cyber that has been stealing all these potential points by taking down FTF by detonating that US and running out in the open. That's not going to cut it. Who that? Look at the secure the final one. One versus two. Could he actually pull it off? Nope, not a chance at all. Unicorn Cyber Esports with a really, really clean ending here in the map of Arangel. Yeah, uh, well done from Unicorn Cyber. Unfortunately, also one of those games we didn't see too much of them from uh, because they were in uh, Gatka initially, and then of course they moved themselves up into God Compound um, a little bit later on, and the circle just kind of went towards them. And uh, we were watching all the other action. We were watching all the action um, to the north, and so Unicorn Cyber we didn't get to see much of. But they racked up 12 kills, uh, which means they were being incredibly active uh, not only in the mid game, but also in the late game, as we saw just then. So it's a well fought win from Unicorn Cyber. I believe they did have to defend against RxC as well, who set themselves into uh, their compound earlier on in the game. And so that's one of those things you can point to um, as another reason why Unicorn Cyber deserve to, to win this game. So it's well done from them, but I have only one question. Contra, I want to know mm -hmm. if that Mortar was caught in the replay. I'm very nervous as we go through these highlights right now. Oh yeah, that's definitely the golden question, but we basically kick off with a really, really uh, huge play coming from KM99 as well. I think a kill is not enough. He needs that spotlight. So, of course, that did, of course, appear no. here. But I don't think we're getting it, are we? We'll, we'll wait for it. So, we'll wait for it, yeah. Okay, we at least got the, the one with uh, GLS, which was pretty interesting because they eventually went against 
Armory Gaming, which we have expected Armory to be able to overcome. And then you take a look at this double peak that has Feeben coming on top and Quaysama cleans everything up from the edge of the map. So that's really, really well done coming in out of GLS to shut down the entirety of Armory. Yeah, I, Armory have looked um, not like a shadow of their former selves in this tournament, but certainly a lesser version of it. They are a team, again, I expect to be popping off with a bunch of kills, not in every game, but in a considerable amount of games, and they just haven't really been doing that this tournament. So it's unfortunate to see, but it is what it is at this current moment in time. WF, as they came off the top of the hill, it was an absolute clean up, and the same uh, can be said for Panic. It was difficult for both those teams to really get anything done in this late game. And unfortunately, we do not get to see that Mortar, which absolutely breaks my heart, because I think <laughs> if we were able to see that replay, genuinely, if... um. If the Observers were actually able to capture that on replay, uh, then it would have been one of the most iconic moments in modern day PUBG esports history. But uh, that didn't happen, and that is very sad. I'm hoping that uh, one of the players will have access to the replay file uh, in one way, shape, or form, and then they're able to go back, watch that, upload it to Twitter or something like that, and we can see it in its in its full glory. But um, uh, yeah, another another entertaining game, and that was game five out of six, so there's only one more to go. Yeah, if that clip does appear, I mean, everyone's got just going to be hitting that instant retweet button. So, well, we'll see. But I think that it's really interesting to note that a lot of all these teams who were desperate to secure that top eight PMA. And we had, of course, Panic, who matched to breach in with that previous chicken dinner to be pitted against each other with FTF also watching by the wings. So, of course, FTF, oh, we eventually uh, were bested out by PMA survivability by the tail end of it all. But uh, it will still be a very, very close battle between uh, these uh, teams overall. So we'll have to take a look at the margins in a couple more minutes or so. And for most part, I think Unicorn Cyber, uh, I, I don't think we've given them enough of a credit of how well they've been doing throughout the tournament from day one all the way up to today. So far, the level of consistency and the way that they've been taking uh, fights were not only uh, smart, but also they knew when is the right time to basically aggress. And the way that they secured the, the course of the map from the start all the way to the finish, we saw how they've been opening up with the 2-2 split initially, and of course, eventually moved slowly towards the side of Everest. And with that, Unicorns will be able to reap in 22 points, but it is Pixel Stars that has got that perfect tenor there alongside with Whitefish. Yeah, out of all the bottom five teams, Pixel Stars uh, has been the most consistent. Whitefish putting themselves up there now in this specific game, but again, maybe a little bit too late for both of those teams. Regardless, they're up there this game. Got to give them credit for that. Uh, and then as we go down the leaderboard, it is as expected. Couple kills here and there. Unicorn Cyber now in first place on 103 points. Panic moved their way up to fifth, and that. Uh, Eighth spot now looks like the one that is the specific spot to be fought over here because FTF put themselves up a little bit further uh, than PMA uh, in that game specifically. They've got 77, PMA now on 69. Day Trade and Armory Gaming. Day Trade, an iconic SEA team, and Armory Gaming, the winners of Super Cup third in the Thai League before this, in 10th. This is not the result I would have expected uh, more than halfway through this tournament, but it is the one that we have. And I think for both those teams, going back to the drawing board is probably step number one, or at least trying to figure out what problems are, are occurring for them just so they can actually secure their spot um, in the top eight. It is not a Super Cup. It is not just fighting for prize money. You are fighting for qualification to PGS3 and 4. There is a lot on the line here for both those teams. And both those teams currently are not living up to expectations. So to see them down there, they certainly need a bit of a resurgence. Two wins for RxE, Panic, uh, Reluctant Squad, and Unicorn Cyber uh, have the other three. And then, of course, we wait and find out who is the sixth winner of the night. Yeah, it really seems to be a huge uh, pitfall for some of all these Thai squads, which we have a lot of expectations on. So I'm not too sure to really put it, like you said, like they look so much uh, less than what we've actually desired. And of course, being in the shadow of their former self right now, 
it just looks to be really strange to me because honestly even if they had any form of changes it wasn't all too drastic as well when it comes out to whether it's the roster or so or maybe the ideologies of how they've been playing the game here may not have been fitted into how the rest of them have been playing throughout the course of this entirety of the playoffs then again we look into how things have played out for panic look at their rise uh from you know the second pager all the way up to currently uh, fighting for top five that itself is quite the story that we're seeing here from the teams from uh, to the challenger rumble series well PUBG, challenger rumble Excuse yeah me. so um there's just so many different stories that goes around but well, over the top end, I think Repsic Esports definitely have surprised all of us for the past few days with their consistency and very, very clean plays after all. Yeah, um, I, I agree. I mean, obviously, Repsic, uh, with the most wins in the tournament, you've got to give them full credit for that. They've been able to pull out um, four wins, and uh, it's you have to be doing something right to be able to get to that point. But to go back to Armory and Day Trade, to put everyone who's watching, um, to put their mind in the correct place, I suppose, Armory Gaming, to me, are a team that uh, should be in that top eight no matter what. Um, Armory Gaming are a team that, that should be farming this lobby um, and that should be absolutely capitalizing on all the opportunities that come their way and to have them losing um, members on members at the start of these games is... Uh, we're not going to get to see the, the full uh, breadth of Armory Gaming's skill uh, if that continues to happen. And so they, for me, shouldn't be down there in 10th. They, they should be in the top eight confirmed. Whether or not they're first or eighth doesn't really matter to me. I think they should absolutely be up there. Uh, and given previous results, previous recent results, uh, there's no narrative to say otherwise. Day Trade is a bit different. Day Trade on paper are uh, a, a, ho a household favorite. They are a household name. Uh, and they've got players who are internationally experienced uh, and players who uh, in previous um, regional series have done incredibly well. Um, and so on paper, you look at them and you go, okay, they should absolutely be up there and fighting for top eight. The other side of that coin and the other argument you could make is uh, not only during Super Cup did they make an IGL change, I believe it went from Flash to Norens or vice versa, I can't remember. Um, but they made an IGL change and Super Cup was abysmal for them. Super Cup was not the tournament that Daytrade wanted at all. We were very shocked uh, at the placement that they had in Super Cup. Coming into this tournament, it's weird because do we expect the day trade of Super Cup or do we expect the day trade of old? The other question is, what is their mentality other, uh, because Thanadol is obviously coming into the roster after PGS 3 and 4. And so that obviously kind of weighs um, on day trades uh, minds, that it'll be weighing on the players' minds. I don't know whether it's going to have impact on the in-game performance, uh, but you can imagine in some circumstances it will. So day trade, not necessarily with the same expectations as Armory, uh, but certainly just off the base, off the back of their household name, off the back of the expectations you have for them on paper, they should not be sitting down there in ninth. Yeah. All right. A daunting task for them for the final day of the playoffs if they don't get this one down to close off the night it's gonna be our final match of day two as we will be taking a first eye view of what we have in store for us so let's fly over to Aaron Gold real quick to see what we get this time it's gonna be well of all things prison <laughs> yeah a bit odd you ever been to prison Contra I have not, thankfully. Neither have I. Very good. All right, <laughs> nice. Neither of us are criminals. That's a fantastic start. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great place to hot drop, though. I, I, I'll say that much. Um, it's changed over the years a couple times, um, but it's remained... Uh, I think it's got that same feel um, that it had all the way back in 2017. So I like prison that's for that reason. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it absolutely is. It's one of those spots that's remained... Um, it's got that same identity, similar to uh, Pachinki as well. It's it's kind of maintained uh, a very similar identity to how it was back in 2017. Lots of spots on Orangle maintain that identity, to be fair. It's been touched up and changed over the years, um, made much better, in, in my opinion, made much, much, much better um, than previous versions. So uh, that's good to see. And it's also good to see that the identities of uh, iconic locations uh, remain intact. Armory Gaming off towards Shelter, where they have been um, oftentimes on a wrangle, seems to be their loot mm -hmm. spot. And then there's a couple other teams getting quite close to each other. Whether or not we'll get a hot drop, where is FRKS? Uh, well, ah, let me just inform you, they are once again going for the hustle against Forest Gaming. So it's inside the water town, so I'm not too sure if they're going to be able to actually get much of it. 
it also seems like Forest is a little bit further uh, in into the corners of Ruin, so it should be pretty all right. It won't be too much of a direct and a drop that we will see them basically contest each other. While FTF has the initial advantage of having the circle pretty much close by to you, it's not player. I mean, it's smack dab in the center. So with that being said, we'll see what are the approaches for some of all the other squads. I'm looking into the island itself with Panic. This time getting a better access as they have switched it up a little bit from the side of Novo. They should be able to bypass the bridge safely if they do it uh, rather early than late. So we'll definitely have to take a look. Well, now we get ourselves into the FRKS engagement. It's Cam99 once again flexing on them. There goes Masters to also clean it up for Matt for him as well. I don't know what FRKS's beef is with uh, Forest, but that's two games in a row, both on a angle. And they've decided to drop right next to them. Forest will clean it up though. Probably one of the reasons that, uh, I mean, aside from Forest's skill, the um, four free points that come to them at the start of uh, both these Arangel games will put them, or keep them uh, in that uh, top five quite nicely. Currently sitting in third, uh, and they're about to put themselves a little bit further away from Valley type off the back of these mm. points. And uh, I say see, I say free points might be a little bit harsh, but I absolutely mean it. If I care, so basically one, maybe one of these hot drops, maybe two. Um, mm -hmm. The other times they have been uh, not very good, but oh. uh, it, it is what it is, and it is uh, we have is. to be we have to be very honest with ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, there's no there's no point sugarcoating it because uh, I mean there's just no point. There's no point sugarcoating it. There haven't been a team in this lobby that have looked like they are here to compete. They have hot dropped every single uh, map, and uh, you can only gain some, you can only gain a certain opinion off the back of that. But maybe they can oh. secure one, and that is a whiff, an absolute whiff from both fish. And the Panzerfaust doesn't even follow it up either. Master has been allowed to live on essentially one HP. Scrappy now off in the background trying to cover Master. Behind that ridge, Dynasty and Riz combine onto FTF. Maybe that's a fight we'll go to later. KM99 with a whiff of his own. Bowfish able to get that, but Scappy there just in the nick of time to secure that trade. Oh, thankfully. I mean, that would have actually been pretty overwhelming if he would be able to make that play. But for his natural gaming, oh, they do have Masters being knocked back. So Olympus goes in for a quick reset for Cam99 and they should be able to seal the deal, but they might actually give Master's life up for that. So thankfully, we'll have a safe distance and that tap from Scappy will finally put an end to this early trade. And once again, dropping off the earliest for FRKS. And honestly, I didn't expect to see these kind of plays coming from the Masters region, right? Like, because back in the days, we have so many of all these uh, teams that were really, really aggressive, and now it's really feeling like F4KS is kind of spoiling the reputation a little bit. Good information gathering from Forrest to realize that Unicorn Cyber is trying to third-party this. They're a bit too late to the action. Fight's already over, but they are still surrounding Forrest. All four of Unicorn Cyber here to keep them inside of ruins and pressure them enough so they put themselves in their line of sights and they've absolutely done that. Destroy onto KM99. One of Forest down, three to go for Unicorn Cyber. So power on the backside as well, all the way down there below ruins. He's got an opportunity to potentially wrap super wide, make sure that uh, Forest can't really leave ruins. In fact, I, I kind of want to see one of Unicorn do that right now. It's, it's kind of got to be Sapau too, because Forest is just going to get out of here. This is a losing battle for them. Absolutely no way they can ever justify taking that fight if they want to uh, have a consistent rest of the game. So they're going to leave, but at the same time, Unicorn Cyber weren't really set up in positions to, to deal with it. I wonder if Sapau had a car that he could have taken um, to that southern side, put himself up on one of those ridges and watched them as they ran in uh, into to Boatyard here. But... And he never actually did that, never actually got into the car. Uh, and so Unicorn Cyber, a bit too late to catch Forest on rotation there. Yeah, and there's also no vehicles for Forest Natural Gaming to work with. So for the meantime, they will have to commit with a little bit more of the traits. And at least the good news is the circle won't be too far off. All they have to do is to maybe 
uh, get a couple of pickoffs to open up the space for them to journey their way into Rozak. And Rozak by then should be clear enough for them to resupply and hopefully enough, maybe get one vehicle if it hasn't been uh, taken by other teams already. So for the meantime, we will go into the views of Rapsic Esports as they're currently planted a uh, true shelter app as well as the rest of RXE so far we're going to be uh, setting up in the case with more and more teams to actually cut across I think spot the member of Whitefish they've been trading for a while now well that would just quickly reposition and regroups with the rest of the RXE squad so they gotta also keep an eye out for Armory Gaming that's basically taking the warehouse in the direct center. Meanwhile, Armory Gaming still with the pressure of getting back into the top A. They need to play a perfect game from here on out in order to secure any form of chance at all for the finals happening this weekend. And UNC, it seems like they have gone for a further spread to head back into the George Poro sector. And that's going to be Pixel Stars that will be cutting over a north side of George to eventually uh, move into the Stalber Bridge in the form of entry. So that will be pretty much a safe area of play while the rest of day trade gaming, uh, they, they will play a very significant role as the game progresses. There will definitely be a lot of teams that were hoping to contest for some of their real estate. Yeah, especially if it goes towards uh, the mansion split, right? You have that forest that day trade can look at and got all these buildings inside of mansion that um, become breach territory. Essentially, Belmoth might have to leave his car right now for Belmoth. He's not parked to leave. Um, so if he wants to back off to the rest of his team who are more on the northern side of mansion, he's going to have to turn that car around and uh, make sure that he it's in a safe spot for him to quickly hop in and then leave uh, out the northern side because you can imagine teams breaching from the west and the south but not necessarily breaching from the uh, east uh, so he's got to be careful of that but uh day trade confident as ever i haven't really looked um too shaken in this tournament just not, not, things haven't necessarily gone their way um i don't think they've been under too much pressure they haven't looked indecisive or anything like that they just seem to be losing uh in in pivotal moments but Certainly, mm -hmm. certainly a resurgence to be had for them. Whitefish now looking towards Vinsu from RXC, alone in those yellows. And he hasn't made a single sound either, so Tiara is probably calling it to be free. Maybe the shots from Thanahan in the distance make him a little suspicious that there's someone inside that compound. Why would Thanahan be shooting at this player if there was no one close by? That's a question Tiara is going to have to figure out the answer to. This is Pooch's spread quite nicely as well uh, in the flat top closer to Yaz Naya. A very, very, uh, I wouldn't call it a dangerous split from, from day trade, but it, it certainly could get a little hairy um, mm -hmm. if they are breached from, from multiple different angles. But I'm sure they're ready for it. As I said before, Forest Gaming, they have no other option really. They uh, submitted to having no cars off the back of that Ruins hot drop, and then obviously everything at Roshock and School is going to be taken. So what other option do you have but to take an emergency parachute? I think they've timed it. Uh, well, actually, no, they haven't timed it at all. So this is just a on-the-fly thing. Generally, uh, you'll see teams time it for that Phase 2 pop, so they end up in the center of the Phase 2 circle, and they can make a choice as to where they want to go. That it wasn't the case for Forest. They're a little bit late to that timing. That said, you can already see the opening in between all those names. The yellows in the dead center of the field are currently free, will Forest be able to claim those as their own? Yeah, there's a, a few little free spacing for them to base, make a little bit of claim, but that will still draw a lot of attention coming from other squads as well. Meanwhile, a little bit more of a convoy coming out of GLS. So is other squads as they try to basically take a lot more spacing into the fields while Belmov will be able to shred out some of the members of GLS with two cutting by into the other side. It will be GLS having two losses though. And yeah. unable to basically fight back. So they trade clean that one clean with them still having a really, really firm hole into the direct center. Yeah, they haven't really given it up, have they? They've left Mansion, so credit to them to leave Mansion, focus on the forest, which is a much better spot to um, hold the southern edge from. 
uh, you can often catch teams out. They, they kind of pull up right next to you and you have uh, a freebie sometimes as they hop out of their car. But uh, they're also quite close to their teammates. They've got one uh, in the flat top just north of that, that Forest Bowl uh, location. Then, of course, they've got Pooches in Alamo just to the eastern side of Yasnaya Poliana. That is the uh, risky position potentially. But at this point, for day trade confidence um, and a big spread like this is what you want to see. This is how you rack up a lot of kill points in a game like this. And day trade put themselves in prime position to do just that. ISG find themselves in the apartments on the southern side of Yaz Naya looking towards the field, but obviously I see, uh, I can imagine they don't even have a plan right now. They are just sitting and vibing um, because the circle's on top of them. And generally when the circle's on top of you and you're inside these apartments, you're not really thinking about the future. Yeah, the future should be should be should be pretty set for you. Um, set, if, set. if it if it shifts off, it's panic mode. But for the moment, I think they are uh, 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 ignorance is bliss. I suppose is probably the best way to describe yeah. Ayashi's position right now. Probably, if they're lucky enough, if the circle does pull into the city of Isnaya, then there's going to be a lot of cars that will drive towards their direction. And who knows? Maybe there's going to be you know multitudes of. Uh, angles that they could basically get a few pointers out of. But good news for the side of Forest Gaming, though. They managed to not only land in the direct center, but also claim that uh, compound for their own, which also means that they will be able to sustain very, very long into this fight. It's still relatively early in the game. 12 minutes have passed, and we're still seeing majority of the players still left alive. In the court cyber, though, we see that spread destroy over a lake, sapal by the quarters of the gas station, manhung, still by the edges of Rosal, and having who that over its outside. They are yeah. going for a very wide spread, but I'm not sure what are the chances to survive this match. I like it. I mean, I don't necessarily like it if you're fighting for your life in the tournament, but Unicorn Cyber are first. They, they don't it. really have anything to lose right now. At this point, they can take individual fights that we've seen them win time and time and time again. Armory Gaming set up nicely. Trick, rest of FTF, or the remainders of FTF set up nicely too in that uh, library position. Daytrade might even choose to regroup on a zone like this, but I think for them, it's about controlling their side of the zone, so I love that from Daytrade. And this is the panic. This is the great migration from everyone who doesn't have a spot in this zone. There are only so many bowls that you can play in a zone like this. Forest has control of the yellow, so those are already taken, and Re uh, Reluctant Squad to find their way. Th I mean, they're the first ones uh, into that priority bowl in the dead center of the circle right now. They're there is a neighboring bowl, a couple of neighboring bowls, really, uh, that the other teams can find themselves in. But Reluctant Squad claim the best in slot bowl, essentially, right now. Man, these guys are like slugs. Snail without a home right now to basically keep themselves safe. PMA out in the open, getting their vehicles slowly shred apart while what's currently happening towards RS is exactly the same with a drive-by coming out of Whitefish to at least knock down Long Hive. I don't think they're ever going to stop to claim any form of points, so they're just going to leave them be while they also do soak in an initial shot coming out of FAP to be able to pin one down. But for now, at least, coast is clear. They form a vehicle bunker to last out for the meantime. Oh, man. <laughs> this is just getting crazier as it goes in our final match. All right, well, that's ball number two claimed. PMA, there's a third ball up for grabs. Do you want to grab it? Or do you not really have the facilities to send yourself through Whitefish and Reluctant Squad to claim that third ball? I am Peace just sending it at Reluctant Squad. That was never, ever, ever going to pan out in PMA's favor. And so they've completely skipped over ball number three, and they are going to the forest. They trade have moved their way out, so this spot will actually be safe for PMA to play. But they've lost two members for that information. That is never a trade that you want to make. WF have realized that if they put up a little bit of a smoke wall, they can actually peek down here into Reluctant Squad. But really good cover from Reluctant Squad has been made. There's a really good car fort here, uh, bolstered by those foldable shields as well. So Reluctant Squad will be able to live. WF will remain on top. And it's going to be harder and harder for WF to actually peek over once those smokes have dissipated. Yeah, meanwhile, Dopeness now caught on by surprise. You and UNC having put that on the watch. There's really no safe space for Dopeness at all. They passed by a couple of bowls, as you mentioned, and now it's only down to Shinosuke is wrapping towards the rim of the circle, hoping that some of the open fields of Yatsunaya will give them that form of space. So you called it out, Dopeness, as well as ISG. I mean, they, they, they chill for basically a little bit too long, but Dopeness now crashing in. I don't think he expects that there is going to be a little bit more of that pressure coming in, but Pixel Stars will keep watch will be able to at least help 
Omo Daiten to be able to get back on his feet for now. As the circle does actually swing towards the northern end, it will be a, a oh little bit gosh. of a shift, and it's going to be really tough for those to over the south side. Valley Tai, though, I think they should be able to actually get a little bit more of an access. Armory Gaming just got to really see if they could basically squeeze through. There is an argument for here to day trade to not leave that uh, flat top position. Uh, especially if their cars are parked and ready to go. But I think uh, b because the safe spot would be to park their cars on the northern side, I think Panic can probably see that. So can um, D&E. And if you risk those tires getting popped, then it's just not worth the, the struggle of um, of having to, to, to defend a breach. So uh, they play the smart, they play the safe play, they group up in Alamo, put themselves in the dead center of the circle, all up as four. Day trade in a prime position to... If they're not going to win this game, at least they're going to deal a ton of damage. They've got that hill they can play later on. First task for Daytrade is to deal, uh, to defend against Valet Tai. And as Valet Tai drive in, Norens gets three out of the window. I think one of those was a fade oh. away. He can't get four. He is humbled a little bit by Kiss, who's actually got two, but finally finished off by Omish Odan from the yellows up in the field. RX in now as well. Oh, this is chaos for Daytrade. The group oh, up was good for them, but this is maybe a bit too much for them to handle. Absolutely overwhelmed. Norris, he did such a great job, but with the arrival of RX and the Blue Zone Grenade to seal the deal, making this invade look a little bit too easy, but man, good timing once again. RXE, when it comes down to all these timely pushes, they are the best in the business. Yeah, it's really heads up play from RXE, and uh, they put themselves, uh, they, they take that prime spot that Daytrade previously owned, and Take it for themselves. Really, really nice heads up play from them. And we've seen it, as you said, across all of their wins. So to see it in the kind of mid to late game uh, is is a bit of a new thing for us. Generally, we see it when there's yeah. 28 minutes passed, but 18 only minutes passed now and RXC still making plays. So it's fantastic to see mm -hmm. all of the confidence from their previous wins culminating in a moment like that. And reluctant squad have survived all of this time as four. Now the next test is Armory Gaming. Armory certainly on the back foot here, but they've got cover. Cover that's kind of obscured by those trees, but through the leaves, Dimisty's hitting shots. Jun has to back off down to 41 HP. In fact, the entirety of Reluctant Squad have to back off. Dimisty's, Dimisty's found a guard angle uh, to push them away from his two teammates, allowing James, Riz, and now Shanks, who's grouping up with them, uh, to finally uh, front this assault. Yeah, at least for now, Reluctant Squad has been able to get a little bit of cover, but not exactly from the hands of Armored Gaming, but it can basically shut them off from the back. They definitely paid attention to the assault, as Jane will be the first one to fall. Great claim coming from 6, 7, 8, 9, while the nades are also falling by. So they've been staying around this uh, bunker that they've created for long enough. They will not have a chance to move back into the vehicles with Armored Gaming's approach with lots of lots of death lace dropping directly into the middle of it all. So it's going to be pretty rough for the side of RS, especially having the watch coming in from FTF from afar. Don't see a way out for these guys at all, but if there's anything at all, they can still put up a fight against Armored Gaming, but chances are pretty slim for now. But they managed to recover, as they will have more damage being done. Flashbang still popped on the side of the Shanks, will be held back ever so slightly. Uh, Armory Gaming so far. Masterfully closing in, okay. but there's a drive by! Scappy trying to save the day here with the heroics, but there what? is still Rue to hold him off. Scappy just having so much damage to be done here. At least create a little okay. bit more damage. What a shot! Oh, Pixel out of nowhere! It's Mad Pig oh, again! Tonight. Again on the accurate mortars. This guy is uh, apparently quite talented with that piece of weaponry. Yeah, Axel Mortar King. And here come ISG now. Clown card up. Trying to make their way into zone. They'll actually skip past Armory Gaming for the moment. What a nightmare for Reluctant Squad. But the nightmare is not over for Armory Gaming yet. ISG pull up. Destroy Dimacy. No chance he was winning that 1v3. And now they turn their attention towards the rest of Armory Gaming. Stuck behind flaming cars. Shanks already down. Riz down to 1 HP. ISG in a fantastic spot in the zone. Dimacy finished off this might be a really good game for isg especially if the circle goes their way they've got this high ground to work with but before that they have to take down armory gaming oh an absolute helter skelter right there armory gaming now 
Only hugging by whatever cover they had. Oh, blue sun's closing in. Thanks. Being forced to make a play. Uh, or maybe just deny himself for now. Somehow, Whitefish got themselves a little bit more of a cover through the mansions. And there is a member of FTF approaching as well. T9 getting taken out by Shanks. This could still be our gaming surviving to tell the tale into the top five. PMA is out. And I don't know if he has enough time to basically go in for the rescue with Rivs still on his knees. The Ronex now getting invaded. Had too little health to work with, and FTF will take over. Nice from FTF. They survive like they have done in many a game previous. ISG, I don't think there was any chance they were ever going to lose this fight, but they certainly lose a member. Shanks is just in the cover of that smoke spotted out, though. Nice headshot from Aegon. Mad Pig's got a knock onto Fap it's inside that Alamo, but I don't think anything's going to come of it. Pixel Stars have found themselves in the edge of Yasnaya inside that single just outside the library. So they're in survival mode too, just kind of playing whatever's available to them. RxE are the ones who look in control. ISG, they would be the ones in control right now, uh, in a little bit more control in my opinion, but they lost one on that initial engagement. Pixel Stars, they've lost two. Dizel, Vinsu, tag team them. Mal rush down. Panic. I didn't even realize Panic was still in this game, to be honest with you. They're in right. a top four position. They've only got four kills now, but they've been sneaky on the edge of this zone. They've uh, mm -hmm. taken control of the flat top now. It's currently out of zone. But they can certainly fight their way in. They've got the cars to do so. They've probably saved up a bunch of utility. Lightworks actually lost his helmet, but uh, maybe that... Well, hopefully that won't be an issue. Sayuto, though. Sayuto and his teammate Aegon. They've got the high ground here. The zone did come towards them. And so unless Panic decides to push this way, they can remain a little bit calm, but I think that's probably the play that Panic have to make. This might actually be the best play for Panic, and it's the play that indeed they are making. ISG, will you pass this test? Well, let's see. Two members to hold out against for not really liking their chances. Sure, got pretty much the weaponry to work with at the very least, but here comes the drive-by. Well, that's one down, one more to go. Panic will ensure that they will reach the top three. And somehow, FTF still remains in this matchup. They are going to be cutting in from the northwestern corners of the map. So a lot more of a stock available for a side of Panic Esports. Realistically enough, Panic should be able to challenge RxE eventually. We'll see how RxE will fare as they will slowly make an approach towards Humoy and the rest of FTF. Cornered up, not much space for a trick to work with. And Chimoy, looking for PV instead. Well, I'm not too sure if that's going to be the right call for them, but FTF, they really don't really have oh. space to work with. No, there's no side that is clear for them. Now, it's only down to Chimoy. And oh, oh, pick up onto the sus suspect. So RxE looking to close out with a fake chicken dinner if they could. I feel like priority number one for Panic should have been exactly what Dusky's doing now. Park up on the other side of the road, start to create some pressure, start to grab some space that you didn't previously have. Luckily, Dusky's done it now, and they're being allowed to get that res onto Suspect, so the fight back from RxE isn't good enough to down Panic just yet. But they've only got one person in position to take the fight, the close-range fight, to, to RxE, and I feel like that's may maybe where the fight is going to be won from Panic. It's not going to be one from these far back angles. RxC have a lot more of the zone than Panic do. Panic kind of have to pray for a feed or they're going to be pushed out. They've got cars to play with as well. They can move these over to Dusky if they need. Right now, he's the point man though. As long as Dusky doesn't go down, then the game can still be won by a Panic. A little bit of a 50-50 though, to be honest with you. Less space mm -hmm. for Panic to play on their side of the road, more for RxE, but it's only probably 55-45. Not too much in the favor of RxE. The circle though determines pretty much everything. Sometimes that's just the way it goes in PUBG. We've got four seconds until this bad boy closes in. Doesn't necessarily decide a winner, but that is heavily in the favor of RxC. Alamo is even still inside. The roof of Alamo can still be played, and this is when Panic need to move their butts across to the other side of the road and start to take this fight toward our, towards RxC. We are slowly closing in with uh, both of the members uh, to be wrapping around side. And we're looking at Piffy really closing in against Fap. 2-2 uh, two -two split as well coming in from the side of RxE. A little bit wider coming in from uh, Panic as well. Now the nades are dropped in. Bab actually taking a little bit more of the chip damage. Panic. If they could get this opening against Fab, then uh, they might actually be able to really 
create that opportunity. But that's going to fall all the way back, moving into the far end. So there's not a way that they will be uh, pretty much pincered by any members of the side of Panic for the moment. As we take a look at the rest of RxE to be wrapping into the Northern Plains, to be playing around the hills, as they will basically funnel the rest of Panic through the trees. And wraps the Eastport is really trying to slowly force the rest of Panic to go into these open spaces and basically prioritizing the zone till the very end of it all. I don't think this is super dire for Panic, but it's certainly not ideal. Maybe one of the fights they can take is towards Fab. Now that they know he's here, one of the options Panic has, or at least had before this phase started to close in, was to wrap that left side, maybe catch Fab off guard, take him down. Then it's all of a sudden it's a 4v3, and they can make a, uh, a much better play off the back of that. Lightworks moved his way um, to the opposite side of the zone, to the rest of his teammates, and he was almost uh, knocked out of his car on that rotation. The worst part for it about Lightwork is that he's only got a thick tree to play with. He's got absolutely nothing else to play with. The smokes and whatever else he has in his inventory are all the resources he's got in the trunk of that tree. And you would imagine yeah. one of RxE trying to maybe maneuver around and get an off angle onto Lightwork, but that hasn't happened yet. RxE us all inside of uh, uh, all, all inside of Alamo. This could create problems mm -hmm. of its own. Yet to be seen, though. This is why I said it's not too bad for Panic, because uh, RxE kind of do get trapped inside Alamo at a certain point here. If they don't make a play themselves, Fap had to move back, and so potentially this is Panic's game to lose now. Yeah. Of course, with the shift now going to the open spaces, and it really would be able to at least hold out, especially in need to have Repsic Esports attention to be pulled by Lightwork. And Fab is already soaking in On a cue. little bit more of the pressure. Look at that grenade to lob. I mean, there's about four frag grenades that he could utilize. He's trying to actually close in in order to uh, perhaps obliterate them with those flurry of grenades. But I don't think that there's going to be all too much until all these smokes are uh, perfectly set. POV. This could be the play here. Playing with fire. It's risky, but he's got the P90 in hand. P90 and basically fresh three gear too. So if anyone's going to make the play, it's got to be Pivy. Get up close, get that be. opening knock, and then the fight's so much easier off the back of that. Lightwork still alive and still in zone as well. I feel like this is definitely Panic's game to lose. They've avoided all these nades so far as well. And on cue every time, Lightwork chimes in with a bit of damage, making it even harder for RxE to get within nade range. That positioning from Lightwork has been immaculate. An absolute saving grace that he didn't get knocked on that rotation. Otherwise, this might be so much harder for Panic to actually pull off the smokes. Continue to, continue to come out from Rapsiak. More damage done Ooh. from Lightwork. And the smoke that uh, Thanahan was using to get up close and personal to Panic has now dissipated. So it has to be this car play from yep, Rapsiak. They're going to make their way to the solo, but they're getting shot in the back in the meantime. It's a nade that might cost everyone their lives at this tree, but it's just Lightwork that goes down. But here's the rest of Panic chiming in. Pivi from a distance with that P90. Suspect with the Mini-14. And Rapsiak have put themselves from one bad spot into another but at least they've taken one down with them. Such a risky call in a desperate time. They do understand they're, they're slowly getting choked out from the left-hand side of the map. And at the very least, still having two to play with is still going to be pretty much all right for the taking for the time being. If they did manage to first secure the number. Panic Esports. They could basically wait it all out, and this is another chicken dinner for them to claim. While Pivy, fully prones and crawls towards his way of RxE. Going to be uh, seeing whether or not will they be able to get the angles right. Vinzu going for the exchange. Suspect oh the one that God. goes down. And the tides might actually turn back towards the favor of RxE again. Dusky now spotted out. Damage done. Not enough. Not quite yet for him to be out for the count. PV, he's got to find him. And yes, he does. Oh, no way. He's actually done it with the P90 at range again from Panic. Fat blast one up. 
the star player on RXE, but what can he do against Tour Panic? The smoke's gone now as well. It should be a freebie oh. from Panic, and it is. Thankfully, it is potentially dodgy, but the trade was there. The smoke dissipated, and there were too many members of Panic for FAP to deal with. And so Panic claim the last and second dinner of the night for them. Another very dominant 12 kill win. And thankfully, again, we got to see a lot more action from the winner of that game. Uh, uh, that time round. So another excellently done job from Panic uh, and a game that certainly they took into their own hands to win. This is the Panic that I really love to see. When all their players are firing on all cylinders, we get a very special version of Panic. A version of Panic that, that can take the fight to everyone else uh, in these APAC lobbies. And that's what we've seen uh, for both their wins tonight. Yeah, and they definitely delivered a nil-biter finish here in the very final game of the evening and they technically are the biggest winners of the day. Remember when we started off, they were basically fighting for survival. We were also wondering, do they really have what it takes? Thankfully, of course, they definitely turned up the heat and basically had rounds after rounds going very, very well. Of course, there were some struggles in between, but this final game looking absolutely sublime. We saw them having that initial struggle, not being able to buy big goals or so, and having to resort into getting the emergency parachute to get into position and they did manage to find it and of course they trade was actually holding to this got compound as well as the forest and that was just them being overwhelmed not only by valentine esports but eventually with the collapse coming in from the rest of rxe which managed to also actually be the prime spot for the longest of the time and armory gaming and they really had a brawl out here yeah, this was an absolute brawl. It was a brawl that ended up with uh, another average finish from Armory Gaming, unfortunately. They did get a decent amount of kills, 6-7, something like that, potentially, but uh, eventually they lost out to uh, ISG, who kind of just rocked up, destroyed Dynasty, and then from that point forward, it was uh, easy pickings for the rest of ISG. An average game from Armory and an average game from Daytrade, too. Both the teams that we highlighted kind of coming into this game uh, as the teams that we, that we don't expect to be uh, where they are on the leaderboard. Um, what a play from Lightwork, though. To survive for as long as he does there and to uh, have the presence of mind to throw that nade down, it, it throws RXE's play uh, into such disarray and it allows uh, two knocks from the rest of his teammates off in the distance once he does that. I mean, there's four in a car of RXE coming at your very thick tree. How much space do four people actually have to play with behind that tree? Lightwork could barely fit behind that tree. So how much space do you realistically, realistically, realistically think all of RXE is going to have behind that tree? It's not very much, spoiler alert. Uh, and so it's a very well played ending from Panic. And uh, look, uh, I'm not going to give my final thoughts just yet, but uh, I was very happy with the performances tonight. I think we saw some ex very exciting and explosive PUBG. Yeah, I, I was definitely happy with the outcome of it all as well. Looking at how certain teams have been able to not only get that bounce back, but also with some of all these uh, unexpected outcomes with first downfall of some of the Titans that we expect to do really, really well. And even up to today, not really showing up to expectation. Yeah. And with this final game that has concluded for day two, I do believe that even for the teams with the likes of FTF, AG, as well as Day Trade, some of the score lines probably will just neutralize each other because we're looking at uh, an average of four to five kill pickoffs in between the match. So I don't really expect too much of a heavy shift going in between the ladder. So uh, meanwhile, um, over on the top end of the field, RXE still showing us that they have pretty much finishing moves, though this time bested by Panic Esports. So I really want to do see whether or not if Panic Esports basically go from racks to riches where they start off so rough up back in day one and maybe end day three at number one. Now we have that huge possibility and the boys from OCE, they de mm -hmm. definitely showed up. Yeah, it's it's good to see. Uh, you're kind of wondering when Panic's going to have uh, a game like they have had twice tonight. Um, and uh, good to see that they have the consistency to do it back to back. 
It's a very good sign uh, for them. Uh, and I think off the back of both of these wins, I don't want to say they've booked their slot to the finals yet, but but I'm almost certain they probably have. They have to play to a certain floor tomorrow, uh, and then they have secured top eight, which is which is great for them um, and fantastic for the PUBG Challenge Rumble regions. This is the overall leaderboard going into tomorrow. Day Trade scraped through into that eighth spot. Armory Gaming just falling behind by two points. The gap between seventh and eighth that we have to keep an eye on. That's about 11 points, and RxC remain on top. Panic shoot themselves all the way up into third and crack triple digits as well. Unicorn Cyber there in second. Not the leaderboard I would have expected uh, by the end of today. I thought Forest would remain kind of on top. Valley Tai uh, also would remain in that top three. FTF expecting them to have a, a banger day at some point and, and probably put, put themselves up in that top three. So this is not the top three I was expecting. But that said, we only need the top eight. We're not playing for anything specific when it comes to one, two, three, four, five or anything like that. It's just the top eight. Uh, and so this leaderboard uh, is going to potentially look a little bit weird uh, because of that fact. There's no one really putting in, digging their heels in and fighting for one, two, three, anything like that. Uh, it's just the mm -hmm. top eight. And then you can kind of chill from that moment forward, hit a certain floor, get a certain amount of points per game, and then secure your spot in the grand finals. But uh, yeah, yeah it, it's been an excellent day of PUBG so far. Absolutely, excellent indeed. And uh, I definitely miscalculated on the final uh, points for some of all these teams. And at the very least for FTF, they get light, uh, a slight security for the time being. When we take a look at the top eight as well, I guess the ones around the 70 pointer mark is the ones that are in danger. That being AG, Day Trade, as well as PMA. So not too different from the what we last saw back in the match number five. So with that being said, well, we we'll really have to see if Day Tree, if there's ever going to be even maybe another team that is on maybe 12 to, I, I don't know, 13. I'm just uh, having a little bit of copium, all right? So <laughs> do, do entertain me on this, on um, who knows whether or not if somebody's going to have the performance like Panic Esports did, because that, that could basically shake things up once more. But Panic Esports today, absolutely outstanding. Like, I did not expect them to be within the top three ratio. Like, top, top six, top five. Yeah, that's kind of like my expectation for Panic ever since they gained that momentum with that chicken dinner. But these guys, they really, really have basically got not only my respect, but I'm really starting to be a huge fan of Panic. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think once we saw uh, that, that right side of the leaderboard, once we saw that we had kind of three teams, it was Panic, PMA, and GLS, I believe, who were 10th, uh, or sorry, 9th, 10th, and 11th. And then you had the bottom five teams. Um, and those bottom five teams looked like they weren't really even competing. Um, and then you had, again, Panic, PMA, GLS. Out of those three teams, Panic's definitely one of those teams that can make their way into the top eight. And so once I realized that that was the state of affairs, I thought that certainly Panic had had it in them to, to do it. Um, I've been critical of Panic in the past. I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna shy away from that. But when they do very well, uh, and when they pop off like they absolutely have done today, I'm happy to praise them. They've been exceptional today, uh, and I can't wait to see them play uh tomorrow any closing thoughts contra anything you want to say uh, to close out tonight well for me i'm really grateful to be able to witness all these epic action and tomorrow is going to be an important day for all the 16 teams here in apac that's playing in the playoffs to see who will be able to challenge the seeded teams in the finals this weekend make sure you guys don't miss any of that action we'll be back here uh for more for sure but i believe that We've already got pretty much everything wrapped up extreme, so I'm good. Yeah, but yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought you were, I thought you were <laughs> passing it off. Uh, yeah, no, he's, he's oh, absolutely right. 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 We, we, we have absolutely everything uh, wrapped up. And uh, yeah, look, we had excellent action today, and I can promise you that we're going to have excellent action tomorrow. So please do not miss tomorrow's set of games. It's the final day of playoffs, final opportunity for everyone to make it into that top eight. Uh, don't miss it.